Welcome everyone to studies in historical trauma and transformation at Stellenbosch University. My name is Pumla Gobodo Madigizela. I am the research chair in historical trauma and transformation. My team that I'm working with this afternoon uh, consists of Lydia Duplessis, who is the coordinator of staff mobility programs and partnership projects at the Stellenbosch University International Office. Sakiru Adibayo, Dr. Sakiru Adibayo, who is a postdoc at Verse University Institutes for Social Research. And Unison Mugamu, who is the coordinator of projects for our webinars and seminars in the historical trauma and transformation here at Stellenbosch University. Just a little bit about our units, research units. Historical trauma and transformation brings together students, researchers, scholars, and engaged practitioners to share ideas and debates about violence, historical trauma, its memory and its expressions across generations. We encourage you to please participate in our projects and we are grateful, always grateful to see those of you who keep on returning to these webinars. Today's event, the aesthetics of cruelty, perspectives and critical reflections on representations of dehumanization in Russia and South Africa is a collaboration between Stellenbosch University and the universities uh, in Russia and Amsterdam. I'll say more about that in a moment. The project around which this event today is organized is titled Legacies of Dehumanization. Dr. Melike Furi and I are the leading partners at Stellenbosch University of this project. And the collaboration partners are in, in Russia are Professor who is here with us, Professor Anastasia Vitrofanova. She is Chair of Political Science, Church State Relations, and the Sociology of Religion at the Russian Orthodox University of St. John the Divine. And the second collaborator is Professor Anastasia, sorry, is Professor Katya Tolstoy, who is uh, the director of the Institute for the Academic Study of Eastern. Christianity at Freie University in Amsterdam. This project is part of the South Africa Russia Bilateral in Initiative, which is funded by the National Research Foundation in South Africa and the Russian Foundation for Basic Research in Russia. I have to mention here that the brainchild for these projects emerged from conversations with Professor Nancy Adler, who will be our keynote this morning, and Professor Katya Tolstoy, who will be responding to her presentation when Professor Tolstoy invited Nancy and I to speak at an event she had organized. She is really the specialist in Russia. She and Professor Anastasia are the experts in this field. And because of our mutual interests, we decided to put together a proposal for this bilateral project funded by research institutes in Russia and in South Africa. It was supposed to be an exchange and mobility program, but because of COVID, we are operating under these circumstances that are virtual. Before I introduce our speakers this morning, I would like to invite Professor um, Anastasia Mitrofanova to speak to us and to share with us who her partners are at the Russian Institute. Over to you, uh, Anastasia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pumla. Uh, well, I can uh, only say that uh, our research group uh, consists of uh, three people uh, uh, and uh, well, I am one of them, and the other people are a very uh, uh, prominent uh, Russian uh, scholars. Uh, one is uh, 
or Professor Olga Bogatova from uh, Saransk, from the um, uh, Mordovia State University. She is now among the participants. And the other one is uh, Professor Svetlana Rizanova from Perm. Uh, she is also a, a very uh, well known uh, sociologist of uh, religion in Russia. And uh, we have done quite a lot uh, for the first uh, two years of the projects of the project. They have collected a lot of field material, uh, including historical field material, uh, several, uh, several uh, memory uh, 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 supporting organizations have already shared their archives with us. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, material, uh, now we are analyzing it, uh, presenting it at research uh, gatherings. Uh, so um, I, hope to, uh, I hope that today and tomorrow we will have uh, this pleasure of uh, sharing our research uh, finding with each other. And uh, it's great to see all of you uh, uh, here. So I think we should now proceed to our uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, speakers, I, I guess. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Anastasia. Now, Anastasia mentioned that there is already work that has been ongoing. And um, as part of that initial steps towards dialogue among ourselves, we organized, in fact, this was hosted by Anastasia and by Katia in, in Amsterdam. It was a, an event, a collo another colloquium, it was our first colloquium uh, as, a, as a way of responding to the research and fieldwork that has already started in, uh, that was started by our Russian partners. So here is the link that I'm posting as we speak to the webinar, the first webinar on these projects, um, uh, the legacies of dehumanization. Now, today's uh, event, this aesthetics of cruelty, we have been interested in these ideas of how the art represents suffering, you know, the representation of suffering, the representation of violence, and turning to the representation of violence uh, comparatively between uh, uh, the Soviet Gulag, experiences in the Soviet Gulag and the experiences in, 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 in apartheid is, is a project that we felt has not yet been done. And we're very interested in looking at these, um, these uh, countries with such a history of gross violations of, of human rights in, in the subsequent generations to look at what is the impact of the violence that uh, is so well known in these countries, what is the impact intergenerationally and how has it been represented in the arts? And by the arts, we really are interested in arts in all its diversity, you know, in literature, film, uh, visual arts. Some of this is presented today by scholars, uh, Russian scholars or people who have worked uh, with uh, the dehumanization in Russia as well as South African scholars, and you'll hear more about that uh, tomorrow. As you saw in the uh, slide that was put up by Unison Mugamu, our technical person uh, earlier when we started, we ask you please for all questions, post your questions in the Q&A function. You may begin posting your questions uh, as the speakers are on stage or on the virtual stage already. Don't wait until they finish so that we have a chance to read them and to decide which ones to actually present to the speakers. Continue to chat in the chat function because this, um, this webinar is recorded and we will be posting it on our website along with the one uh, whose link I just shared with you. So please continue chatting and engaging in dialogue in that way. We um, are now going to uh, uh, introduce our speakers. The first speaker, I'll start with Nancy Adler because she is our keynote speaker, uh, opening keynote speaker. Her topic, representing or reconceptualizing suffering, 
case studies of the narratives of Gulag survivors. Nancy Adler graduated from Barnard College, Columbia University, with a degree in German language and literature and Soviet studies. She completed her master's doctoral and postdoctoral work in Russian studies at the Department of East European Studies of the University of Amsterdam. She is the director of research and head of Holocaust and genocide studies at the Netherlands Institute for War Documentation and holds a joint appointment as professor of memory, history and transitional justice at the University of Amsterdam's Holocaust and Genocide Studies and the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. Among Professor Adler's books are Keeping Faith with the Party, Communist Believers Return from the Gulag, The Gulag Survivor Beyond the Soviet System and Victims of Soviet Terror, The Story of the Memorial Movement. Professor Adler has published numerous scholarly articles on the consequences of Stalinism and her current research focuses on transitional justice and the legacy of communism. And now moving to introducing Professor Tolstoy. Katya Tolstoy is a graduate of the Protestant Theological University in Kampen in the Netherlands, where she obtained both a master's degree and a PhD degree. She is professor and chair of theology and religion in post-trauma societies at the Freie University's Faculty of Religion and Theology, the founding director of the Institute for the Academic Study of Eastern Christianity and founder and president of the International Association for Post-Soviet Theology and Study of Religion, all at the university at Freie University in Amsterdam. Professor Tolstoy's initial research was on Western systematic theology, early dialectical theology, and literary studies, with a focus on, among others, Fyado Dostoevsky and Mikhail Mikhailovich Bakhtin. More recently, and for over a decade now, her research has been on the post-Soviet religious revival and the role of theology in public and societal engagement with the past. She has established international research networks among which are an interdisciplinary working group on negotiating the Soviet past at the European Academy of Religion and the research group on theology after Gulag in the Netherlands School of Advanced Study of Theology and Religion and within her own institute at her university, which she directs. I believe that we are part of the growth of that wider network, of that growing wider network of Professor uh, uh, Tolstoy's work. And we are pleased today to listen to them both these experts, these experts in this field to share with us their work. And, and without much further ado, I will hand over now uh, the virtual mic to Professor Adler to deliver her keynote address. Over to you, Professor Adler, and thank you. Thank you, Pamela, for this kind introduction. First, I would like to thank my distinguished colleagues, Professor Pomla Gobodu Madiki Zela, Anastasia Mitrofanova, and Katya Tolstaya for making me part of this rich research consortium. It's truly a privilege. Um, allow me a moment to start my screen share. So let me begin by saying that it has been argued that no history should be written without listening to its protagonists. Fortunately, in the last few decades, widespread efforts have been undertaken to integrate memories of mass violence 
into the writing of history, not just out of respect for survivors, but because any history writing that would exclude the voices of those who suffered would be arguably incomplete. The same must be said for any mechanisms toward reconciliation with a repressive past. Having worked with Gulag survivor accounts for over 30 years, I have found eyewitness testimonies to be instrumental sources for reconstructing and understanding what happened, particularly in the aftermath of mass political violence. But these sources need to be approached with a critical understanding of all of their complexities. Before I reflect upon the narratives and representations of Gulag survivors and survival, allow me to preface this talk with a few general remarks. Every national history is a collective autobiography which draws on a wide inventory of events from its past. Different constituencies may select, select different events and assign different meanings to the same events. For a now disappearing generation of Russian survivors, the Gulag was the defining institution and experience of the USSR. And here we have an iconic shot of the uh, White Sea Canal completed in 1933 at the cost of thousands of lives. These survivors represent millions of citizens terrorized during the Stalin era. Yet the terror imposed by the state is again marginalized in today's official version of Russia's history. In post-Soviet Russia, there is a trend towards select memory of the repression. So to subvert Santayana's oft-quoted admonition, those who do not want to be condemned by the past should remember their history from a positive perspective. Stalinism and the Gulag were experienced by different people in different ways. As I said, I've been working with victims' memoirs and testimonies in the form of oral history and archival documents for many years. Besides the fact that I had the privilege of dialoguing with some extraordinary people, this source was invaluable for filling in the blanks of official history and for directing me to new questions. I learned a number of things. For example, the fact that these autobiographical accounts are not necessarily what happened, but rather perceptions of what happened. They allow us to reconstruct a story, but no matter how true, each story is an edited version of the truth. So the storyteller must be placed in the proper socio-historical context. It has been said that stories are not lived but told. Life has no beginnings, middles, end. They belong to the story we tell ourselves later. So one event could be described by different people who experienced it in entirely different ways. However, if we can find common elements in the narratives of several individuals, testimony can be transformed into evidence because every individual experience is typical of a class of experiences. And then it's possible to draw substantiated conclusions on what happened. A final remark about the narrative itself before I get to my narratives. Whether a narrative is the official history of a political party or the personal experience of an individual, it performs an essential function. It organizes experience into a sequence of events and it gives it meaning. In operation, it says, this is what happened, this is what it meant, and this is how we or I deal with it. So that was some background to this talk. I thought I would share with you a few examples today of narratives that I have gathered in the course of various research projects. Each illustrates the usefulness and the challenges of personal accounts in reconstructing or representing experience, and each offers a different conceptualization of suffering. Allow me to revisit an interview I conducted with a Gulag survivor some years ago while researching loyalty to the Communist Party among Gulag returnees. Just after I got to Moscow that spring, I called Zoria Serebrikova, 
to talk to her about a new project. And now here we see Zoria with her father. He was an old Bolshevik, a comrade of Lenin. Her stepfather was also high in the party. Both were executed in 1937. Zoria's mother was sent to the Gulag and Zoria to an orphanage. And here we see Zoria in a prison mugshot. As it happened, Zoria had just finished reading the Russian edition of my book on the difficult return from the Gulag that the organization Memorial had published. And she was eager to tell me how she felt about it. She picked me up outside of a subway station on the outskirts of Moscow, and we talked for the hour it took to drive to her dacha. Zoria was so anxious to express her opinions that we skipped the small talk and started our discussion even as I was climbing into her car. Zoria expressed her outrage at the interaction between the ex-prisoners and the government when the survivors were released from the camp. However, her outrage was not directed at the unrepentant behavior of the government's representatives, but rather at the ingratitude of the returnees. And here I quote her words, quote, how could it be that they were not grateful to the government when they were released from camp? She asked, and she continued, those times were full of opportunity. Zoria acknowledged that I had accurately reported the bitterness of many Gulag survivors, but she claimed that her fellow prisoners were misguided. The people whom I had described as victims and survivors were considered by one of their own as ingrates <clears throat> who failed to appreciate the opportunity afforded them in the post-Stalin era. So at this point, I started taking notes because I knew that this would help me understand more about enduring party loyalty, which I was investigating. I knew that Zoria was a privileged returnee under Khrushchev and that she subscribed to the returnee as hero stance. This essentially says that returning victims did not remain on the fringes of society, that they looked for and found work, that they applied for and received re rehabilitation, et cetera. I also knew that Zoria's mother had spent 21 years in Siberia and then went on to become a party propagandist after release. So I wasn't too surprised by Zoria's unwavering loyalty to the Soviet regime and communist party, even long after camp. But I was unprepared for her inability to recognize the validity of the bitterness of so many of her fellow prisoners, fellow returnees. This group, and they were in the majority, described themselves as having been victimized by the state both during camp and after their release. Although, although Zoria's allegiance to the party in and out of camp was a minority view, she was not alone. I found many such examples in the life stories that I have looked at. Her counterintuitive stance points to larger questions of how a repressive regime becomes incorporated into the attitude and behavior of the people it controls with the consequence that the citizens behave in ways that preserve the group over their own individual interests. Only by studying autobiographical narratives of people with similar orientations can we understand how and why this minority point of view makes sense to people like Zoria. When such perspectives can be seen from within the experience of the prisoner or survivor, they may not be less distressing, but they will be less puzzling. And this case also illustrates the need to subject our sources to critical scrutiny because Zori was describing an entirely different experience than that of many and even most of her fellow victims. In Zoria's category were many dogmatists who did not lose faith in the party but lost faith in particular leaders. They switched their devotion from Stalin to Lenin, blaming the terror on Stalinism. A memoir by Nina Gagentorm, who spent eight years in the Gulag, described such campmates as hardcore Leninists. They clung to Leninist ideals. It was a faith that allowed them to, quote, live without breaking. Hundreds of Kalima-bound prisoners endorsed this idea. Gagantorn recalled how, even as they were marched under armed guard, they sang about their, quote, selfless love for the people. These prisoners sang in spite of being butted with rifles, and even when they were thrown, 
into the hull of the death ships from Vladivostok to Kalima. Many were later executed, but according to this returnee's account, they maintained faith in their vision of communism to the end of their life. For the loyalists, faith in the morality of socialism was largely unshaken by the repression, which they interpreted either as a perversion of an inherently good ideology or as an opportunity to offer up, as it were, tangible physical labor in support of the ideology. The redeeming value of religious suffering and even martyrdom comes to mind. Frankl has nuanced this notion by pointing out that, quote, suffering ceases to be suffering in some way at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice. Some prisoners went to great lengths to prove their loyalty. Lev Gavrilov was arrested in 1937 and sentenced to 10 years of incarceration. He spent the early war years in Kalima and wrote about his experiences in his memoirs. He entitled his story Zek, Zapasnoi Komunist, which means reserve communist, but it's also a play on words with the word zek, which means prisoner. Now, this is a graphic, but it's a telling illustration. In these memoirs, he described how, it, how he extracted his own gold teeth to contribute to the war effort. When he tried to give them to his interrogators, they did not want to accept this offer from an enemy of the people. Gavrilov did not accept their assessment that he was someone who had violated his right to be a communist, hence the title of his narrative. Victims' accounts and how they frame the past have offered much insight into a number of questions. Among others, the religion-like quality of communism. And I say that with appropriate humility, as I know there are many distinguished theologians in our research consortium and the audience today. Let's take Oksana Lazarevna, who taught at Odessa University and was the mother of two. She was also the wife of an enemy of the people who had been arrested and taken away. Oksana was a committed party member, but as she watched the arrest of one after another of her cohorts, she suspected that the enemy had, quote, penetrated the party and it was the NKVD, that's Stalin secret police. One day while Oksana was nursing her infant son, they came for her too. The NKVD agents tore the baby from her and dispatched her sons to her parents. Oksana was brought to an Odessa prison. There, the suspicions she harbored when she was free were confirmed by what she saw. By the time Oksana was sent on to the Gulag, she had resolved to, quote, clear the names of honest communists, unquote. From her barracks, she began to write letters to Stalin and the Central Committee. She charged that, quote, lawlessness reigns in the organs of the NKVD. It has led to the destruction of many sincere Leninist communists, unquote. Her campmates were terrified. They warned, quote, you will have to give these letters to the NKVD authorities in the camp. Don't you understand what the consequences will be? You will die and you will kill your children. In her response, Oksana illustrated how the human dedication to a set of values can override even so strong a human devotion as motherhood, let alone personal survival. She said, I'm a communist in the first place, and after that, a mother. Oksana was transferred, and her story, recorded in the memoirs of a campmate, ends there. It is unlikely that Oksana survived transport to the next camp. What is likely is that she maintained her faith until the very end. Others in this category reconceptualize the camp experience to come out in favor of party values. What can such narratives tell us? For most of the accounts of committed communists, the question of why and the issue of guilt, the Schuldfrage, as Karl Jaspers so aptly termed it, was not much more relevant than they would be for a religious devotee. Personal misfortunes are accepted with resignation or satisfaction in the fulfillment of a greater purpose for the collective, the party, and the motherland. I found many such examples, 
of how the bond to the party was stronger than the maternal bond in my investigation of the stories of the so-called children of the repressed, specifically daughters whose mothers had been communist loyalists. Many of this generation didn't report any sense of indignation or even surprise at their mother's enduring loyalty to the party, even after losing their husbands and being incarcerated in the gulag. These interviewees recalled growing up in orphanages and having difficult reunions with their returnee mothers. As I said, the mothers of this cohort entered and left the gulag maintaining loyalty to the party. So here you see Dina Sidorovna, whose husband was executed and who spent 10 years in the camps and longer in exile. After camp, Dina wouldn't even commit to babysitting to her new grandchild because, quote, there might be a party meeting. Her emotional dependence on the party was so central to her experience of life that she held no, at least public opinions, contrary to the party line. She was grateful to Khrushchev for liberating her and never conceded that she was guilty of the crimes for which she was imprisoned, but she did not blame those who had imprisoned her either. The party took priority above all else. Her daughter Gerta recalled a vivid illustration of how powerfully her mother was motivated by the party. Dina was addicted to nicotine and she smoked incessantly in spite of frequent admonitions from everyone. Dina would respond by saying, quote, if I am reinstated in the party, I will stop smoking, but now I need it for my nerves. So here we see the Ilian family. Ilya, the father, had been a prominent communist party official who served as the uh, secretary in Kiev. He was arrested in July of 1937, executed in November of that year in Moscow, and then buried in the notorious Donskoy Cemetery. Maria, the mother, was the director of a silk combine in Kiev when she was arrested in 1937 as a family member of an enemy of the people. Upon their parents' arrest, Maria and her two brothers, Felix and Vladimir, and here we see Vladimir, were sent to orphanages. Here's Maria in an orphanage. Vladimir had turned 16 shortly after arrival at the children's home, so he was soon dispatched to a camp in the Far East. Maria's mother had managed to keep track of her children's whereabouts, even from the camp, and she begged the authorities to take her son out of the gulag and send him to the front so that he could die an honorable death. But, but the authorities paid little heed to the requests of families of enemies of the people. Her plea was not granted and Vladimir died in the camp. Maria, reflecting on her mother's life, tried to understand how her mother had dealt with the personal and material losses of the repression. She told me, quote, my mother was very bright. She found happiness not in material things, but in spiritual things. Spiritual was not God, but the party. You give your life in service and sacrifice. As Maria explained, her mother found a way to look past what had happened in her own family and focus instead on the goal. She said, you know the expression, when you cut wood, chips fly. And my mother believed that a just, wonderful communist society would be built, unquote. And in this case, the belief passed from one generation to the next. Maria found it harder to maintain belief in communism after the archives opened. Until Gorbachev lifted the censorship on public discussions of the terror, Maria had been able to maintain a limited view of the chronology and scope of the terror. Now she was forced to revisit and critically assess the old interpretations of the repression that she had learned from her mother. She admitted, quote, I was the last of everyone I knew to really understand that so much of the repression started with Lenin. We always wrote everything off to Stalin, unquote. Maria would have preferred to remain oblivious to this because it undermined so much that was foundational to her understanding of her family and her country. She explained, quote, it was hard. You lose the ground beneath your feet because you don't understand what the truth is, unquote. Yet another of my interviewees, Evgenia Smirnova, had a much less positive view 
of the party and the system. This daughter of repressed communist parents went to work for the organization Memorial. As Yevgenia gathered stories of victims, she struggled to understand how her ideologically principled mother and her similarly, similarly principled cohort could have remained devoted to a system that had victimized them along with millions of others. And this is her mother. She was on the cover of my book on communism. And this is, uh, these are her parents. Her father was executed. She recognized that her mother's devotion to communism provided her life with an enduring sense of meaning such that even the labor camp could be a satisfying labor of love. But Yevgenia found it painful to think about how different and devoid of meaning the suffering must have been for the majority of victims. And she told me, look at who is listed in, this is a publication of Memorial, it's called Rastriel Neaspiski, these were execution lists. Look at these people, people with a low education, accused of, accused of anti-Soviet agitation, it's just horrible. These poor souls did nothing. They had no relationship to the system whatsoever. They didn't bother anyone. Yevgenia wondered why her mother and her mother's peers had retained their ideological beliefs during and after the gulag when the political outcome seemed so different from what they had originally expected. Yevgenia also recognized that her mother and many of her dedicated peers had framed the experience as a meaningful, redeeming ideological journey destined to achieve the goals of communism. Retaining their beliefs may also have helped loyalists to survive the camp and post-camp experiences. So their enduring allegiance was at the very least a matter of self-preservation. Let me emphasize though, that the stories of those whose belief in communism survived the gulag ordeal should not be considered as representative. Rather, they illustrate one functional way of processing or as the title of this talk suggests, reconceptualizing victimization and or dehumanization. This group did not consider either experiencing camp or having experienced camp to have any redemptive meaning. They earnestly knocked themselves out, not in order to contribute to the cause, but to survive. When possible, they faked work output, but this could be risky. Yekaterina Alitskaya recalled the futile efforts of her Kalima camp mates in the sewing factory to meet their output quota in order to keep their indoor jobs. Failure could result in transfer to an outside job in the brutal Arctic climate. When they managed to meet their quotas, the camp administration's cynical response was to create new unattainable ones. Alitskaya spent the better part of the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in the camps or in exile, from Solovetsky to Magadan. In her memoirs, Alitskaya expressed nothing but horror at the amorality of the camps and the way they reduced prisoners to, quote, live only for themselves just to survive. She could not fathom the psychology of fellow campmates who simultaneously supported the justice of communism while claiming that only their own arrests were unjustified. Unconverted and unrepentant, the camp experience motivated Alitskaya to undertake the mission of telling the, wor the world her story and the story of those who did not survive to tell their own. When she wrote her memoirs in the 60s, she expressed concern that so few manuscripts were being published and she tried to speak for the silent. I, I won't read it to save time. Well, the people may have been silent, but many writers were not. Among them were Shalomov, who described the camps as, quote, only making a person worse, and hundreds of lesser known memoirists. They saw no greater good or salvation in the suffering of the camps. These eyewitnesses chronicled the workings of the system and presented abundant evidence in their damning cases. Their stories are not ennobling and do not reflect religion-like or other devotion to the cause, but they do use terms like hell to characterize the experience. The harshness of living and dying addressed in these literary and autobiographical works 
stands in stark contrast to the heroic perspective on the camp experience. And here are some shots of the camps. This is Vorkuta. This is an isolation cell on the Igarka Salahard Railroad that was abandoned uh, at Stalin's death. So the last narrative I'll bring in today is that of ex-prisoner and artist Yefrosinia Kersnovskaya. She recorded in extensive memoirs and meticulously etched in hundreds of drawings, much of what she endured in exile, interrogation, transport, the camp hospital, timbering, and hard labor in the mines. Her, illustrate, her illustrated memoirs span 1500 pages. When she was released in 1952, she refused to sign a pledge of silence about what she saw in the camps and prisons. For example, when she was performing relatively light work in the camp morgue, she discovered that some prisoners had been beaten to death with rifle butts. She refused to give false testimony on their cause of death in order to help conceal this official transgression. She captured the scene in her illustrations in vivid detail, even if it took decades to reach a wider audience. In 1990, Kersnovskaya was featured in the popular Soviet magazine, Aganyok, and a volume of 700 illustrations was published by the family who inherited her 12 notebooks. Through careful examination of how the victims represent and or reconceptualize the terror in their testimonies, we can begin to understand more about the dynamics of repression and survival. In conclusion, I would like to turn to the issue of how to frame the past. Individual representations, which give voice to former victims or survivors, can inform a whole host of questions. Despite the problems of self-censor, inaccurate memory, and collective memory, these eyewitness testimonies are very valuable sources. Listening to these stories can help us ascertain what their experience was, how the victims perceived their self, who or what they considered was responsible for their fate, what factors may have facilitated their survival and rehumanization, and what further mechanisms were employed to help the individual and the regime cope. Evidence from numerous studies of Gulag survivors suggests that the consequences of the Gulag did not end with its closing under Gorbachev, nor was its influence limited to its prisoners. The Gulag pervaded daily Soviet life because it could ensnare almost anyone. And even now, in post-Soviet Russia, there is an increasing trend to repress the memory of repression. Vladimir Putin, who described the collapse of the Soviet Union as, quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, unquote, argues that Russia should not be made to feel guilty about the Great Purge of 1937 because, quote, in other countries, even worse things happened. Accordingly, the current state-sanctioned textbooks marginalize the gulag while maximizing Stalin's successes. At the beginning of this lecture, I subverted Santayana's admonition by arguing that those who do not want to be condemned by the past should remember their history from a positive perspective. Since the bright future of communism never arrived, looking to the bright past of achievements is an artful stratagem for maintaining national pride. Finally, for many ex-prisoners and others, coming to terms with the nation's past has required reassessing the meaning of their personal past. For the older generation who were committed to the party, even while in camp, a disconfirmation of their original ideology could raise unsettling questions about how they misspent their lives. Such unsettling questions can lead to unsettling answers. They direct us to look at how the human need for safety, meaning, structure, and social cohesion can be manipulated by the closed systems of repressive regimes. And these findings might be relevant to understanding the persisting resistance of some citizens to look at their past and learn a different lesson. It is my hope that such stories of belief, disillusionment, dehumanization, and survival can help us to understand some of the processes by which repression gets inside the individual 
and perhaps this understanding can contribute to the important dialogue on how the past is to be remembered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Adler. This is such a wonderfully inspiring uh, presentation, uh, not least because of the strong parallels with so much that's happening in countries with these kinds of histories. So I look very much forward to the conversation um, beyond your keynotes and, and, and even beyond this webinar. The, it, it just confirms um, some of the goals for which we had established this project. So I'm really very grateful to you. Now I'll call Thank upon you. Professor uh, Tolstoy to respond. Uh, Professor Tolstoy is going to respond for 15 minutes and uh, we'll open it up uh, to uh, the audience for Q&A. So over to you, Katya. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Pumla. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, gratitude for you and your team uh, uh, for organizing this uh, event, the second event on Zoom, and uh, to Nancy uh, to giving me the opportunity to respond, uh, or uh, Pumla invited me to respond, but uh, uh, to Nancy for giving uh, a great um, text to respond to. And uh, there are many leads in uh, Professor Adler's uh, Nancy's talk, which are important uh, for the, this joint Russian South African project and also for this colloquium. Professor Adler's seminal work on the survivors uh, of the gulags who maintained their faith in communist party opens perspectives that are urgent for understanding several important aspects of what happened and what is happening now in post-Soviet space. One of these perspectives is a line from the official narratives of memory politics and rewriting history in nowadays Russia to Santayana's admonition, quote, those who do not want to be condemned by the past should remember their history from a positive perspective. Unquote. One of important things in uh, Professor Adler's depiction of the narratives of the Communist Party members is the nuanced approach she offers. Let me quote from uh, Nancy's talk, from, from professor's, uh, Professor Adler's talk, quote, these autobiographical accounts are not necessarily what happened, but rather perceptions of what happened. However, if we can find common elements in the narratives of several individuals, testimony can be transformed into evidence because every individual experience is typical of a class of experiences. Then it is possible to draw substantiated conclusions on what happened. When such perspectives can be seen from within the experience of the prisoner or survivor, they may not be less distressing, but they will be less puzzling, unquote. Working from within the context of experience and again through careful examination of how the victims represent and or reconceptualize the terror in their testimonies, unquote, can lead us with Nancy to reconceptualization of victimization and dehumanization. And let me remind you that conceptualization of different and divergent forms of dehumanization of victims, but also of perpetrators in different political and historical contexts is one of the main goals of this joint Russian South African project. In my response uh, to Professor Adler's rich presentation, I will touch upon only two questions. The first one is the question whether the conceptualization of the Gulag experience by religious believers might be similar to the conceptualization of the Gulag experience of the true believers in the party. And from there, I will also talk about the difference between the aesthetics of Barlam Shalamov and the aesthetization or even heroization of memoirs and uh, memoirs of the Gulag uh, by those who quote, remember their history from a positive perspective, unquote. First, 
the comparison that Professor Adler suggests explicitly in her presentation between religious believers and, quote, the, re re the religion-like quality of communism, unquote. For example, also when she talks of, quote, the redeeming value of religious suffering, even martyrdom, unquote. Indeed, the similarities between the two groups are striking. Where the victims of religious belief were sacrificing their lives for their belief, Christians, for example, for Christ, for many of Professor Adler's interlocutors, quote, personal misfortunes are accepted with resignation or satisfaction in the fulfillment, uh, ful fulfillment of a greater purpose for the collective, the party, and the motherland, unquote. As, for example, was the case for Maria Eileen, quote, Spiritual was not God, but the party. You give your life in service and sacrifice, unquote. The similarities are striking also when we place testimonies from both believers in God and believers in party, beside Viktor Frankl's exp explanation that, quote, suffering ceases to be suffering in some way at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice, unquote. This question of similarity has already been noted and answered positively by the survivors themselves. But if meaning giving or conceptualizations of experience is comparable, the question presents itself, does it matter what to believe? And then, of course, a scholar cannot compare the experiences of the believers in God and the believers in the party without in in inevitably playing God while judging. But, and this is for another discussion, it is certainly the task of scholars to ask the different difficult questions of how communism is not a religion and how religion is not ideology. I already tried to formulate some answers uh, within the discussion initiated by our late, very esteemed colleague, Sonia Lurman, around Yuri Sleshkin's The House of Government. You can uh, read, uh, read it on the website of uh, the book forum. And now back to my response to Professor Adler. So while only victims can judge for themselves about their many meaning giving, with this comparison, we are balancing between two imperatives which are, I already brought in during our first round table. On the one hand, the imperative, don't compare, the living are incomparable. On the other hand, the imperative, compare any with any. The first imperative belongs to the great Russian poet and victim of Stalin, Stalin's terror, uh, Osip Mandelstam. The second imperative belongs to the French uh, diplomat and writer Jean Giradou, whom I quoted from the ego documents of Varlam Shalamov. And Shalamov is the writer to whom any study of uh, Soviet repression appeals. Also, Professor Adler refers to Shalamov in her talk, exactly when she brings uh, in the difference between the memoirs of the party believers and those who, quote, saw no greater good or salvation in the suffering of the camps, end of quote. I will suggest two possible explanations for this difference in meaning giving of the victims in a minute to first bring to an end uh, the question of similarities between the two groups of believers. Please note that I now bring in uh, the aspect of dehumanization, not of meaning giving. I will do so by quoting from Shalamov. Maybe those of you who were present at the first round table remember that the it is from Varlam Shalamov that I draw the testimonies for the political focal po point of my own research on extreme dehumanization, a condition where, quote, nothing human is left in a human being except for rage, hatred, and envy, unquote. Today, I'd like to quote from Shalamov's 1961 notition, which is called What I Saw and Learned in the Camp, where he sums up his Gulag experience in 46 points. Under point eight, we read, quote, the only group that retained a bit of their humanity, despite the starvation and abuse, were the religious, the sectarians, almost all of them, and the majority of priests, unquote. 
Shalamov repeats, repeats almost the same a year later in a letter to Solzhenitsyn, quote, if there were people in the camp who in spite of all the horrors, hunger, beating and cold, overwork, kept and preserved invariably human features, those were sectarians and generally religious people, including Orthodox priests. Of course, there were some good people from other groups as well, but they were only lo uh, loners, and perhaps until the occasion when it became too hard. Sectarians, though, have always remained human." Unquote. A comprehensive study of religious martyrs of Soviet regime has yet to be written. Irina Piart, who presented at our first uh, round table and is with us today, is currently conducting very interesting research in this field. But what about the difference between the aestheticization or even heroization of memoirs of Gulag by those who remember their history from a positive perspective and the aesthetics of cruelty we encounter in Shalamov? Let me focus on uh, this briefly now by first pointing out to the decisive importance of quality of life. Quality of life is the only reason for the difference between Shalamov's camp experience, culmination of which I find in his uh, short story Dominus, quote, worse things exist than eating human flesh, and camp experience of the great Russian writers Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn, but also between Shalamov and many of the Soviet Gulag survivors who testify to the most inspiring conversations art production of the highest quality and other intellectual treasures they gained uh, in the camps. We will certainly hear relevant examples today. And I think of the stories told by my own acquaintance, actress Tamara Petkevich, whom Russian participants might, might know from her book, Zhizn Sapazhok Niparny, translated into English as memoir of a Gulag actress. One becomes, becomes almost jealous when hearing of uh, these dense uh, intellectual environments as described by Petkevich. Shalamov is very clear about this difference. Quality of life in his case shows that by severe frost and hunger, working 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and being constantly beaten up by convoy and criminals, healthy young men became within 20 to 30 days goners. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, persons quote, doomed to die beyond hope or help, end of quote. What makes Shalamov's testimony so terrifying is that anyone is subject to the dehumanization, regardless of social, educational, or religious background, or any other condition. The dehumanization is unconditional. Quote, these terms are repeatedly tested, unquote. According to Shalamov, there is no room for love or friendship under these camp conditions. The vanishing of all human emotions, besides anger and bitterness, and eventually also of memory and language, is repeated many times in Shalamov's stories about the Kalama camps. And this is exactly what Shalamov is trying to do in his pr prose. In his Kalama tales, he is trying to exceed a common ontological condition of the Gulag victims or to recall Santaniana's admonition again of those who remember their history from a positive perspective. For example, the condition of the narrator of Shalamov's uh, own story, Dry Rations. Quote, a human being survives by his ability to forget. Memory is always ready to blot out the bad and retain only the good. Unquote. Certainly, and contrary to that, Shalamov states, quote, I don't want to forget anything, and exactly in that I see my fate, unquote. His purpose was not to forget and to testify to what he had encountered. He explicitly sets reliability as a standard for reflection. Shalamov is writing what he calls the prose of the future, the only criterion of which is reliability, quote, Prose of the future demands something different. Not the writers will talk, but men of profession who pos uh, possess the writer's gift. And they will tell only about what they know, what they saw. Reliability 
This is the power of literature of the future, unquote. Therefore, I would argue that Shalamov's Kaluma tales, with all their attention to, for detail and metaphors, should be classified under ego documents in the first place. Shalamov scholar Francisco Thun Hohenstein is correct in concluding that the narratives and narrative uh, means Shalamov uses in his prose are applied only, quote, in addition to the authority that this text already contains because of the strength of the testimony of its author, who survived the conditions of Kalima hell, unquote. To sum up, I started with my appreciations, uh, appreciation of uh, Nancy's nuanced approach, quote, from within the experience of the prisoner or survivor, unquote. And then following this approach, I touched upon two questions. Firstly, the question whether the conceptualization of the Gulag experience by religious believers might be similar to the conceptualization of the Gulag experience of the true believers in the party. And from there, I talked about the difference between the aesthetics of Shalamov and the aestheticization or even heroization of mem memoirs of those from Santanyana's admonition who do not want to be condemned by the past and therefore remember their history from a positive perspective. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Professor Tolstaya. Uh, do I understand I have the opportunity to uh, to comment? Okay, I would greatly take that. Um, first of all, I um, I appreciate that uh, you are challenging me in my thinking about the comparison of uh, uh, party true believers with religious believers, and as I said. Um, I also understand um, what a fragile ground uh, uh, we tread upon when when we compare anything to anything. But we are we are scholars, and uh, along with analysis, we also analogize. Um, a couple of words on let's say, besides uh, besides just uh, meaning making, the tendency to seek something greater than oneself is, is of course, it's not unique to religion. It's a property of being human and it's used and exploited by religious uh, and secular total institutions. Um, some of the similarities we see is sacrificing uh, the individual for the collective, self-reflection, um, purging, confession, conversion, uh, and, and those different features of, of both experiences. Uh, another is that claims are not falsifiable, inconsistent evidence, for example, the depredations of the gulag are in, is interpreted as serving a higher purpose. Total institutions compel compliance because they control resources, they control life, death, suffering, and the long-term influence of that can be indoctrination or incorporation of that compliance. Um, so as I said, allegiance is not compared by contradictory evidence. And the thing about communism, a let's say a, a major difference is that it promised that the reward was ahead and just within reach, not in an afterlife, but in this life, um, but it never had a delivery date of that. So. I, I won't go on uh, too much longer about this analogy because I was more using that in the context of our research consortium to talk about how we how we process experiences. And on that note, if I turn to to the great writings of Shalomov, um, indeed, this should be his reliability should be a standard. Uh, for reflection. But in terms of processing the experience uh, after the camp, I mean, uh, Shalamov talked about the, the goners, the Dahadyagi, and he also talked about camp being a place that turned people into Lagarnaya camp dust, uh, where they would be 
uh, which would refer to them just disintegrating and never even being properly buried. But Shalomov, after camp, suffered from what we would define today as uh, the camp syndrome. And he, uh, in the society in which he lived, this was a politically proscribed diagnosis. So he could never be treated for this psychiatric diagnosis. He did not, he, he was not able to reunite with families. He didn't think you even should at some level because the camp only makes a person worse and you couldn't, you couldn't remain human. Uh, but Shalomov suffered very, very deeply after the camp. Um, in many of the narratives that I have engaged, especially looking at, let's say, the, the communist loyalists, the processing of the experience enabled a better post-camp survival um, and maintaining belief that something actually was meaningful rather than that you misspent the years of building socialism or misspent your life, uh, it was certainly helped preserve uh, believers. And But I, I, of course, want to say that this is not, they're not representative. Uh, and Shalomov is, uh, there are a number of writers in his category uh, that have presented uh, the actual, uh, the actual, uh, uh, let's say, the abundance of wretched conditions. Uh, there, are, there are many more that are that are quite well known and that do, don't do any whitewashing of the experience. But it's clear that there are enough in, in this society in the post-Soviet space who have been able to reconceptualize this experience in order to, um, in order to have to give a different meaning to their personal and and and, and their nation's past. I I could um, yeah, I could go um, on about this. I don't see yeah. Yeah, Prof. Hadla and Prof. Um, Tolstoy, thank you both for this uh, wonderful conversation. So apparently Professor Kumla is having some connection issues. So I'll just step in to read the questions. We have three questions here. And um, the first one is from Mark Steinberg from the University of Illinois. And um, just to summarize his question, he's asking, he says that your evidence about emotions in these narratives you know, is very important. Um, range, the emotions range from love to bitterness, not to mention faith and belief, um, uh, which have emotional dimensions. So um, you also speak about emotional dependence on the party and offer a complex evidence about this. So would you say more about the place of emotions in your analysis of suffering and memory and your approach to interpreting emotions in the narratives of the past. I don't know if I should continue, but it looks like Prof. Pumla is already here. So maybe I should just... Please continue, complete the question. Sorry, I had a power cut. Okay. Nice to see you okay. again. <laughs> so, and, and I'm going to, like, I just want to put all the questions together because we have about just six minutes more so that you can just answer all of them together. So the second question, is from Marco Pavlovic. And he says that, are the KGB, KGB officers open to today to speak about gulags? Because they are, there are just stories, because these are just stories from one side. Um, that's the, maybe I should repeat it again. It says, are the KGB officers open today to speak about gulags? Because these stories are just from one side. And then we just have another, Oh, there's so many. Can let, yeah, can you let them answer these two, respond to these two? Is that all right, Adibai? Thank you sure. so much. I really appreciate it taking over. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for these very good questions. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, nice, to, nice to virtually see you here. Um, thinking about emotions, one of the reasons that, um, that the emotional bond to the party uh, was probably so necessary is because the camp experience broke up families. Um, when they returned, family, uh, family reunions were very difficult. In fact, uh, I can think of very few examples in, in, in my research where people had 
were, were able to reunite with their families. So the emotions that we would normally be able to experience uh, the, let's say the vacuum that the camp might have left could not be filled by that. They would, they would, uh, uh, there were new marriages, but, but not with, not of course with their, uh, with their former uh, spouses, many of whom, by the way, had been, uh, uh, they had to be divorced first well, because they were enemies of the people. So um, the emotional dependence uh, on the party was facilitated by the fact that the party had taken away so much, um, so much of the, the self. I think I can, I can leave it at that, but I can think about this a little more and we can actually talk about this a little more. The KGB, um, yes, is this a one-sided uh, presentation? I have presented the perspectives of the victims because we were talking about dehumanization, uh, rehumanization and the reconceptualization of suffering. Um, but there are many more sources coming out of the perpetrator studies. We also know that uh, in communist societies uh, that their the lines were not always so black and white because so many were implicated. And uh, even sometimes if one had a survivable job in the camp, it was bought at the price of, of uh, informing on, on, your, on your barracks mates. So, so there were a lot of different degrees of potential uh, culpability and that guilt uh, plagued uh, returnees for many, many years after the camps. But there are starting to be some conversations with descendants uh, of, of um, KGBers and, and of perpetrators. Uh, we've seen some conversations between the grandchildren where uh, a grandchild of a, uh, of a KGB agent or an NKVD agent says, I, I don't, this wasn't my fault, but I would like to ask forgiveness of, of another grandchild, of someone who had identified that this was this in the chain of command that that the grandfather was a perpetrator. So, writ small, there are some actual uh, uh, attempts at reconciliation between both sides going on, and we do have uh, sometimes vastly different narratives about what happened uh, in exhibitions. Um, I mean, when I, I, getting getting also back to what Professor Tolstaya said about the reliability standard, there still remains very much of uh, there are a number of truths, um, and uh, there is also a selection of of uh, what is important and what is unimportant to remember from the past. And it doesn't mean that they're falsehoods. It just means that that those truths are being used uh, uh, to uh, to create a new narrative. Um, I, I have always been uh, deeply impressed, I have to say here, with the, with the South African example, and that's when I started uh, following and admiring Pumla's work on creating a, a shared narrative of the past, and if not a shared narrative, at least a shared custody of the past. And I, I think we're quite some ways um, uh, from from anything like that in Russia, but I think the conversations like these can move us towards at least recognizing the areas of, of agreement and disagreement in the areas of negotiability. I don't know. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Professor. Uh, Hadler, you have so many questions here and definitely we cannot exhaust all of the questions because of time. We made a pact to keep to time and we are already out of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask if um, we can at least maybe we just ask, uh, you know, read one more question or we should just round off. But it seems that we could do another round of question in five minutes. Is that okay with you? Professor Adler, are you fine oh, with? Oh, with yeah. me, uh, certainly. Yeah. I, I, I knew how rigorous the schedule was, so uh, I, I just can't read them very well myself. I'm afraid to lose the screen. Oh, okay. Um, um, so let me just ask 
these two questions at once in five in four minutes and then we'll round off um this session so um I irena says i would like to ask a question regarding the methodology of the study of gulag narratives how should we approach the problem of the genre does gulag literature has a genre or could we speak of genres then the other question does forgiveness come to surface in these autobiographical narratives dr adler so um again i just want to ask you to please um, be very brief in your answers to these questions yes uh thank you uh irina well uh in terms of a genre there is very much of a genre of gulag memoirs leona toker has has written an excellent work about that uh, we also have many different types of gulag memoirs. Uh, lots of them <clears throat> were are still unpublished. Uh, Simeon Vilansky, who had been the head of Vazvrashenia, the return, gathered manuscripts for decades uh, from the 60s on and was not able to publish all of them, was, but was able to publish many of them. And fortunately, Lots of the better known memoirs were uh, were also published in many many languages. So there is there is definitely a uh, thousands uh, thousands of titles uh, uh, of gulag memoirs, and uh, we uh, uh, can learn uh, so much about the camp experience from reading them. Whether forgiveness uh, comes to the surface in them. Uh, I didn't focus on the question, to be honest, um, and it doesn't, uh, I don't, I don't recall it being a very uh, prominent feature in the Gulag memoirs. I also can say that I, I watched the um, return of names uh, ceremony this past October, where in at the Solovetsky stone, the memorial to victims of Stalinism, people can come forward and read the names of, of, of the victims. And uh, this year and previous years that I've been there, uh, I've heard the names enunciated and I have heard people say, we will not forgive and we will not forget. Uh, and if I can say something in terms of forgiveness from a transitional justice perspective, um, there were no institutionalized methods of, uh, of approaching uh, Russia's repressive past. Uh, in 1992, there was a rather missed chance uh, when there was a hearing on the constitutionality of the Communist Party that might have been a Russian type of Nuremberg, but that it didn't get beyond the subject at hand. And so I think forgiveness uh, would be something important to talk about after some types of recognized transitional justice mechanisms in its very broadest sense were implemented, even in the sense of historical dialogue uh, um, and any other number of, of mechanisms. I hope that uh, was thank, enough. Yeah, thank you so much, um, um, Professor Adler and Professor Tostoya. We are so grateful for this session, for your fascinating talk and the conversation that followed, and also for the questions. And we want to apologize that we are not taking all the questions because um, uh, we, are, we are running out of time. So um, the, next, the next session is going to be by 2 p.m. South African time, which is like in 40 minutes time. So thank you for participating. Thank you for joining us. And we hope that you can join us for the next session. Now we had a, a Russian session and the next session is going to be um, a panel on South Africa and um, uh, a curator is going to be in conversation with two art um, scholars and the title of their panel is After Fire. So um, I hope that you can all join us in the next 40 minutes for this um, 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 continuation of the conversation, albeit in a South African context. So thank you everyone. Uh, and also just to say that this is the same link that you will click on for this next session. So you can click on this same link and you'll see us here in the next um, 40 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, see thank, you. You. thank you for your excellent questions. Welcome to you all and welcome back to those of you who were with us um, during our earlier session. Uh, this is again uh, our event on the aesthetics of cruelty. 
And this afternoon, we are going to be hearing from Griev Valley and her panel of um, colleagues. They will be in conversation together um, for the next about 50 minutes. So we welcome you back and welcome to you, Gray, and your team. The topic of their presentation is after fire. And Greer Valley is in conversation during this time with Stefani Conradi and Nashilongwe Shipwe Mushanja. She will be introducing the two of her colleagues and I will be introducing her. Greer is a lecturer in history of arts at the Wirtz School of Arts. She is a doctoral candidate in art, historical studies and creative knowledge at the Michaelis School of Fine Arts and a doctoral fellow at the Archive and Public Culture Initiative at the University of Cape Town. She's been a curatorial fellow at the Institute for Creative Arts and she was selected as a Getty Foundation Fellow of the Modern Art Histories in and across Africa, South and Southeast Asia. In 2019, she was part of the Dakar Biennial and 2020 Selection Committee and selected again as guest curator for the upcoming Biennial. Her research and practice interests include curatorial interventions in institutions and exhibition spaces focus on African colonial histories, and she is experienced in the visual arts, architecture, and design industries in South Africa, the Netherlands, and the UK. She graduated uh, for her undergraduate degree in architecture and an honors degree in visual arts and a master's degree in visual arts at the same institution. Welcome to you, and I pass on the virtual mic to you, Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pumla, and um, thank you to your team, and um, also just welcome to everybody participating in the colloquium today. Um, I am going to introduce my two colleagues. Um, they, uh, so I see that my one colleague has joined us and we are just waiting for um, Nashi Mushanja to also uh, join, which he will do in a few seconds. Um, so I'll just read out their bios and then just explain a little bit uh, about our project um, and how we've, we've come to this topic. Um, okay, so firstly, um, Nashi Mushanja is a performer, educator, and writer with practice and research interests in embodied and spatial archives in movement formation. Mushanja is also a PhD artist at the Center for Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies at the University of Cape Town, studying queer practice and Udano archives. His recent performance, Dance of the Rubber Tree, is a cross-disciplinary critical queer intervention in museums theaters and archives in Germany, Switzerland, South Africa, and Namibia. He is also involved in curative projects from time to time, such as the John Mufanjejo season, Operation Odalate Naiteke, and Owela Festival in 2019. And then my next uh, colleague and also collaborator while at Stellenbosch University, um, Stephanie Conradi, um, is also a, a lecturer at, at Stellenbosch University, um, specializing in printmaking. And Stephanie creates ornate sculptures of entangled objects inspired by home decor found in working class homes in South Africa. Though seemingly only used for aesthetic purposes or seen as commonplace, Conradi suggests that they could provide an important lens through which to examine value placement and meaning making. Her work examines the histories of colonialism and creolization embedded in domestic material culture, calling into question how identity is encoded in the private domain. Creolization directs our attention towards the cultural phenomena that results from dis displacement and the ongoing dynamic interchange 
of symbols and practices, eventually leading to new forms with varying degrees of stability. So I'd just like to welcome both of you to, the, to this panel and thank you very much for participating. Um, and then just briefly before we get into the, to the content of, of the panel and to the artistic works, um, I just want to briefly give a context to After Fire, which initially was a proposed exhibition for the D DAC Art Biennial. Um, and the theme for the biennial is Indafa, which is described to signify the dynamics and the act of creating, recreating and refining. It refers to the forge that transform, that transforms to the awe with which to create the new material and the labor and fire inherent in the process of crea creativity. And we really wanted to use this idea of fire or creating out of fire um, to talk about the urgent need to find new epistemologies to respond to contemporary global crises, which includes environmental degradation, increasing poverty, inequality, polarization, and also the rising right-wing nationalist sentiment. Um, and many of these issues, we sort of recognize that many of these issues arose from colonialism and capitalist modernity, and also persist as, as the dominant systems that structure the world. Um, and we specifically uh, wanted to think about the idea of fire or sort of forging through fire um, and transformation through fire to talk about um, the restitution and um, politics of return around objects that are still held captive in, um, in European museums. Uh, that was the initial sort of idea, but it's kind of becoming a lot more and sort of bigger than that. But we, I will leave it to the artists and to our conversation to kind of unpack uh, this topic further. Um, so I, so how we're going to structure our panel is we're actually um, envisioned that this would be a conversation between the three of us um, and where I would sort of pose questions to the artists, we would show uh, the work as well. Um, and um, the artists have also been asked to prepare questions for each other. So we're actually inviting you to a conversation between the three of us rather than a panel uh, sort of panel presentation. Um, so I am going to, if I can just share my screen. Um, there we go. Okay, excuse me guys, I'm just sort of working this out. Okay. So I am going to start with um, Stephanie, Stephanie's work. Um, and I would like to invite her to take us through some of the images. Um, and once we've done that, we will then uh, engage with, um, with, 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 the, with the sort of content and the symbolism in the work. Um, so Stephanie, if I can ask you um, just to start off, um, from my understanding, your sculptures are primarily made of ornaments collected from homes in Cape Town, South Africa, and Rehoboth in Namibia. Um, and both places are connected to your family's history. Could you talk to us a little bit about your background and how this relates to your sculptural assemblages? Hi everyone, thank you um, for joining us. Um, and thanks Korea for uh, introducing us. Um, so I am um, from mixed descent. Um, my background is that my father is um, uh, what we call in South Africa an Afrikaner. He grew up in Stellenbosch here in South Africa. And then my mother um, is what in Namibia they, her group would call um, a Riobos um, buster. And both places have quite a defined cultural history, but 
um, when we uh, came, or as we grew up, it was sort of very difficult to um, link to one or the other. And so we sort of like had a flattening out <laughs> of the two groups that came together and we didn't really ascribe to one or the other, but rather it became a sort of mixture of both my mother and my father's um, cultural um, heritages, but also um, I think language was a commonality with both of them. So in, in that uh, there was kind of one of the commonalities. And so as I um, started my degree in, in fine arts, my undergraduate, um, I was interested in how to sort of define my own identity. And so I didn't want to necessarily um, link it to uh, people or uh, portraiture or, you know, in that way, just think about identity rather. I, I thought, what are the things that um, I think about in terms of when I think about my identity, what is sort of a stable thing that I always uh, remember in, in my upbringing? And then um, it led me to looking at the objects that we um, had in our home. And I became interested in um, then reflecting on, was it only in our home that these objects would occur? And would I be able to, if I looked back at my family in Namibia, as well as here in South Africa, would I be able to find commonalities? And so it was quite interesting um, then when I did my honors research that I um, went to a place called Goedverbach and I saw similar kind of objects and so um, thinking about the similarities that go across um, groups, whether it's in Namibia or in um, South Africa. And so I, I became interested in defining my identity rather through looking at the material culture in homes, um, rather than looking at, um, looking at sort of defining or categorizations like race. Um, and also even maybe looking trying to sort of sidestep a very typical way of reading culture, like we've been sort of inculcated into thinking about different cultural groups having very um, specific uh, things that are attached to them, um, whether it's language or traditions, and sort of trying to think that if we can look at these traditions, rituals and practices through objects, how would we define um, how would the objects have biographical details that could sort of tell something different to how we've um, been taught or um, visually encoded to, to look at certain things. So my um, assemblages are sort of my making sense of the different cultural um, histories that um, I guess I'm in, like embodied in and so or um, that embody me. And so these are sort of like um, maybe constellations or like uh, someone said that it looks like a big bang <laughs> or someone <laughs> ran through, a bull ran through a china shop. And so maybe that's a <laughs> sort of analogy to think about all these like seemingly strange um, domestic objects coming together in a sort of a constellation of um, different assemblages or bricolages that okay. are me making sense of, yeah. Okay, um, interesting. And um, so I think we, I, I think we'll come back to that idea of the Big Bang. <laughs> I think that's quite interesting. Um, but I also wanted to, you know, to, to touch on sort of concepts of trauma because you, um, you do talk a lot. I know in your in in much of your research work and your written work, you you talk about uh, you are interested in the subject of colonialism, and specifically how um, you know uh, the idea of the Creole comes from a colonial context, right? Or post-colonial context. And I wanted to uh, just ask you, you know, how how does the concept of trauma or unease sort of fit into your work, um, you know, in also in the sense that um, in terms of the kind of post-colonial 
Creole or entangled society, one can feel both at home and alienated um, from the society you were born into at the same time. Um, and um, this is specifically speaking, I mean, I think it sort of speaks to, um, you know, I think a, a, a range of, of groups and individuals, but I'm thinking specifically here about groups that identify as, as of mixed heritage or Creole, um, or in the South African context, people that identify as colored. Um, yesterday, we spoke a lot about the Buster community in Namibia um, and the complexities around that. Um, and so, I wanted you to talk a little a bit about the idea of trauma that comes from being from both here and elsewhere and not always comfortably fitting into the racial binaries of black and white, um, specifically in South Africa, but then also in Namibia. Um, so what is your intention with this? And um, could you talk a little bit to, to that idea? Thanks. Um, so I think that in terms of the idea of trauma, it, and then also um, creolization. Creolization, um, as many theorists have uh, um, expanded on it, is always uh, a moment where there is a group um, brought to a sort of a displaced place, like um, many of the colonial settings. And then what happens in that encounter? So um, what is created in that moment of trauma? And then after that, it becomes a sort of um, much of a meaning making. So um, at the same time, there's this idea that you never can go back to the original moment, that encounter where you, can, you can't trace it. So much history has uh, gone, has happened already that to be able to go back is to try and like actually sort of nullify everything that's happened in between. And so I guess that my, my initial thing is yes, there's, thought is that yes, there's trauma and displacement. So if you look at like, I'm looking at two different um, places in my uh, PhD research, is that the one is here in Stellenbosch at a place called Deflakte. And that was a central community in the, the town of Stellenbosch that were, was displaced in the 1960s um, with the um, Group Areas Act. And they were moved to um, various places in Stellenbosch, Klutusville and Idis Valley um, were the two main areas that they were forcibly removed to. So there's this one where it's like, a, there's a history of recent displacement and then there's a history of of like maybe 200, 300 years of displacement. So it's like a continual thing. And then, so it's like, what happens when you're displaced? And then what do you create out of that situation of displacement? Does it become a moment where it, um, where this, yeah, it's, I guess it's that idea of hybridity, like in that moment of displacement, new things um, are created out of that. And similarly with the bustage, that moved from South Africa actually into Namibia. Um, they also, why they moved from the Northern Cape in South Africa was be, because their land was being taken away by um, farmers in the area. And so there's this constant like idea of uh, moving away in the Bustish case, they chose to move away so that they could look for new land. And in um, the people in Stellenbosch's case, they were forcibly displaced. And so out of that, uh, um, people obviously take uh, things with them. And so there's both trauma attached to the objects or trauma that is attached to the objects when it gets taken away. Many residents mm -hmm. would say that they couldn't take the objects with them. And then what, what objects do you then think about if you're trying to sort of stabilize yourself in a, in a, in a moment of dislocation, then what mm -hmm. are the objects mm -hmm. that are attached meaning to in that new setting? Um, so that's sort of where my idea of trauma comes from, but also rather thinking of focusing on trauma specifically, it's about generation as well. Like how do you generate um, new, what is new that gets generated out of that moment of conflict? And mm -hmm. I think that's specifically what I look at um, in, in my own research and then looking at specifically objects and how objects can sort of carry the history with the biographical details of those moments, those encounters, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, thanks, Stephanie. I think what we'll do is we'll go to Mush uh, Mushanja, 
and then we'll come back to you again. So, um, uh, but thank you very much. That was a very interesting. Um, and I think the idea about trauma being attached to object biographies um, is, is very interesting and it applies to, you know, objects that are also in, can be found in museums, right? That, you know, the kind of movement of objects and the displacement of those objects um, when thinking about questions around restitution um, and return of objects and repatriation. Um, so we will go to Mushanja, who um, thinks about these issues, uh, specifically in a, constitu in a constitutional, con uh, constitutional, institutional context. Um, and we will watch two of his videos and then um, just, and then I'll ask you Mushanja, if you could uh, take us through your practice um, because you've also drawn on the metaphor of fire to address the violence and trauma of colonialism um, and coloniality. Um, and like I said, you've worked with museums specifically in Europe, but then also in, in Namibia and South Africa to address these issues. Um, so I will, we will watch the performance. Um, and then if you could start thinking about, about this as well in the meantime, thanks. Let me just...
reprimand, to heal, and to restore this dignity. Everyone's there, but I have love. Okay, um, Nashi, if you could um, just talk us through your performance and then also address this, the, the metaphor fire that you often employ in your work. Sorry, I was saying thank you very much for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry that I'm a bit late. Um, but yes, so the, 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 the video you just saw and the pictures that you're probably having a look at now are part of my performance research project for my PhD, which is called Ondani Saapom Zime, which means the dance of the rubber tree. Um, which basically I describe as an immersive queer um, ritual uh, protest performance, um, specifically designed to transgress and explore notions of archive and other notions of archive and archiving. Uh, whether it's in museums, theaters, libraries, monument sites, um, streets, uh, galleries, this is where this work is being performed. Um, so it's, it's mostly particularly interested in the question of erasure. And I uh, saw so in making it, it, it as a work that began in a colonial photography archive in a Hamburg Museum of Ethnography in 2018, what I was mostly interested in when I was entering that archive is to enter with other things that are not necessarily colonial. So other archives that are not necessarily violent to help me speak back to the colonial archive um, or the nationalist archive or the colonial nationalist archive as I call it. So it's particularly interested in erasure because the colonial archive is about erasure. So I was very interested in coming with other modes of erasure 
generative and productive modes of erasure. So there isn't in, in my culture, I'm Oshuambo speaking from Namibia, there isn't necessarily a thing as a dance of a rubber tree, but um, the, the, the rubber tree on the me is particularly important for different rituals. Um, so it's this shrub that is particularly known for if you have bed luck and a ritual needs to be performed, they'll take a branch from there. If you wanna cleanse your house, um, you can take a branch from there and put it at your gate. Uh, or at your entrance, people who come with positive, I mean, negative vibes, they get, you know, um, like you can't make a knob key from this tick because, uh, from this tree because your cows will go, right? So there's all these knowledge associated to this tree around erasure, even sorcery and so forth. Yeah. So it becomes very useful for me. In fact, it is already an archive. Mm -hmm. And in order to in a colonial archive, um, I needed to go with one of these things being a rubber tree. Well, I didn't go with it, but my knowledge, my embodied knowledge that I have constitutes as kind of, um, it's actually some kind of archive, right? That I could use to speak back to or to address the dominant systemic archive. Um, so the work is basically happens in all these different sites. Uh, it's also happened in Cameroon. The video that you just saw was in Yaounde, Yaounde, Cameroon. Um, and basically, like I said, it's, 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 it's ritualized behavior. It's some kind of ritual, um, very participatory. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's about cleansing, but it's also very much about protest and bringing in alternative narratives that are not necessarily centered. By, by the colonial or the nationalist archive. So other modes of archive that I use is salt. So mm -hmm. would be throwing salt everywhere in, 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 in the performance, would be giving audience salt, right? You arrive and we give you salt uh, because salt, again, salt as an archive, salt as this thing in Africa, in different places in Africa that we use to cleanse our spaces. Salt is a natural resource. Salt is archive. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very big also on struggle songs and the sonic, sonic, sonic scape, creating sonic scapes. So what I try to do is also write my own struggle music or take a lot from um, Look Around Southern Africa. Uh, like one of the songs you just heard is Vanotambarara. Uh, it was the chorus in the background, which is a Zimbabwean struggle song. Chimurenga song um, uh, that was sung during the liberation struggle, still sung. Um, so a lot of the practice has also been trying to tap into those kind of archives to speak back to erasure of, of, mm -hmm. of, of dominant archive. And then obviously fire, which you asked about, fire is, is, is suggested in the work. So we either give audiences candles or we have a whole big fire um, but fire again here is considered as a generative tool, but also as a as a as a something that's it's it's archive. It's also archive. So, for example, in the web, we don't just give you we don't just make an actual fire. Um, sometimes we can't make an actual fire, like in some museums in Germany museums. or theaters, where it's completely <laughs> historically. Uh, theaters have burned. So it was such a struggle to just even bring a candle in because they just don't trust, right? Which was also interesting. So in the work, there's a poetic part as well. I write a bit poetry. And in this poetry, I ask the audience to repeat after me. So it would go something like, let us burn the museum, right? So I say, oh, please repeat after me if you like, let us burn the museum and really different responses. And I'll speak about that later. Um, let us go to the funeral of the curator. Let us make love to white men and nationalist men. Now, a lot of these lines are quite controversial, um, particularly the fire one, for example. Um, 
because what I'm trying to say there is to really think about literally and metaphorically burning the museum and seeing what happens for many reasons. Because I mean, if the thing needs to be dismantled so that we, we, we get forward, why shouldn't we use fire, you know? So that's one of my reasons. But also really, I'm really thinking about other uses of fire, how we use it at home, on the continent, in the region. Um, over Herero speaking people in Namibia have got what they call a holy fire, where they go to connect with their ancestors, where a fire is lit. And that is how suddenly, not suddenly, but that is how they are able to summon other presences in like ancestral presence right that's mm -hmm, archival mm -hmm. knowledge right in Zambia yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay, no I I'm sorry <laughs> yes I think I think let's stop there for now um so I mean I found, I found this kind of idea of embodied knowledge very interesting um and I would like us to return to Stephanie's work um because I was wondering if she could speak to us about this idea of embodiment, um, you know, because, she, uh, you know, the kind of connection with the object and the self, the self-portrait. So, you know, using an, an, an object or a series of objects or a kind of bricolage of objects to talk about the self. Um, and specifically, uh, Stephanie, I was interested in, in how, you know, your work challenges fixed and sort of comfortable perceptions and frames of race and identity in the African context. Um, so I want, could you just talk a little bit more about that um, and what you feel is the role of the object in narrating these histories of identity and belonging? Um, we touched a little bit on the kind of you know the, the sort of display uh, ideas of displacement um, so in South Africa and Namibia and um, I wanted to also just talk about land, um, this idea of the connection to land and, you know, how land as well is a um, um, uh, is an identifier or sort of attaches meaning, or gives meaning to a sense of belonging and identity. Um, could you talk about that? And then we'll, we'll go back to Mushanja because I would like for you to also um, you know, I think you have some questions for, for him as well. And, and then perhaps we can open up that dialogue between the two of you also. Um, so yeah, if you, if you wouldn't mind just going ahead uh, with that question. Okay, um, so I, I guess that my interest in um, the object is because it moves a little bit away from race in a sense, but then it also always comes back <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to race when you start talking to people about their understanding of sort of their identity and, and how they fit in. But I think that it's interesting that you mentioned land because I also think that sometimes people associate themselves more to the place that they are in or were born in um, or the place that they were born in. And then maybe even the, the groups, that whether it be religious or cultural groups that they then form part of, and those become identifiers rather than, than race because mm -hmm. race then comes after it as a, as a construct. And so even in, in sort of thinking about colored um, identity here in South Africa, um, it's so interesting to hear like people's perceptions of the word. Some people accept it, some people feel affronted by it, but it also is something that people identify with, not because of a racial thing, but because of um, how they see certain, um, yeah, even um, <laughs> certain material practices that are attached to it then become synonymous with the word um, colored. And so those are sort of the things that I'm interested in between the intersections between those um, signifiers that can um, either bring out people's perceptions of race or trans transverse that go beyond that in terms of looking rather at ideas of, of place. And so that's specifically uh, interesting in perhaps the Rio Bosbusters um, case because they, when they moved from South Africa to um, Namibia, they chose a, a place to um, 
or they negotiated for a, a piece of land. And it actually um, went quite beyond only the Rehoboth um, town all the way to the coast um, to Henty Spire, I think it is. And so they um, sort of like cordoned it off. They've made a constitution, they got a flag and they wanted to, there was this real, um, um, Drang, um, what is the English word now? Um, they really had the strong urge to set up a nation for themselves where they where they didn't have that in South Africa. And it was all attached to land because mm. even in the constitution, if you um, didn't own land, then you couldn't uh, be a real boss bastard. And so it's quite interesting then that you all you had to also be born in Riobos or the Riobos district to be able to um, identify as Riobos bastard. And so it's quite interesting that if you compare it to um, Seno in South Africa, if you think about um, people who are called colored, there's often this like thing of displacement the whole time. Um, but even in, in talking to people from um, Clitusville and Idis Valley, the next generation, if they um, have grown up in a place, for instance, in Clitusville, I found that many people whose parents had been forcibly removed to a specific um, house, the children would then um, uh, try and buy houses, the house their parents lived in, or the house that um, is right next to it. And they would sort of try and form a, like a community around this house. So in my mind, again, mm -hmm. the house then becomes uh, an object or a, a container uh, that mm -hmm. you can link to um, identity mm -hmm. or their identity then link to a locality at the same time. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, we have these, it's, it's probably ideologically a little bit deeper than that, but I think it's interesting when you sort of start to ask people to tell their life stories through the objects, where it's, whether it's the house itself or the objects that they have in it, whether it's photographs, certificates, or um, little trinkets, then it becomes quite interesting to see how people um, identify themselves as, as something beyond how we see or understand race. And it's mm -hmm. often interesting for me to take it out of an academic environment, how people understand race. You know, it, it, it's not as compartmentalized as we in an academic environment then go back to sort of looking at it. And so those are interesting things that um, objects sort of unlock uh, that it becomes mm -hmm. more complex uh, than, mm -hmm. than the signifiers uh, that we um, look at, it, whether it's phenotypically or just at the, the pigment in your. Yeah, so uh, to yeah. me, yeah. The, those are the how I like to approach or think about race. Uh, that it's not that you you sidestep it, not at all, but that you you find ways to move beyond it. Not that you deny it, but that you find a way for people to, or for at least for me to understand it. Because when I was in South Africa, I was categorized as colored. So if I don't identify with that, then I would like to look for another way to I to find a way to to make sense of it for myself other than the signifier. Um, and so that's okay. my in the object. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. I'm gonna stop you there because I think that ties in really well to the question that you had for uh, Mushanja uh, about his work. Um, but before you, you go into that, I mean, I, I just, I, I think what's interesting for me about both of you and your respective practices um, is that you're both you're both working in ways that extend, you know, from the from the, uh, the artist's role as as the artist as maker to the artist as anthropologist, the artist as researcher, archivist, and curator. I mean, it's interesting that both of you are, you know, work in this very interesting way with archives, personal archives, um, embodied archives, uh, and so on. Um, and it's clear that you know extensive research has taken place in, in both in both senses, both you and Mushanja, um, you know, around the theoretical framing, the making, and the staging of your work. Um, 
and also both of you open up the kind of you know your work and and your um your process uh for the public and the audience to interact with in very different ways but but there's definitely that sense of of public and audience engagement um so stephanie i'm going to ask you or actually let's mushandra could i ask you to respond to that idea of of engagement and then stephanie if you uh could could do the same afterwards and then i'd like you guys to also just think about each other's work in relation to your own um, and and to think uh, especially you know around that um, you know coming back to the metaphor of forger or creating out of fire and with fire um, and how you feel that your work relates to um, to this like you know in the context of 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 your collective practice um, could I I would like to hand over to you Moshanja and then um, we'll go back to Stephanie thank you okay. Thank you. Um, so, oops, I forgot the question again. Um, <laughs> sorry. No worries, no worries, no worries. No worries. No, I was asking about. Okay, no, I was asking about your your collective practice. For me, it's quite similar in in the way that you both extend the role of the artist from just the artist as maker. Not that an artist is always just the maker, uh, obviously. I mean, there's a, a lot that goes into that, but I think both of you are clearly working with, um, you know, many, you take on many roles in your research process and in your making process. Um, and I just wanted each of you to, to talk about that your your kind of your process how you how you get to making the the art and then also how that obviously comes back to this idea of forger or creating out of fire creating a through fire and out of fire yeah so i was gonna say that i said in the beginning that my work is often characterized as ritualized behavior so that automatically means and protest behavior that automatically means that when you come and see it you are not just an audience member right and so i make my work a lot from involved in informed a lot from african concepts of performance which means that participation is key um which means that when you are there to see you must also be ready to do Obviously, it's negotiated. I don't just bombard you with work, um, mm -hmm. but often you must be enrolled or, or, or be part of the action in some way or the other. And often that is often linked to solidarity. Solidarity is very important because the work is protest work uh, or it's cleansing work. Um, it's, not, it's not just a show, right? Mm -hmm. It's detoxifying. And that's why we call in fire and all of these other, all these other other things and really fire just fire just kind of becomes that broad container which is critically useful so because we can speak of fire we want to think of fire beyond it as a destructive thing not just as a cruel mm -hmm. thing but as a generative thing because where we come from fire is useful often in these museums it's toxic right these objects mm -hmm. has been detoxified it because they are being preserved, right, with cancerous mm -hmm. chemicals. Our role is mm -hmm. to come and detoxify them. Uh, we are referring to the fire in your heart. Often when I invite artists to collaborate or to join the performance, we want you to bring the fire in your heart. Often that is enough to, to burn the museum, to, 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 to dismantle the things so that we start elsewhere. I was going to ask though, um, in terms of of just work because this is a very big concern for me that when mm -hmm. i work in these subjects places like the archive or museums and even theaters that are historically haunted right that are mm -hmm. historically and currently quite toxic uh and traumatizing there is always potential to re-traumatize so mm -hmm. for me, in the recent years as a performance artist, it's been, been very important to move from being angry. I think I've been angry for enough now, but to move towards being more gentle. And that's not to disregard anger. I think anger is important and rage is important, but 
often I, I want now to explore being gentle. So when audience come, it's really calling them in gently mm -hmm. uh, and invite and making them feel safe so that we go on this protest journey together. So my question is very, very big question uh, when I do this work and in my research is always, how do we make this work without re-traumatizing ourselves and our audience? And, and just briefly, I'm really referring to like, when I was a younger, I'm still young, but when I was a younger <laughs> performance artist, into my consciousness, there was a lot of rage and a lot of anger. Uh, and I wasn't the most politest person um, with my audience. I still don't think I'm polite and I'm not saying people should be polite, but how, mm -hmm. do, we, how do we generate care work and safety mm -hmm. And, and work to get, make sure, instead of just pointing fingers and burning the thing down. So that's the question I have for Stephanie. How, how do you navigate the possibility of re-traumatizing yourself or your audience as you work through, because these spaces are quite dark and they're quite dusty and they're unhealthy. Yeah, you know, how do you, or do, or, or, or don't you, in, I think you did say you do somehow have to deal with trauma and address it. But I'm very, that's for me a very big question if we're speaking of aesthetics and representations of cruelty. How, and that's as well as, as a performance educator, I'm always very strict on, as, whether it's with my students or other artists when we work, say, how does that, how is it, where are the possibilities of re-traumatizing um, uh, our audiences or ourselves? And what is our responsibility? What is our decolonial responsibility? Uh, other responsibilities mm. of making sure that we're really gentle and, and, and careful. Um, thank you. That's such an interesting question because <laughs> I guess like because I'm working with such personal, um, whether it's my own personal um, narratives or other people's uh, stories, that it um, because you reflect on um, what's in their personal environment, you try and um, look for the objects that are sort of uh, sensitive to the story. So in these these, all of these um, objects, they, they feel very um, like they won't tra traumatize you again. But for instance, in this um, black work over there, that work is sort of me um, trying to, there's a, uh, that's a self-portrait. And then that um, image over there is the prison in Stellenbosch, but the prison, um, one of, my uh, the people that I spoke to um, actually lived opposite um, the prison environment, but the stories that she told about the prison environment were so um, comical and funny because it was about engaging with the wardens and how they would play tricks um, on the prison wardens and so on. So in all of the stories, you sort of it, it was it's strange because people try and sidestep the the traumatic um, the traumatic side of the, the narratives that they tell you. And maybe it's because they're not um, personal, we're, we're not well acquainted, but it, it does come up in, in terms of people uh, being um, the, the traumatic side of it, but then it gets told in either a humorous way or you get um, directed to a more um, a sort of a, hop, a happier ending through the, thing, the, the, the narratives that they tell you. So it's quite interesting that the objects, yes, it evokes the, um, perhaps the traumatic events that happened, but at the same time, they're the objects that people have displayed in their living room. So they're aspirational objects at the same time that I, that I try to use. And so it's also about trying to, to focus on, on those aspirational elements rather than trying to, um, deal with the trauma, but I'm very glad that you've asked it because it's definitely something for me to think about more because it's underlying, but I definitely <laughs> am now going to try and think about it a little bit more because it's, 
it's there, but I, you know, I haven't thought about it in such a direct way. So I'm quite happy that you brought it up. Um, yeah, that that question is quite thought provoking in in terms of dealing with my own research. Yeah, um, Mishanta, I was also interested. I, I guess that this is like it's quite interesting to then reflect on on how you see my my work and and the dealing with objects and so on and then what you read into it. But in, in your work also, I see quite a strong um, pan-Africanist um, uh, element coming into the work where the use of, you mentioned rubber, that it's a, something that gets used not only in, in your Oshubambu um, uh, cultural um, rituals, but it also gets used across Africa. And in terms of how you see it at these performances as transcultural, like how do they, they go beyond, they, they enter a museum environment, but they also open a space for other people to, to join into. And you speak about gently allowing your audiences in. What um, kind of role or how do you understand that um, Pan-Africanist, um, the politics um, or trying to sidestep the politics of it in terms of your work? Um, does it become a strong sort of, we, we spoke about yesterday about the word entanglement and that sometimes we don't want to use it and other times we it's a good word to describe it but i'm very interested in in the pan-africanist element of how you engage um certain um ritualistic practices but also material um signifiers like the rubber like the rubber tree in in your work and i, I was wondering if you could maybe um expand on that a little bit more hmm. Um, so I think the, the key word is really collective or shared or solidarity. So for me, it is when I make work, it is important to look at what is shared, what seems very shared. So obviously part of my consciousness is reclaiming my identity as an Oshuamba person, as somebody who grew up in Windhoek City, um, who didn't learn Oshuambo at school, but learned Oshuambo culture only at home. Uh, but at some point in my consciousness, I've had to reclaim a lot of that. But I also soon learned that even something like oshuambo can, could be a colonial category, right? So it's not enough. And that's why for me, sharedness, the idea of what is shared and solidarity is very important. And I think that's what Pan-Africanism teaches us. Um, so for me, uh, that's why I look to things like that picture that's on the screen right now, the thing I'm holding in my hand is, is actually my costume for the performance, which is a marula seed stone, right? It's made of marula seed stones. The marula tree in itself is an archive because it's not just things we drink, it provides oil for the hair, oil for food, but now we also create costume out of that. And that in itself, that tree, is a resource that is shared, right, on this continent. You find it in different parts of this continent. Fire is a resource that is shared, is an, a shared archive. Um, struggle music, Southern African music, um, a song like Nkosi Sikeleli, Africa, in Southern Africa is found everywhere as a national anthem, as a struggle anthem, as a, as a prayer, as a, it's shared. And for me, that is what is more generative than, than just um, you know, the tribal or the ethnic category. And that's what I kind of try to, to do. And often when I try to reach out to these other forms of archives, uh, with, whether it being a marula seed stone or the rubber tree or the fire, or my body is, 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 is often because I want to make connections. And often what I find, is that these shared things, they are not just shared within the Pan-African context, right? They are shared um, universally, but also um, it's never just also Pan-African. When we speak of, of the fire, we are speaking of queer fire. So it's also queerness. We're speaking also of feminism, African feminism. These are global, international, shared solidarities, shared knowledges. And that's what's for me very important when I make work 
in order to connect with the next person as this work is quite international. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie and Mushanja. Thank you very much for uh, being part of the conversation. I think I'm going to hand over. I mean, I see we're at three o'clock, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Prof. Pumala to take us uh, uh, forward to the Q&A. So just thank you very much. Um, Prof. Pumala, you can take over from here. Thank you so much, Gray, for facilitating this fascination, fascinating conversation that brings us to uh, really such unique and, and uh, intriguing forms of responding to historical trauma. And I think this is a question that we are interested in exploring. What is it exactly? I mean, how do we respond to traumatic histories? And what is it about, uh, what is it about the aesthetics of violence that distinguishes it? What makes it unique? Why is art important in these conversations about histories of violence? And what can we say about its role in, in working through these, these histories? I think what was, what was really uh, um, for, 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 for us, and, and I see actually Anastasia has also point, posted a comment here, is, is just the notion of art as a non-narrative way of responding to trauma, of speaking about the traumatic events. You know, this is a Professor Mitrofanova, and this is why we're interested in, 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 in this uh, colloquium, in this two-day colloquium. What is it about the art? And I, I think as we move forward, perhaps to, to think about this, and hopefully more questions will come and comments from the audience. What is it about the art? What is it about, you know, about the aesthetics of, of, a, of, of, of violence and suffering that distinguishes it? Distinguish it? Is it? Does it make it a, a more, um, does it make it more visible? Does it make it better to deal with it? Does it, you know, uh, uh, invite us to engage with it in, in, a, in a much more, in a much less threatening way? You know, these are some of the questions that are really important. And I, I think even at the earlier presentation, uh, Professor Edler's presentation, there was a very graphic visual, you know, works that she just examples two art pieces that she presented besides, you know, the narrative itself, but, you know, there's the story that was, she shared of artworks that she posted on, on, a, on, a, on a PowerPoint presentation, but so dramatic, you know, you could almost feel, I mean, there was one, both of them, but there's one where the person was lying on this stretcher with the legs tied or, or you know, almost as if in prison, in imprisonment, in imprisonment of, of the pain that is in prison, uh, or the body that is imprisoned, but the shackles you could see, I mean, just the presence of the shackles in that artwork and the facial expression. There's something about the arts that I think we, we need to really engage and reflect on what is it about it? What does it do? I, 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 I know that um, the audience has many questions, so perhaps I should um, uh, hand over to the floor now to the audience and invite people to ask questions. So here is one, um, Tracy Saunders. Tracy, uh, would you like to read your question, Tracy? I think at this point it's important to hear uh, actual voices from the audience. Tracy, would you like to, to, to read your question? Um, All right, I'll read Tracy's question. How do you reduce re-traumatization of audience when staging depictions of trauma and cruelty? This is a question I think that has come up in your own conversation. How do you reduce, he's asking the question, how do you reduce it? How do you reduce the potential, the possibility that people will be traumatized? My uh, uh, secondary question to Tracy's is, should audiences be protected from feeling the pain that others have felt? That's a, a secondary question. Um, 
So if at least one of you we want to make sure that we have as many people, give as many people a chance to ask questions as possible. So perhaps if you, one of you could respond to this question. Um, perhaps you, Greer, since you have not, we have not heard from you, you've been facilitating, but perhaps you would venture a response here. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thanks, Tracy, for the question. And um, I would, I mean, I, I think, it has come up and it's 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 very interesting and you know perhaps Mishanja could could speak uh, and and Stephanie after this but um, so for me I you know it, it's something that's that's very so I teach um, kind of decolonial uh, practices in art making to uh, university students. Or, or sort of, I want to put decolonial in inverted commas. Um, but, but we look at sort of post-colonial sort of, um, you know, artists that consider the post-colonial in their, in their practices. And, um, you know, one thing that I do look at is, uh, is photography. So the practice of photography. And as we know, like the, the kind of practice, you know, or the, the act of looking has often been associated with violence, um, especially when it comes to colonial era uh, photography. Um, you know where subjects were put on display, and where you know your, your ideas around eugenics and those kinds of things were sort of tied to the practice of photography. So it's a dilemma for me when I'm showing these images in class because, as much as I want my students to understand um, the politics of the artwork I also feel that those images are incredibly violent and you know for instance images of Sarah Bartman you know re-showing those images again and again what does that do in terms of the dissemination of knowledge and um, one has to dissect those images very carefully I think Mushanja spoke about a practice of care um, and I think that as artists but also artists that work in the in scholarship you know that straddle these these worlds of scholarship and knowledge production and art making creatorship cura curatorship I think we have a responsibility of uh, of care um, or a, 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 um, a responsibility uh, towards the care of, of those of those objects and showing those objects. Um, so I so I don't have an answer um, for Tracy because because I think I think it 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 goes with it's part of the decolonial project, part of the deconstruction of the ways that we've been taught how to look, um, and that needs to be decon that that needs to change, right? That needs to be transformed, and I feel that because when you're showing a lot of these images specifically i'm, I'm thinking photo you know photographs that were taken during co uh, the co colonial 18th century photographs um you know showing it to an uninformed audience for example just showing it without intervention i think that's problematic um so even if you're trying to 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 say this is a practice if you in a museum context for example if you're trying to show your audience you know that this is a practice that occurred and this is wrong you know without intervention how does the audience interpret those image images so i feel i i, I do feel strongly about um you know the the practice or the you know um curatorial intervention in a way um to mediate uh, that 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 act of looking so that would be my response um and and i think that great care needs to be taken when when dealing with these violent and and traumatic uh, images for various reasons, um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm interested. I mean, I I think webinars are probably not the right place to extend these conversations, but it just as a as a provocation probably for for questions at another um, uh, time in another space. But I, I wonder about this idea of care. I, I, I get it. I mean, I think it's important that we, we care, we are caring. But there's also, I mean, it's interesting that this is coming up now because our next speaker, you know, uh, Professor Kondofer, he writes about an empathic uns unsettlement. And uh, this is something that 
in our unit, we are very concerned about this. We've got, you know, a, a scholar who's doing research on empathy. We, we have others looking at, you know, um, dialogue across racial groups, difficult dialogues. And part of the idea is, you know, how do we inspire, how do we inspire empathy in order for it to open up the space for building bridges or, or another language, in another language which I've used in my work for building a sense of solidarity. So em empathic unsettlement, uh, uh, you know, is, 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 is a title of, of Professor Krandoffer's book is about, I mean, in, in, my, in my view, is about the sense of you, people have to be, you have to arouse people's even, even you know, a sense of um, uh, 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 some kind of a trauma. So, but, but the importance is how do you then hold that? It, it, the, the question, it seems to me, is not that you must protect, you must be caring so much so, so that you protect, not so that people don't get, you know, their traumas don't get evolved. I would argue that perhaps it is important that some emotional strong response is is evoked by the artworks in order for the other who is witnessing i mean art is a kind of a form it's an invitation to witnessing the traumas of others right and so the stories that i mean i was looking at all the pieces that stephanie was has, has used in her work kind of trying to look to see what is in there what can i find and, and one thing that struck, you know, uh, that caught my eye is a piece that I would associate with um, Dutch colonial era. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a possible, I don't know whether it's a, but it's a, it's a piece that has a design that reminds me of the Dutch colonial era and that I've seen in museums that depict slavery era. So when people witness that, whether it is in objects or it is in a narrative, you know, is what Nancy was dealing with earlier, or, or those images of suffering, isn't the idea that you, you, you know, you're, not, you're not sort of doing this in order to be careful, but you're doing it actually to unsettle so that it is in the unsettlement that you open up the space for challenging audiences, particularly audiences that have not encountered the other in any other way, or, or either because they were avoiding to do so or they are afraid to do so. Now you're doing it in the form of, an, of artwork. And you know, should you be careful or should you actually unsettle so that then the conversation is well, what is it that is unsettling about this? And how do we understand the depths of the meaning of what is going on? Because it seems to me that that is the point, that arts can bring us to that depth of understanding. You know, it, 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 it really, uh, it, you know, it, it, it troubles that kind of carefulness and it forces us to go into these depths. It, forces the viewer or the witness because you're creating the possibility for others to witness the experiences of others, especially of the sub in, in terms of what you're talking about, to witness the experiences of the suffering other. And, and so I, 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 I worry, I mean, I, I don't worry, but I, I wonder about this idea of being careful, I mean, I, or, or how we, we understand the idea of evoking a sense of carefulness is the carefulness to protect the view, or is the carefulness, carefulness to be careful in, to be caring, in other words, about the experiences of the other? Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. I would. Could I? Could I respond to that? Sorry, Mushanja. If if I could respond, and um, and then I think you have something to say. <laughs> so, um, but what what? Sorry, I, what I wanted to say was that um, so by care, uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't look to offend or unsettle or um, 
uh, what's the other word that I like to use? Um, disrupt. Um, so not at all. I think I, I I think art that is that is talking about or that is trying to evoke a sense of empathy um, should do those things. Uh, but I think that there are various visual strategies to employ that could that could achieve that. Um, so what I was saying is that the care isn't to be care to to um, how what is the word to, to sort of be careful of with people's feelings. No, I don't think that at all. I think that art art should be disruptive. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, not all art should be disruptive. Some art can be sort of paintings of lilies and that's fine. Um, but if the intention is to talk about these big topical issues that, that, that are pressing and, and that um, actually, you know, time is running out, it's urg the urgency, it's here, you know, we have to address these issues, then of course it must be disruptive and it must be bold and, um, and, and I think that's part of when we talk about fire, you know, most people are sort of this idea of fire, it immediately upsets people, you know, talk about fire and I can guarantee I, what we were, we were going to talk about Mushanja's experiences, both in Namibia and Germany of, you know, using this metaphor of fire and actually and using actual fire, for example, in spaces like museums. Um, or even just outside museums, close to museums. My recollection of being part of Open Stellenbosch is when, you know, fire was used in ways to draw attention to the injustices and um, extreme violence uh, that and coloniality um, of that space. You know, to kind of use the, the invoke the idea of violence to draw attention to material violence. Um, you know, that, that kind of, that is present as a result of colonialism. And um, so you just using that metaphor, just speaking of it makes people very angry. <laughs> and, and, um, and so, I mean, I think Mishanja, you can take over from here because you sort of developed a lot of your recent work, your performance work around this. Before he does, there's a question from the floor. If we may, please, I'm also just watching the time. So Mariki, could you please, uh, you've raised your hand. I didn't see it, but I'm told that you had a hand. Could you uh, speak up, uh, Mariki, please? Um, Unison, please bring Mariki up. Unison, can you bring Mariki up, please? She's coming. Okay. That's been edited. Great. You're muted. Maybe I must just say, I, 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 w I was not prepared to come on screen, so I may not look my best, but um, I just wanted to join in um, uh, saying something about the um, uh, Prof. Pumla's uh, question about uh, the response is um, how, how, how does art um, or creative work help us uh, going forward? And um, I just wanted to sort of uh, put on the table the experience we had recently um, with uh, we, and if I say we, it's studies in historical trauma and transformation, uh, worked with art students um, at um, third year students in visual communication design at Stellenbosch's visual arts department. And we asked the students to, I'll be as short as possible, we asked the students to respond um, in creative ways to, to stories that were in a book about uh, apartheid memories. And the two things in interviews with students, two things um, emerged that I think is important in this regard. The one is that the stories really did move the mostly white students and the stories were mostly of um, uh, black South Africans and their apartheid memories. And 
it really moved the white students, I think, in profound and productive ways. That was the one thing. The second thing is what seems to be important is the time that creative work offer people to work through ways and to enable them to articulate the way that the, emo the to articulate the initial re emotional response. And more than that, that that time uh, enables, uh, in, seem to have enabled the students, we need to understand what exactly happened there better, but it seemed to have enabled the students to articulate their, their emotional response, but also to consider what it means in terms of them changing. What does it mean? So in other words, what does it mean as a transform in a transformative way? That I just wanted to make that contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a, a, a very strong and powerful response of suspicion to us being a change agent at all. This is uh, from Dr. Adi Bayo. Um, is, uh, uh, is, is, he's suspicious of us' ability to change. Of course, you know, art is able to move us, you know, going back to the idea of catharsis. But then, you know, the idea of being moved and actually taking action, those are two different scenarios. And, and I, I absolutely share what you share, you're saying, Adibayo. And it's, it's a question that is, uh, we should continue to engage with. Uh, Mushanja, would you, I think we we'll give you the last word here. Uh, what, what give you, and then, um, uh, uh, Stephanie, the last word we, we have our last session. So over to you, Mushan. Thank you very much. I have so much to say, but I'll try to be as brief as possible. Maybe start with the last question. I'm very suspicious about this division between action and art. Art is action. When I go and perform, I'm not some character. It's me, myself, in that museum doing work. So art is not some, re it's in real life. It's not a show. It's activism, right? It's a protest. It's action. And then on the question of trauma and re-traumatizing, I think we often ask people who work in these areas, we like to romanticize trauma and violence. It's possible to make this work without romanticizing trauma and violence, but it's still easy. We still fall into that trap of romanticizing trauma and violence. That's why I will ask, what is your intention when you, when you do this work? What is your intention? So I come from a country that has been seen multiple colonial projects, that has gone through a genocide in the 20th century. And often people now, when we have to tell these stories, you find many people who want to tell the stories of the Nama and Herero genocide and say, we have to show the skulls because people don't know. And I challenge that and say, so you want to tell me that when we walk around every day in in, 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 in operate in traumatizing architecture, whether we are the oppressed or the, or the oppressor, our architecture, our spatial planning, our cultures, um, we go through some kind of trauma or violence one way or the other, whether we are oppressor or not. So what makes you think that you have to show people those brutal images in order to drive the point home? Who tells you, how do you know that they don't know already? They know, I, that's my point of departure. People know because we've all experienced trauma, not in the same way. And that's why for me, it's more generative to focus on an intentionality that is about care work. And of course, again, care work is very nuanced. Care work is very slippery. I can act and say this is an act of care, but the way it is received, it's something else. It's potentially violent, right? Um, but again, 
I think we've spent more time in trying to romanticize violence and trying to make a point about violence and spend very little time and put very little intentionalities into care work, into the work that tries not to represent violence at all. I mean, it's your artistic right if you wanna represent violence, but there is always that burden of you re-traumatizing the audience or yourself. And I don't find that necessarily uh, uh, generative. And I was just going to say maybe lastly, that how do you then know that this is, tra uh, this is traumatizing or not? You have to ask yourself the question, Generation Z or the millennials have given us this question. They're constantly speaking about triggering. So when you work through and make your artistic choices, or even your uh, uh, intellectual choices, you have to ask, what is triggering? I make this choice. Does that feel like triggering? And that's why I love this idea of empathetic unsettlement. It's the first time I'm hearing about it. So yes, we must be unsettled. We must, but that doesn't mean we have to, we have to um, just show because we, there are better ways. I think I'd like to push us and challenge us and say, there are better ways of doing this work without just showing the obvious because the obvious, which is the violence, is deeply embedded in our lived experience and our everyday already. So we have to, to, to push it further, I think. But well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, Mushanda, you know, you are, you're right to say it's long, you know, but you, we, have to, we have to reduce the conversation because of time. But I have to say one thing about what you just said. It reminds, reminds me of all that scholarship around the photographs after uh, the, the, the end of the world, where all these bodies of Jewish people who were killed by Nazis, you know, were photographed and the bodies piled up all over around these camps. And Germans were forced, and were forced to watch to look to see. But not only them, even you know, subsequent generations, this stuff was published in photographs. There's been exactly the issue that you're raising, whether it is productive. Can someone turn off their, their sounds? Because I'm not sure who it is. Um, I just hope it's not me. But there is this question that you have, uh, you have raised that means around, and we need to explore the, them in this context, in our context. But it reminds me of the debate, which still continues. There are articles and books and articles being published about those infamous photographs or famous photographs um, after the end of World War II, the photographs of the uh, uh, Jewish people killed by the Nazis in the concentration camps. So we continue these debates and we should continue them here as well, you know, whether there's value. And, and the, the, the verdict is not out yet. There are scholars who say, yes, we must. There are others who say, yes, we must, but we must be caring enough not to traumatize. And so it's, it's, it's a debate that it would be interesting how we nurture it in this context uh, uh, of our discussion uh, of the Russian uh, gulags, Soviet gulags and South African apartheid. We have uh, one and a half minutes and we, I give that to, uh, um, to you, Stephanie, to, to give the last word. And then we'll invite uh, Professor Krendel for whom I see is here already. Stephanie, over to you, last word. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's so interesting because, you know, in dealing with uh, um, my own work, it's very personal um, objects. And so uh, in each one of the, the um, homes, it's always uh, attached to a personal story. And so it's about how, uh, if you think about how, what people are willing to share with you, um, it's about their um, agency as well in, in dealing with the trauma that they're willing to share with you. And I think that that's also really interesting in that we're, we're talking about um, art that's shown in, on 
in museums or in art galleries versus art that's accessible to other people. And so it's interesting to bring it back to what we um, surround ourselves with. And I think that's interesting. That's where the agency lies in how much we're willing to, um, to share or to make yeah to share with other people and and I, I find that interesting in all of it is that we we also have a certain amount of agency as artists then in how we interpret to the 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 burden of I don't know if it is but it's it's really interesting for me because I think that I've in my own work been focusing so much on on trying to um, look at these aspirational objects in in a certain environment to that you often miss out on, on these nuances of trauma. So I, I found this a, a really um, stimulating conversation because it, it makes me go back to it and think about all of the narratives that I've been told and how I can look at it again in a very new, <laughs> new light. So I found it in, incredibly interesting. So I want to thank everyone that posed the question and that made me think about uh, um, the work of an artist in a new light. Thanks so much. Yeah. A fabulous, fabulous, fabulous panel. Thank you very much for curating it, Gria. It was just so enlightening and so stimulating, as you say, uh, Stephanie. So wonderful opening up uh, such interesting questions for us. So thank you very much. Um, and, and welcome to all of you, those of you who are just joining us. I can see that some of you are just joining. Uh, we welcome you heartily. And uh, we are now going to turn uh, or give the stage, the virtual stage, uh, to um, uh, our colleague and uh, friend, for me, uh, uh, Professor Kondofer. Now, I have, uh, I'm going to introduce Professor Kondofer just now. And as I uh, edge in that direction, I just want to mention that. I have been in so many conversations and panels, you know, uh, discussion uh, globally with Professor Krondofer that uh, after, after we were encountering us, uh, uh, um, each other at these meetings, we decided that it's time that we, we facilitate our own, you know, co-encountering each other. And we ended up doing some work thinking together and doing some writing together. But for as long as I, even before I met him personally, I knew him through his work on um, the international in, intercultural dialogue groups that he has led in, in Israel, in, in Germany, and especially his book, uh, uh, which was published the same year, on the same year that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established in South Africa, Remembrance and Reconciliation. I had never, up until then, I had never read anything on reconciliation. And for me and, and some of my colleagues, uh, this was a, a very, you know, welcome discovery for us to see a book uh, on reconciliation at a time we're talking of, we were doing it. And of course, I, I, I know, you know, before people say, oh yeah, you know, before you remind me that it didn't happen, that is another issue. We, we have to have, this is why in part we're having this conversation, what went wrong? But he has been leading in this conversation. So Professor Krondofer, it is a wonderful ple pleasure to introduce you and for you to be ending our conversation this afternoon. Uh, he completed his PhD in comparative religious studies at Temple University in Philadelphia. He is the director of the Martin Springer Institute at Northern Arizona University and an endowed professor of religious studies in the Department of Comparative Cultural Studies at Northern Arizona University. His publications include, among others, the book that I already mentioned, Remembrance and Reconciliation, Men and Masculinities, in Christianity and Judaism, male confessions, intimate revelations, and the religious imagination. Now, these texts of his, they, um, they led to a, a, a real interest and in scholarship, interest in the scholarship in this area of uh, masculinities within 
Malaysia Studies. His work has been leading in that department. Uh, then there are two more books that I want to mention. One is Reconciliation in Global Context. And then he's hot off the press, Unsettling Empathy, Working with Groups in Conflict. Professor Krondofer himself has done a lot of uh, significant curatorial work. He created and curated exhibits on the Jewish ghetto in Bedzin, the Berlin Wall, and the art show, Wounded Landscape. I know that recently uh, his work that he curated at Flagstaff with some of his students was brought to South Africa via the uh, Holocaust uh, um, Center, uh, rather the Holocaust, the South African Holocaust Foundation, so that it was displayed in Johannesburg. And he recently spoke at the Holocaust um, uh, Center in Cape Town on this work, among other things that he was discussing. So he himself has done a lot of significant work in this area and including curating work and writing about uh, the aesthetics use of, of the art rather within the Russian context, particularly in relation to uh, responses or memories of or responses to the experiences of uh, the Soviet gulags. Among his awards are the Norton Dodge Award for scholarly and creative achievement. Now, this is very unusual for a scholar who is, uh, in terms of his discipline, comes from um, uh, theology and religious studies, and yet he has such diversity. I mean, it seems to me that this is just a, a, a very good example, a perfect example of what multidisciplinarity and productive interdisciplinarity means. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Krondofer, for you are, you are, you are the, the, the earliest riser among all of us. So we are delighted that you could make it and uh, we welcome you and invite you now to take the stage and the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pumla, if I may call you Pumla rather than by your prof by the title professor. <laughs> we know each other too long for me to say that in such a formal way. Yes, I got up at 3, 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, usually I only do this if I travel. Um, last time I traveled was actually to South Africa, to Johannesburg in March. I was supposed to spend 12 days in South Africa after four days. South Africa closed its borders, United States closed its borders, and ever since, we are all stuck at home. Um, so it's wonderful to have an opportunity to be at least with you um, on Zoom. Um, the title for my, my contribution is All That Is Left, Memory Objects and the Aesthetics of Cruelty. And, and when you come up with these titles, um, you know, six weeks in advance of a conference, you have no idea whether there is any match and whether it fits into the larger context. But astoundingly, it does. After listening to Nancy um, Adler uh, this morning, um, and then um, also to the two artists, or the three artists and, and PhDs, um, there's connection, especially with Stephanie's work, who looked at ordinary objects and how they facilitate certain memories. I think she will find um, uh, connecting points to what I have to say. Um, about one third into my presentation, and I hope you hear me all well, that I'm not too loud or too, too low in my voice. Um, about one third in my presentation, I stop and show a few slides with visual images. I won't comment much on them, but they relate to everything I'm saying. And then I continue and finish with my paper. That's a plan. And thank you for inviting me. Um, about memory objects. Most of us know them. Most of us have them. Some are hidden away in an old shoe box, others prominently displayed in living rooms. They evoke ambivalent feelings. We treat them as quasi-sacred objects to be cherished, or they evoke enough guilt that we cannot bring ourselves to throw them away. I'm talking about memory objects. 
Memory objects have little monetary value. In most cases, they have no aesthetic value either. Nevertheless, we pass them on to the next generation or sometimes donate them to an archive or museum. Memory objects connect us to a past that no longer is. We imbue them with the power to tell a story about ourselves and our community. But in themselves, they are silent. They are silent witnesses about what has been lost. They become alive only because we give them meaning through a narrative act. And the more tragedy is attached to them, the more precious they become. My mother at 92 still has nearly perfect memory. She has already passed on family memory objects to me. And when I visit her in Germany, she reminds me of others still in her possession, like a pair of candlesticks, hand-stitched initials on a napkin, a postcard her mother sent her in January of 1945 from Königsberg, which is now Kaliningrad in Russia. These are among the few personal items she carried in her backpack at the age of 17, when she fled alone by foot and in trains in the winter of 1945 from the advancing Soviet army encircling Kaliningrad. Of her pre-war material life, this is all that is left. Their material presence continued to elicit immediate sorrow in her each time, a sorrow I can witness, but I do not share. Decades later, in the mid-1990s, I journeyed with my father, my German father, to his birthplace in the Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia, then the Czech Republic, today. From there, we traveled onward to Poland, where he had been stationed at age 17 in an anti-aircraft platoon with the German military, about two miles away from a Nazi concentration camp, or I should say a Jewish slave, with Jewish slave labor, a slave labor camp. When we discovered the remnants of the overgrown embankment of his anti-aircraft gun placement in the Polish forest more than 50 years later, he pulled an old brick out of the earth and took it home to Germany. Another kind of memory object, for my father had not talked about his year-long military service next to a Jewish slave labor camp for five decades. All that was left, an old brick, a worthless artifact, perhaps a material anti-aesthetic reminder of the cruelty of war, but for him also a symbolic reconnection to a silenced past. In 1989, ethnographer Andreas Kunz presented a study on the centrality of Erinnerungsobjekte, of memory objects, in German post-war family histories, like, for example, a shabby wooden horsey that was hung every year as an ornament on a Christmas tree, with children intuitively knowing that they shouldn't talk about it and they should not make fun about it. According to Kunz, these ritualized objects did not lead to open family conversations, but remained a haunting presence. He writes, quote, and somewhat ironically, if silence is one of the most exhausting forms of remembering, then such memory objects were the most popular form of narrating the past among post-war German families. The story of post-war German memory objects is complicated, as it would be in all former perpetrator societies, because the next generation becomes somewhat complicit. My relationship to my family memory objects remains highly ambivalent, emotionally, historically, intellectually, for they make me, in Michael Rothberg's terms, an implicated subject. I will return to this at the very end of my presentation. Memory objects become all the more precious when tragedy and loss are attached to them. The cruelty of which memory objects can be silent witnesses is almost always implicit and invisible. 
Nowhere is this more the case than in the aftermath of extremely violent upheavals, like the genocidal assault of Jews during the Nazi occupation of Europe. Scholar Nina Fischer traced the importance of memory objects for the descendants of Holocaust survivors in her 2015 book called Memory Work. Because Holocaust survivors escaped with just their bare lives, the few remaining objects are especially precious. For the most part, Fisher writes, the few memory objects in survivor families are mute and need a narrative. Fisher's own study follows how such objects appear in literary texts of the second generation, always pointing to loss and absence and a wish to reconnect. Another Holocaust scholar, Marianne Hirsch, calls such artifacts testimonial objects. They testify in intimate, personal, and emotional ways to larger events. Though memory objects are usually private and hence illegible to outsiders unless accompanied by a narrative, today these objects have gained importance beyond the family sphere. They have become public objects, and as such they have gained importance beyond the family sphere, and they are charged with some cultural value. They have been added to museum collections or become part of local archives, a clear sign that these material artifacts are now deemed to be of sufficient merit for public preservation. This also explains why stories um, about recently discovered objects relating to the Holocaust, no matter how small or how mundane, can still make headlines in national and international newspapers like a little girl's sweater, a thimble, a spoon, or scraps of paper containing a note or drawing. And now I'm going to share the screen. This is from my family archive. If you look closely, you see Hitler's portrait in the stamp on the right-hand side that puts it into the Nazi time. It's a postcard of my grandmother to her son. This is my father on a photo I did not know exist until I turned uh, almost 40 on an anti-aircraft platoon next to a Jewish slave labor camp. And my father on the right hand side in 1996 when he had was already 70, pulling a brick out of the embankment of this particular anti-aircraft gun. From the sewers of love, now in a museum, a children's jacket, a thimble, a spoon, also in the Auschwitz Museum. and things that I'm going to turn to, things that you find in the Gulag Museum in Moscow. Top left, this brown little piece is a piece of soap, a postcard. I will spend a little bit time on Olga in a moment on her booklet with these kind of paintings, drawings, I should say. Another memory object among Palestinians. And finally, the stamp of the commandant of the Gross Rosen concentration camp. You see him on the left and his use stamp on the right and what it says, Konzentrationslager Gross Rosen, their commandant in German. In the former Soviet Union, it took a long time before Stalin's legacy of terror, forced and forced labor in the Gulag was acknowledged. Today, the State Gulag History Museum in Moscow, which was established in 2001, 
as its own collection of memory objects. They testify to the cruelty of the system through individual stories of resilience, loss, and survival. Like the piece of laundry soap that you just saw that Adam Grossblatt got from his wife, Eugenia Eisenstadt, while both were transported to the Gulag. Or a postcard from Alexandra Chanutsan, a priest who was arrested and sent to exile in Tsolovki. Or Olga Ranitskaya, who was imprisoned in Karlak when she created a small diary from 1941 to 1943 with stick figure drawings. She drew cheerful little adventure stories for her son, Sasha. The palm-sized diary, it's really very small, uh, consists of 115 simple drawings with short titles and various two-line quotations. It was recovered about 70 years later, more or less accidentally. In 2018, it was displayed as in a special exhibit in the Gulag History Museum in Moscow. Olga Ranitskaya, who was born Verbinovich to a Jewish family, was arrested in the Great Purge of 1937. After interrogation, she was a forced laborer for nine years. Her simple stick figure drawings show aspects of life in the Gulag in the 1940s. In one of her drawings, for example, we see a little figure in tears as the coat is taken away. It is titled Sorrow. In another, a spoon and a fork hover over the figure holding a head between her hands in despair. It is titled Distress and refers to day when food had been denied. Ranitskana's diary is intriguing not because of its artistry, but because of what is said and not said of what is depicted or obscured. The cruelty of the camp conditions is not explicitly present, but we intuit it as a constant threat. The little book is a numinous object whose value is moral and psychological, not material. It is imbued with numen, meaning spirit. In the museum world, a numinous object refers to a secular understanding of spirit. In the case of Granitskaya's diary, its luminous quality has to do with the implicit trauma and resilience, but also with the emotional memories that we invest in this surviving artifact today. The scholars Mainz and Glynn observe, quote, the luminosity of an artifact with its intangible and invisible quality is significant because it carries emotional weight. To curate and display difficult knowledge as some museums now understand the educational task is not simply to preserve artifacts and documents, but also to consider strategies that involve an emotional engagement with past injustices and trauma. To display a numinous or testimonial or memory object like Olga's diary is less about new historical information than effective identification. For the um, Russian journalist Zoya Eroshok, the display of the diary is an act of rescuing Vanitskaya's story from oblivion. It is, in her words, a testament to her outliving the system that sought to erase her. The way in which this journalist frames what she calls her obsession with the diary goes far beyond preserving an artifact. Rather, the journalist's response is steeped in political emotions, refracted by all that is left. An artifact once meant solely for private use, namely her son, Sasha. Memory objects remind us that memory does not simply exist, but exists in the ways we frame and convey the past, in the ways we nurture, engage, identify with, or reject events in the past. As the ancient Greeks already knew, ars memoria, the art of memory, and ars oblivionis, the art of forgetting, are interconnected. Both inform our coping mechanisms with the traumatic past. A vital part of the task of acknowledging the harms inflicted and harms endured 
is to engage in emotional memory work and memory objects can help us on this journey. Ranitskaya's diary from the 1940s is personal. Displayed in 2018, it enters into the sphere of cultural memory and public debate. The artistic and material value of this artifact might be contested, but what is important is how it resonates with the public. For the journalist Zoya, the seemingly mundane and private diary is, quote, a form of revenge against Stalin for all of his victims. For this journalist, the invisible but implicit cruelty that forms the background of Ranitskaya's childish stick figure drawings renders this private object political. All that is left, seemingly private memory objects are able to transcend the realm of the personal and attain public merit and recognition. They can also be infused with political significance and get politicized in public discourse. For example, a core memory object for Palestinian families displaced during the 1948 Nakba is, as you have seen in the images before, the house key to their former homes. It is a material reminder of the homes they lost during the establishment of the State of Israel. Though at first an object with practical significance, just in case they were allowed to return to their former homes, but after decades of no return, the key became a symbol of loss, highly treasured and cherished in Palestinian families. Those keys were all that was left. Devoid of any practical use over time, the key transformed also into a potent political Palestinian symbol. From huge sculptures marking an entrance to a refugee camp to a sign of protest during demonstration, during demonstrations. I wish I would know more about the South African context to say anything interesting about the presence and significance of memory objects in post-apartheid South Africa. With some white people still mourning the loss of power after 1994, and Black South Africans mourning the loss of loved ones before 1994, and all the shades of gray in between, I imagine there are widely divergent memory objects that carry opposing meanings in the lives of people today. So I want to end where I started, my relationship to memory objects in a post-war German family. When I started my new position in 2012 as director of the Martin Springer Institute, which was founded by a Holocaust survivor from Poland, I made a strange discovery in the Institute's small storage room. In a shoebox, I found a Nazi stamp. None of the previous Institute directors had paid any attention to it. As a German-born scholar, the object intrigued me immediately. As it turned out, it is the stamp of the SS commander at, of the Gross Rosen concentration camp, one of those brutal camps that oversaw dozens of slave labor camps in Nazi-occupied Poland. And we are here in Flagstaff, Arizona, far removed from anything that happened in Europe. Our founder, Doris Springer Martin, who survived one of the women's labor camps that was under the administration of the Gross Rosen camp, had nothing to do with this object. The Gross Rosen stamp in the shoebox was actually given to us, as far as I can tell, by an unknown dealer from a trading post in Arizona who didn't want to keep them and thought we might be a good place to, to have it. And it took, strangely enough, a German to discover this object in our possession. As mundane as this stamp might be, as a memory object, it is imbued with cruelty. Aesthetically, no more interesting than an ordinary stamp from any post office, it has an immediate emotional affect on those who touch it. 
it is also a historical artifact. And just for full disclosure, I did contact the Cross Rosen Memorial site today and ask them whether they would like to have this object and they declined. On the black market for Nazi paraphernalia, it has a definite monetary value. I use it now for educational purposes with university students. Although it simply is a tool of a bureaucratic machinery, as a memory object, it feels toxic, something with the potential to morally contaminate you when you're holding it in your hands. And as a matter of fact, several of my students who come from Native American backgrounds intuitively refuse to touch this object because for them, it is not only an evil object, it is an evil object and not only symbolically. On the one hand, there are the memory objects that my German family of origins wants to pass on to me. Those nostalgic objects like a napkin with stitched initials that tell a story of flight and loss and personal trauma at the end of World War II, but nothing about the Holocaust. And on the other hand, there's the stamp of the commander of Gross Rosen. These artifacts come alive through different narratives. And I will always be torn between them, between those who in one way or the other were complicit and compliant with the Nazi regime and those who suffered from it. Morally, my perspectives are very clear, but emotionally, I am an implicated subject for we do love and show respect to our families. I expect that some of these troubles relate in their own ways to post-apartheid South Africa today. A final word. Olga Ranitskaya made her small booklet for her son, Sasha. It was meant for him and him alone. But in 1943, while still in the Gulag, she received news that Sasha had died. With no one to pass her diary to, she left it to her campmate which is why we still have it today. In my case, my mother hopes that her memories will be treasured and preserved by passing on a few memory objects from her childhood. One of my flaws is impatience and how difficult it is for me to remember the details of her stories. All that is left sometimes memory objects are elevated to public merit. At other times, they might return to being again a simple material artifact whose once symbolic significance will fall victim to oblivion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bjorn, uh, for this wonderful really wonderful presentation that uh, has so many layers again that um, connect to stories across you know the globe you know when when um, michael rothbeck talks about uh, the multi-dimensional memory I, I i couldn't help but think of that phrase when you were talking about this stamp um, that you found, this Nazi stamp that you found in the room, as you, you are sitting in Arizona and there is such a, a insurmountable, just in terms of distance, distance between us. But just your talking about this, this stamp evoked a visceral feeling in me because of what you are talking about means. And I wonder, what you think about the idea that sometimes these personal stories, the individual stories, and art itself, these become a way of you know, moving or tra tra transforming the personal into the collective, you know, from the public into the, from the private into the public that there's something about these kinds of examples that inform us psychologically now, that often in psychology, 
we often talk about individual experience. These are individual stories. This is the story of the suffering of this such and such a person. And yet, thinking about it multidimensionally, that there's always this possibility that because we are linked to suffering in some way, that these become then the vehicle, if it were, these artworks become a vehicle for making or for transforming the personal into the collective. I wonder what your views are about this. Yes, so a, a memory object within a family is simply that, a memory object that has, doesn't have public significance. And in most cases, these memory objects function because people don't want to tell a story, but want to tell an emotional aspect of their lives and try to convey to someone else, either to themselves as a reminder of what they lost, or to the next generation, the children. Um, um, that um, and as you know, in, in the case of uh, post-war Germany, um, as Kunz has said, you know, these objects were actually not meant to tell a story. They were not meant to verbalize and articulate what it's about, but to implicitly convey what I call the ethos of the family narrative, the, the emotional impact without having to explain yourself. And they're complicated symbols. Um, so in themselves, memory objects are not a working through, but an acting out. Mm -hmm. right. And so what you're asking for is the working through. Because a memory object that is not investigated within a family circle is, is a preservation of memory or an acting out of an unresolved issue. But the working through is the important part, which is when um, someone in the family has the courage to bring into discussion what that object meant to his or her family and to figure out whether you were, imp as I said, in my case, implicated in this. Um, or, or what kind of trauma it might contain or what kind of distorted narratives it might contain that needs a public hearing. Once you put it in a museum, you're already moving towards a kind of working out because you present it. What I found so fascinating about the, um, what Stephanie Conradi said um, a little earlier, that she looks at these, she doesn't call the memory object, but these objects in, in, in family settings and then in her own work, she's using some of that material to create art. That to me is an example of working through um, something that makes something public. And, um, and maybe one other take on this one, if we work with groups in conflict and people have different um, pers perspectives or perceptions of what happened in the past, and I include South Africa here now, um, if, um, there must be people who are willing to um, show to the other side um, cultural intimacies and cultural secrets that are not known to the other side. And memory objects are part of these cultural secrets or these, in this case, family secrets that are protected from the, the perspective of the other, whoever the other is. And to bring them Imagine you bring some of these family objects to a, a conversation between people in conflict over one thing or the other, and that opens a door to um, uh, not only open door to you telling a story, but also to hear what the, uh, how the other people respond emotionally to these objects, because they might find them offensive. Mm -hmm. And so that is how we learn about what is so intimately valuable to us, maybe actually an offense to someone else. Mm -hmm. And that requires the working through the unsettling empathy that I, I'm so fond of bringing into the conversation. Right, right, yeah. And, and then, I mean, it helps also with the idea of reckoning, since we're de dealing here with past that are so fraught with all of this unfinished stuff that these, what you just described now, is, becomes an opportunity for reckoning with that past. Mm -hmm. Uh, a question perhaps that's uh, related to uh, the last point that you are making concerns your father's, con you know, picking up of the brick. Nancy wants to know, could you say something more about the, the potential political significance of that brick, you know, uh, for your father? And, and I, I would say perhaps just period the political significance of the brick 
might what might it be for your father and press moving beyond your father um, there's a second question that I think is connected so I will I will give you this to you as a pair so as artists working with very personal histories how do you go about decentralizing the access to your work and bringing it to the people so those are the two, two, two questions for you, Bjorn. The second one is from Susie Shefeni. Okay. Um, I, I, I hope I can do justice and answer because often questions come out of a particular context which I may not fully understand, but let me try and then we can always clarify. So just with the break, um, I have to say three centers and in terms of context of how we even got to the place back in Poland where we find his old embankment of his aircraft platoon next to the Jewish slave labor camp. Um, it only happened because I happened to know a survivor story about this particular camp. It's a very unknown camp. It's, its name is Blechhammer. Most people have no idea that it existed, but I knew the name and my father in a conversation accidentally mentioned that term that he was stationed in Blechhammer. That is only why we discovered or why I discovered that part of his history. So it was a silenced history, a silenced hist history that he wasn't willing to um, confront himself with until I took him back on the journey to Poland. Um, he was retired by then. He was a school teacher. Um, so needless to say, he never taught anything about this during his professional years as a teacher, as an educator. So the, is there a political significance to the brick? Yes and no. Of course, it's completely personal. It was for him to reconnect to something that was really um, suppressed in his memory, was not part of our family law, was not part of our family conversation. But he promised me also that he would bring this brick back to Germany and back to the former comrades that were with him in this embankment in 1943, 1944, I didn't even know he was meeting them almost every year. That was silence. I had no idea when I was growing up that he had these meetings. So the political significance is he wanted to bring it back and start a conversation with the people who meet but never talk about it. They meet and drink. They don't talk about this thing. Um, he promised he would bring this up after he returned. And then in the end, he never brought it up with them. The whole, I mean, didn't bring the brick to them, didn't bring the story, the story and the brick to them. So the political significance, even though it's very private and personal, is that it contributed to the pro prolonging the silence in that generation. So that is to one. Um, I'm not 100% sure I understand the second question completely. So I don't know. I don't want to go in a completely yes, wrong yes, direction yes, there. In full, because I clipped it and uh, uh, took from it something that I thought would connect well, but obviously that didn't work. So anyway, Susie uh, says, what we experience with arts is that it is often inaccessible to the general person seeing that it is often kept in museums and galleries. Then the last part is as artists working with personal histories, how do you decentralize the access to your work and bringing it to the people? Right, so, you know, I'm, well, it's, it's, a, it's always a tough question for anything we do, whether we are a scholar, historian, an artist, um, we try to reach as many people as we can, and then we are constricted by how society organizes uh, ways of discourse and ways of dissemination. Um, yes, artists are in galleries, artists are displayed in museums, but I think there are enough artists, especially performance artists, as we saw earlier this morning, who actually can directly go to people or to communities. But even then, how do we know that not a self-select audience comes and, and, and attends. It, it's just ultimately a not solvable problem. Um, but there, you know, there are uh, interesting um, movements among the art and education world to really do uh, more grassroots-based performances, more grassroots-based um, um, outreach to people. Certainly memory objects would be a way to bring people in that would never go to 
they would never go to a museum. But then, of course, you have, again, a self-select group of people interested in bringing memory objects to conversation. Um, I trust that, as, that there need to be on many levels, many different um, activities and opportunities and offers. Um, and that is the best we can do. Thank it has you. to be multi-layered, you know. Yeah. There is a, 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 I would like to give Adibayo. Adibayo has been coordinating the organizing, as you know, you've heard from him. We've been coordinating um, the preparation of this. And so I just want to invite Adibayo. He's got a question, but he posted it in the chat session. Adibayo, would you like to come up and, and uh, speak with Dion, with Dion directly? And this, is, this will be the last question. And then we'll invite Melike, Dr. Malika Furi to get ready for the final words. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. And yeah, uh, um, and thank you so much, Professor Bion, for that fascinating talk. Um, I've also read your work before, even before now, so it's the first time meeting you. Um, yeah, I, I guess I was just struck by the phrase you used at the beginning of your talk when you mentioned one of the objects being an anti aesthetic reminder. And I found that really um, interesting because, um, you know, you know, the word aesthetics itself, if you go back to its philosophical roots, it um, speaks to, you know, beauty and, and um, yeah, the beauty and the pleasure in appreciating art. So, so I was wondering then how to think about aesthetics with you know, on the same juxtapose aesthetics with um, um, uh, uh, traumatic memory objects. So, so I was wondering then if you could, um, because because there is really nothing beautiful about um, trauma, right? And so then, if you could just expatiate on um, what you meant by anti aesthetic. Of course, I'm aware that you know post postmodernist thinkers have actually used that phrase a lot. Of time, but I, I just want to hear more about about that. Maybe we should rather think of anti aesthetic um, of cruelty uh, rather than aesthetics of cruelty. I don't know. So yeah. So I, I used the phrase to um, to characterize that that brick that has no artistic aesthetic monetary any value. To, to, to say maybe it's an anti-aesthetic reminder of the cruelty of war, um, even though it doesn't directly even address the war, but it helped the war machinery to function. But you know, now that you ask me the question, if you think about the soap uh, that I showed that was passed on between two couples on the way to, to one couple on the way to the gulag, that piece of soap we would throw away under normal circumstances. You put it in a display case, um, with a photo of the person, as you maybe briefly saw and maybe remember it, it suddenly takes on this numinous aesthetic quality. I mean, almost looks beautiful, even though we know it's totally mundane, but within the context, it, it, it has a fascination for us to actually look at this. Um, the same possibly for the key, the same... Um, yeah, probably for all the objects that I mentioned, um, they are um, by the standards of aesthetic, uh, a certain kind of beauty, so to speak, or a conscious beauty that we want to give or conscious expression want to give an ob object, they fail, but we invest something in them that gets our attention. So I don't know, it, it, is, it feels to me like, like more like a productive tension than, than a judgment call. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Being it's been a productive tension because, like, the object itself is aesthetically, you know, beautiful. It's you know stunning. It attracts attention. But the kind of memory that it brings, there is nothing beautiful about it. And that's what I am trying to reconcile. That you know, you know, something beautiful can point to something really ugly. You know, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dion. Uh, this is a wonderful way of ending our day today uh, and of starting your morning, I hope, for you.
So I made a, a, um, a, a wrong call there when I said Meliki is going to give the closing, closing remarks, but you actually are our closing remarks. And so we thank you. We thank the panel just before you and uh, everyone who spoke uh, today, starting with uh, Katya and, and Nancy Adler. So thank you so very much. So, and thank you to the audience. We, um, we, uh, uh, we exist because you attend these events. So please come back tomorrow morning. We have a keynote opening address by uh, Sheena O'Connor, and we have a wonderful panel lineup tomorrow uh, that you, you, you absolutely have to attend. Uh, Anna Subarova, our colleague from Russia, Andrea Gulota from the UK, Fuldosi Dogi, who is one of our own. So please do come back and register for the last session, session three. Leon, again, thank you so much. Uh, all panelists, please come back. There's a link that uh, you would have been sent by now just for our uh, reflection and, um, and uh, uh, feedback session at the end of this. Thank you very, very much to everyone. Um, thank you. Before I absolutely close, I have to again acknowledge our co-conspirators on this technological uh, new life of ours, um, Lydia Dupesi, um, seen already uh, on, on screen here, Adibayo uh, Sakuru, and most importantly, behind the scenes, Unison, uh, who is, has been the person who is managing the technical aspects of this. Now, thank you very much to all of you. Landy Mayring in absentia, thank you very much. And uh, looking very much forward to seeing everybody again tomorrow. Thank you, Bjorn. Bye. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third and final session that forms part of our colloquium on the aesthetics of cruelty representations of violence and dehumanization in Russia and South Africa. So I have the pleasure to chair this first session and our keynote speaker for today. Um, my name is Malika Furi. I'm a senior researcher in studies in historical trauma and transformation. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our student, stud students who's attending today, various of our colleagues, students um, from Russia and also from the Netherlands are attending today. And I'd like to encourage you and also the other attendees to make use of the Q&A window in your um, Zooms, um, within your Zoom window to, to post your questions. It will be um, 15 minutes following the keynote talk to, um, to answer those questions. So I'm going to introduce um, our keynote now, Professor Sheena O'Connell. She will be speaking about um, what might we become, understanding catastrophe from slavery to post-apartheid. Professor O'Connell. O'Connell is professor and an African studies scholar at the University of Pretoria. Her research focus falls within three areas, that of memory studies, creative studies, and restorative justice in post-colonial and post-apartheid South Africa. Her co-edited book, Hanging on a Wire, won the 2018 National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences Award for the best nonfiction edited volume and a monograph on forced removals in Cape Town and impossible return Cape Town's forced removals continues to garner broad recommendations. She has curated numerous exhibitions and directed and produced eight film documentaries that emerge out of her commitment to research that is focused on trauma, memory, and belonging in post-apartheid South Africa. Professor Sheena, um, we are really looking forward to your talk and I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Professor Faree. Um, clearly I have big shoes to fill um, with the illustrious panel um, that have come before and will come after me. Let me just share this. Mm -hmm. 
Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Pumla Gabodo Madikazela and the extraordinary team for inviting me, as well as to commend you all on this endeavor. When a bucket of feces was thrown at a prominently placed statue of Cecil John Rhodes of the University of Cape Town campus on 3rd of March, 2015, it set in motion a chain of events with far reaching consequences for higher education, not only in South Africa, but also more broadly. The subsequent student-led social movement, Rhodes Must Fall, raised questions around the legacies of colonialism, the meaning of symbols and artifacts in the institutional culture of the university, in the curriculum, and in contemporary management trends and directions. Reorganizing as the national student movement, Fees Must Fall, protesters closed university campuses around the country, demanding the provision of free countrywide tertiary education. While Rhodes Must Fall sought to interrogate and address the impact of Rhodes's colonial heritage on the South African university and its curriculum, culture and ethos, the campaign neglected another early historical trauma making up a further layer, namely that of slavery in the Cape, reaching back to the first colonial encounters and enduring for roughly 200 years. While Rhodes Must Fall interrogated the ongoing impact of colonialism on the university from the 1890s onwards, it failed to consider the effects of an equally important, deeper and complex layer of historical entanglement, namely slavery. The history of slavery and colonization in South Africa has largely been ignored, perhaps in some um, academic circles, in favor of the more dominant narrative of apartheid. However, given that the Cape was colonized two centuries before the rest of South Africa, the importance of this legacy and its impact on social and economic conditions is fundamental to understanding South Africa today. The concept of race and racial difference has been used to justify slavery and the denial of rights and freedoms to people for centuries. Racial slavery originated during the Middle Ages and was about the degradation of the human being and as a system of property in the person. It represented the ultimate form of domination. By the 18th century, the curse of dark skin and slavery was synonymous and played a fundamental role in the justification of slavery in the British Empire and the New World. This close identification of slavery with the skin color laid the foundation for ideas of white supremacy and would later be institutionalized in the American South as segregation and in apartheid and in South Africa as apartheid. The forceful removal of over 12 million Africans to the Americas was one part of the trade in human bodies. Another was that of those who were shipped in an Indian Ocean trade, slave trade to the Cape. From its inception, the Cape Colony was a slave colony, violently established on the backs of renamed slaves and who would be found in kitchens to vineyards. In 1652, colonial administrator of the Verenigte Oost Indische Company, the VOC, Jan van Riebeck, dropped anchor at the Cape to establish a refreshment station in the Cape of Good Hope with 100 men and eight women. Soon thereafter, in 1653, the first known slave, Abraham of Batavia, a stowaway, arrived in the Cape. The Dutch were active participants in both the Atlantic and Indian Ocean slave trades. For brief spells during the 17th century, they dominated the Atlantic slave trade and were at the center of the most expense, expensive trade in the history of Southeast Asia. The VOC was a sovereign body which acted independently of the Dutch government, although its headquarters were in the Netherlands. They were granted a monopoly over trade in the East Indies, where they enslaved over half of the population of Batavia and protected the monopoly with brute force, while painting slavery as a work of compassion. Racial slavery was an economic, legal, political, and cultural exercise that was based on the refusal to see, uh, to see Blacks as humans. The British declared the slavery illegal in 1808, and abolished slavery in all their colonies in 1834. Slaves at the Cape, however, were forced to serve an apprenticeship until 1838. The Masters and Servants Ordinance of 1841 outlined how to accommodate ex-slaves and former free blacks, allowing employers to use certain disciplinary measures to control their behavior. This law importantly was only abolished in South Africa in 1974. These conflicts and laws are directly reflected in the implementation of apartheid uh, in 1948. Beyond this, author and academic Khabiba Badarun 
observes that, and I quote, slavery generated foundational notions of race and sex in South Africa that have largely been forgotten through the sustained system of propaganda that portrayed slavery as mild and benign, end quote. As it's slavery was a cent central, sl slavery was a central element of Dutch colonial conquest and part of the emergence of Afrikaner political, religious and social idea ideas. Although both the British and the Dutch occupied the Cape during this time and were equally responsible for the continu continuation of slavery until it was abolished in 1834. Although of course abolition meant little to nothing for countless slaves. They had to endure a period of apprenticeship and nowhere to go and had few possessions, if any. The dependency thus created served to tie many of the previously enslaved to their masters. Um, and the refuge, the refuge offered to them by mission stations is thought to have ensured a close and steady supply of compliable workers to the surrounding farms at which they were generally forced to continue working at. Just over 200 years later, legislated apartheid came into being with many of the apartheid laws, such as the past laws and the Group Areas Act having their roots in le legislation that governed slaves. Racial prejudice and ethnic division laid the foundation for apartheid in South Africa and a climate of violence and the de devaluation of the labor of domestic workers and farm laborers. For most of the 180 years that slavery existed at the Cape, slaves far outnumbered the settlers. Excessive force and punishment was used to control slaves who were subjected to regu regulations such as the size of gatherings, and the control of their movements by carrying passes, a, pr a practice that resurfaced in apartheid legislation. Importantly, given the high rate of GBV in our country, slave women were routinely subjected to brutal sexual assault. But throughout the period of slavery, not one male, slave or freed, white or black, was convicted for the rape of a slave woman. In 1807, through the 1807 Act, Britain banned the slave trade, but it took almost 20 years to abolish the trade in slaves. The production of wheat and wine in the Cape Colony had trebled by the 1820s. Slaves became more expensive and had to work harder. There was little support at the Cape for the abolition of slavery and any measures towards amelioration and emancipation were violently and emotionally opposed by slave owners. The attempt of the British to introduce punishment record books at the Cape led to the Stellenbosch riot among slave owners in 1831, which lasted for five days. There can be no question that slavery fundamentally shaped South Africa from its earliest days and continued to do so along the continuum of con colonialism and apartheid. The legacy of slavery continues to influence our perspectives today and is prevalent in the prevailing attitudes towards labor provided by those who are black evidence in the mining, viticulture, and domestic labor industries. It is evidence in the surnames that are plentiful on the Cape Flats, an area understood to be where black and colored people live, such as December, September, and February, where their forebears were named according to the month in which they arrived in the Cape. For those who care to look, it is easy to see the imprint of slavery in the Western Cape. It is evident in the landscape, in ways of life, and utterly apparent in cultural practices, practices such as music, dance, and food. It is further illuminated in the slave church, which was built between 1802 and 1804, and is the first official slave church in South Africa. Now a museum in Long Street in Cape Town, it was predominantly used as a space to educate slaves and those identified as non-Christians in the Cape. In 1802, around 280 slaves were taught literacy and religion in this building. The slaves who belonged to the, uh, the Dutch East India Company mostly gained access to the church and went on to be baptized and confirmed, making them full members of the congregation um, in a perverted parental fashion um, as a daughter church of the mother church, the Dutch Reformed Church. Due to race-based evictions, this church in the city center closed its doors in, 18, in 1975 and found its new home in the anti-apartheid struggle site of Valha on the Cape Flats on the far flung outskirts of the city center. This church was not only crucial in the drafting of the Balha Confession, the theological confrontation against apartheid, but served as a mobilizing force for the anti-apartheid struggle by, young, by old and young on the Cape Flats. There's never really been any real recognition of the enormous contribution 
that young people had made to the, to the anti apartheid struggle. It was with this in mind that I made the film, The Weinberg Seven in 2015. Drawn to this project as a new one of the seven, Julian Stubbs, with whom I shared an aunt. I was a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, starting this project at the same time as student protests were shutting down the university. I was disturbed that when I spoke about key events in South Africa, such as Soweto 1976, few students had any real inkling as to what I was talking about. Not one had heard of the Weinberg Seven. It is ironic that many of these students would embark on protest action that would sweep the South African tertiary education landscape, doing so in the tradition of protests of slave rebellion and the anti-apartheid struggle, as well as doing so in the, the shadow cast not only by Cecil John Rhodes, by events centuries early, earlier. It was in challenging this legacy of racial oppression that a group of high school teenagers from colored su suburbs found themselves being thrown into a police van in 1985, a moment that would come to define their lives, that of their families and the subsequent silencing of their contribution to, to democracy. 15 October 1995 was a pivotal day in Cape Town. Athlone, a colored area established as a result of Group Areas Act, Became a, became a gathering place for anti-party protests, particularly by students. On this day, members of the apartheid security forces shot and killed three young people who were part of anti-government demonstrations. On the day of the incident, security and railway police worked together to crush a gathering of youth who were protesting. This incident became known as the Trojan Horse Massacre. A South African railway truck was loaded with crates close to the edges and all around the back and drove down the middle of Thornton Road with armed police hidden behind the crates. Then the armed police, hiding, hiding, sprang up and opened fire, killing three young people, Jonathan Clarkson, age 21, Sean Mahmoud, age 15, Miranda, and Michael Miranda, aged 11, and injuring scores of others. What is less known is that at almost the same time, about 25 kilometers away, seven high school students were arrested during student protests in Weinberg and were charged and convicted of public violence for which they served prison terms of between one to two years. The highly publicized trial drew attention to the thousands of students and youth sentenced to prison terms for public violence, effectively criminalizing protest act activity. Having tipped off about unfolding events in Athlone, most journalists rushed to that scene, leaving very few covering what was happening in, in Wyoming at the same time. In the period of the 70s and 80s, Students as young as 13 and 14 were active particip participants in the fight to end racial domination, with many being politicized at home and at schools. Importantly, many were members of COSAS, the Congress of South African Students, an anti-apartheid student organization established in 79 in the wake of the June 16 uprisings. The, the formation of COSAS was under the stewardship of President Oliver Tambell, who was then in exile. It was only when I realized whilst doing research on the Weinberg Seven, that very little had been doc documented about them, a brief account in the TRC records. But other than that, the experiences had vanished into thin air. I propose that understanding the unfolding of events that gave rise to the Weinberg Seven involves taking a deep time perspective on the interlinked legacies of the historical catastrophe of slavery, colonialism and apartheid as a means to understand the far reaching and complex effects. On first inspection, it may seem that what was to happen to Venetia de Klerk, D. Dix, Ishan Amley, Nasir Masut, Shoki Inus, Julian Stubbs and Wayne Jadan has scant, if any, connection to the arrival of the Dutch to Cape Shores in 1652. However, by, by seeking to understand what slavery did to shape South Africa Day, we can begin to shed light on the far reaching tentacles of a past the deemed who is understood as human and who is not. It was in challenging this legacy of inhumanity that a group of teenagers found themselves being thrown into that police van, a moment that would come to define their lives, that of their families, and the subsequent silencing of their contribution to democracy. The writing of South Africa's history is a complex exercise. As I found when I embarked on the making of the Weinberg Seven, there's a paucity of narratives of ordinary students involved in the anti-apartheid struggle. Their contributions are eclipsed by that of the struggle heroes who dominate the narrative of freedom. Little, if any work has been done to not only document the experiences of thousands of young people 
and even less has been done in understanding the psychological and intergenerational trauma of men and women who are now in the late 40s and 50s. They alone are having to contend with traumatic memories of being rounded up and being long trials and being incarcerated in maximum security cells, jostling for safety in overcrowded and lice infected cells with hardened criminals. It is their families who said to me, we still do not know what happened to them there. In 2015, I managed to get hold of all of the Weinberg Seven. All but two lived in Cape Town. I brought five of them together at an, an, an hotel in, at an hotel in Constantia. I may as well not have been there. Indeed, in reflection, I should not have been there. An intruder into a group who had last seen together on the day and who'd last been together on the day they entered prison. They were ebullient, speaking over each other, trying to cram 30 years into a dinner conversation that was scripted by one event, being thrown into the back of a yellow police van. I did not film this get together believing that a camera would do more harm than good. I acknowledge that I was completely ill-prepared for the weight of the past in that room. A group of middle-aged adults who shared a common experience that I could not understand. The days that ensued unfolded a complex mix of grief, anger, rage, and resentment. They identified as the Weinberg Seven, but each of their lives had careered off on completely different, and in some cases, devastating paths. Shoki Enos, um, pictured here in the middle. The youngest of the group wasn't there, a diagnosed schizophren schizophrenic in the care of his family who felt ho hopeless and hamstrung. Four of the group still, ha still had and have their criminal records, which has significantly impacted life choices and work opportunities. It was difficult to gauge the emotions in the restaurant when they discussed the day they were released, leaving one of the seven, Wayne Jordan, behind to serve an additional year. They remembered details such as prison garb, lice, rodents, and weight loss, but anything further, deeper, was shrouded in lowered gazes and hunched shoulders. There was an awkward silence gesturing towards a schism when the subject of criminal records came up, as only three had theirs expunged following the, the decision to speak at the TRC, thus serve, serving to divide the group. I felt that they were both defined by the experiences and limited by it. They were abandoned by a democratic South Africa, which was punch drunk by the fraud and rhetoric of the Rainbow Nation and everything it entailed. The country, in its haste to move on, relegated the experiences to a few paragraphs in the TRC records. As one member pointed out to me, they were forgotten. No one was there to hold the frame threads when they were released. There was no fanfare, nor the flashlights of media coverage. There was not a single offer of post-traumatic counseling or an attempt to understand what went on in those prison cells. When I left them and others, when I speak to them and other student activists now, it is clear that the incarc incarceration has, less, has left deep wounds that refuse to heal. I spoke to their families and I admit to being ill-prepared for what I heard and saw. There was nothing I could offer that didn't seem meaningless collapsing in tears along with them, listening to their, their loss and their guilt that they could not protect their children. I imagine though that this is echoed in thousands of homes across the country, people picking up the pieces of a past that they didn't script and that began when a, a boat sailed into Cape, Cape Town in 1652 and charted a course of untold tragedies. What is to become of this tragedy and what will we become if we continue the silences and omissions that fail to address this wrong. I suggest that the lessons of 76 and 85 have not yet been learned, evidenced by the accounts of students caught up in the 2015 student protest, um, Roses for and Fisas for, with many of them um, left traumatized. It is by returning to the slave church in Baha, bolstered by welcoming faces, that strengthens my resolve to continue the project of freedom. In this space, I'm resolute uh, that South Africa has unfinished business, that remembering on its own cannot offer redemption or freedom. In as much that listening to and documenting these painful accounts is important, there is work to be done to address the pervasive trauma that seeps into every fabric of South Africa. If we are to live up to the promise of 1994, then it is incumbent on those of us who are committed to this project to hold the past to account. We have to grapple with what is just in South Africa 
and tease apart the entangled lines between justice, democracy, and freedom. As Anthony Bokes comments, justice is different from, from repair, close quote. If we think only of injury, then the task becomes too vast. Justice opens another door beyond repair, inviting the transformation of the lives that are injured. Crucially, this must include rethinking what it means to be fully human. The Weinberg Seven demands that we find forms of history and representation that open us to the full force of the challenges of the past. South Africa needs to settle the long overdue debt we owe to the teenagers of the anti-apartheid struggle who fought for the liberatory moment of April 27, 1994. Moreover, justice has to attend to the trauma left in the wake of slavery an account of the slaves looked up to the night sky of 1 December 1834 and imagined what it'd like to one day be truly free. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor O'Connell, for this provocative con um, talk that you gave, this provocative presentation, and for so eloquently weaving the links for history for us back to back to slavery and you know how it continues to unfold in in our present lives um i remember when i first visited the slave lodge a few years ago how how struck i was by how this is as you say silenced from our worldview how it's so embedded in in everything that that we do and in, in so much of of, of um people in South Africa's lives and how little we actually acknowledge that and how little our children are educated about this history. Um, so I want to open the floor now for questions. Um, Professor Adler has, has posted a question. She says, thank you very much for this eloquent talk. Do you have any idea why the others in the Weinberg 7 did not approach the TRC? Um, I, obviously I raised this and for, well, Shoki Inus was by that time, um, well, he was displaying um, signs of emotional and mental um, trauma. And the others just said that, that they had had enough, that they wanted to put, put it behind them. And they just didn't feel able to revisit that, that, that past, um, which is why they didn't go. Um, but as I said, it, 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 is, it has caused a division within the group. Uh, because some lives have been able to live, be lived in ways that others have not. Mm. I think while we are um, going to see if, if one or two of the um, participants want to come online and ask their questions in person, um, I can perhaps ask you how, um, how do you think we can start to even think about addressing these omissions um, in terms of education, but also in terms of, of justice? Um, I'm sure you spent a lot of time thinking about that already. I, 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 this speaks directly to your conference. Um, I think it's it's really the creative project is crucial in, in drawing these narratives out. So often we in the academy, we we write easily and we publish books. That's really not available to, to folk for whom this really has a direct influence or shaping the, their daily lives. So I think the creative, in, the, the creative experience um, or endeavor, which is not a just not merely an, a project in aesthetics, it is it is fundamental to finding new ways of unearthing and revealing these experiences. And to this, I'm particularly drawn to the work um, that surrounds visual culture and photographs and and objects that allows for difficult narratives to be revealed in in easier ways. Um, and I think it's incumbent on, on on us, as I said, who were working in this, to, to seek out those ordinary narratives that it's really not that difficult to find. Um, you, you know, one doesn't have to spend weeks and months in archives. One just literally has to look around and venture out into places like the Cape Flats and start speaking to ordinary people. And, and it's, it's through entry points, something ostensibly as simple as asking them about food practices that we begin to understand, we are, we are able to put together stories that have uh, meaning for, for us as academics, but also enlightens um, many people on the Cape Flats as to their complex history. I'm, I'm always astonished that when I work in, in areas that the youth have very little idea of why they are there. They, they seem to be stuck in these places with, 
um, having this idea that if you only worked harder, you'd be able to pull yourself and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. So you'll be able to get ahead when in fact it doesn't work like that. The entire system is stacked against it. So we need to do these kinds of quantitative and qualitative um, exercises to understand the economic cost of what it means to be deemed black and colored, the economic cost of what it means to being kicked out and having to live live um, on in places that are absolutely inhospitable, inhospitable, and then do the important qualitative and creative work that reveals these narratives and puts it in a way that doesn't neatly sit with, within a historical kind of narrative, but puts it in the present. So that history, the writing of history becomes a history in the present. And we do so in creative ways. Yeah. Sorry, I carry on a bit too long there. No, 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 it's wonderful. It's it's really wonderful to listen to you. Thank you for that, for that answer and um, for that perspective. So one of our panelists, um, Andrea um, Gelotta, um, raised his hand. So Andrea, would you like to um, ask your, your question personally? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Professor O'Connor, for such a such an interesting talk. I have to admit, I didn't know many of the things that you spoke about. So for me, it was truly, truly enlightening. Um, towards the end of your talk, you spoke about the um, um, justice. And that made me think of something that was raised by, uh, by Anne Applebaum towards her, the end of a book on the Gulag, um, where she says that the fact that, that Russia didn't have a proper trial, uh, a Nuremberg sort of moment where it was stated who were the perpetrators, who were the victims, and it was a clear indication of guilt has had a, a sort of a, a, a rolling ball effect, let's say, on the memory of the Gulag. And actually, if you see what happens today, where you, uh, Memorial is publishing the names of the perpetrators, and this is raising a furore, the people that do not want to see these things, um, and, and how this is impacting somehow the memory of the Gulag. Um, it, it, it may actually make sense that what Applebaum says uh, is, is absolutely correct. The other thing that I was thinking about was how the peculiarity of the system of the gulag um, was uh, such that people somehow had to in a way take part into the system ludmila litska said that, that the history of the uh, russian state is that the individual is always put in the position of being an accomplice to uh, the repression i wonder how much of this relates to the south african case because i found that some of the things that you spoke about somehow have um, a, a correspondence but i wanted to hear your opinion about this. Thank you very much. Um, the TRC, I'm sure you all um, are familiar with it, had a very important mandate um, that dealt with gross, and gross human rights violations. But obviously the TRC wasn't, the, the ambit wasn't large enough to deal with all of the sins and tragedies and, and violences of the apartheid regime. But it, it was expected that South Africa would carry those important conversations forward, um, especially around things like forced removals um, that affects probably about three quarters of the South African population at the moment um, in all sorts of ways. And I remember watching the TRC on TV and it came you know, shortly after that, the soap operas, Bold and Beautiful and Days of Our Lives would come on. And there was always this kind of disjuncture with it. And I think where we're sitting right now, um, South Africa that's beset by all kinds of fault lines, that's, that's being exposed on a daily basis. We are, we are coming to pay the price of not fully um, exploring and giving voice to or year, listening to um, the other violations of the apartheid state, uh, especially that of the question of land and belonging. Um, so the question of land has dominated the South African landscape for the past couple of years. Our restitution program is in disarray. Um, and of course, it feeds into larger questions of who belongs and who doesn't, who is black enough and who isn't, and who should get and who shouldn't get. And that that careers off in all different kind, ugly kind of, way, of ways. So I, I'm the first firm belief that we should have and we should revisit this, um, that we have to have some kind of commission or some kind of endeavor that is that is pushed by government and supportive by civil society that addresses this, because I don't think we have the luxury of another 25, 26 years um, to, see it, to see it unfold. I think this is the, 
this is the only time that we have. And the pandemic has raised this in, in cruel ways. It has raised the inequalities that, it, that is based on centuries old of some who had and some who hadn't. So I have for the last couple of years been pushing for something like that, not only to attend to the economic costs of what it meant to be deemed black in, in apartheid, but also the social um, and emotional and traumatic costs that people who are black, and I say black and colored, um, or anybody who's not white, continue to pay on a daily basis. It's, it simply isn't right, and it certainly isn't fair or just. Thank you very much, um, Professor O'Connell. So um, we want to um, introduce another participant. Um, her name is, let me just see, Daniela. Um, Daniela will um, ask you her question to you herself. So Daniela, if, if you are live, you're welcome to turn your video on and, <laughs> and ask your question. Um, if we can maybe give Daniela a moment. Um, in the meantime, uh, Professor Pumla uh, Gaborda Marekizela also um, wants to ask a question. So, so Pumla, could you maybe come on to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, I need help with, uh, you can hear my voice, but I now can't, I'm, what's the word? I can't de-invisibilize myself. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you can hear you can hear me um thank you so much shina really uh, for the for the powerful presentation and raising up all these issues that are not articulated in public and you're right you know there isn't sufficient um reflection on on the question of what happens what happened after the trc what is left you know as your title says what is left uh, is the unfinished business and the, the, the arts that you do so beautifully in your work and engage with communities where you work. I mean, you work almost in partnership with the communities of people where there are these histories of, of slavery in, in such productive ways that you have produced a book from it, your films that you have produced on questions of land um, and, 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 and all of these complexities around apartheid and, and its legacy. What have you, I mean, you've been very much in the cold face uh, of all the people I know who have engaged creatively with this work. You've been in the, in the, in, in the, actually in the heart of it. What do you see? What are people telling you about the significance of the creative work that you, 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 you have used to engage with this history. What are people saying? Because for us, that really is where the learning is. What are the response, what are the people saying about the important work that you are doing, the creative work that you have done uh, uh, and bringing it into, into public debate? What, the victims themselves or this, the, the generations of victims themselves can you can you enlighten us? What are the conversation and what are the responses to this very important work that you're doing? That, thank you. That's such an important question. Um, and I need to up, be upfront about this. I wasn't trained to do this. Um, I wasn't trained. I, I think I only did Psych 101 when I dropped it in second year um, to understand the business of working with people who have been traumatized. Um, so I collapse along with them. It, it, it is difficult work. It, it, and it, it visits me in years, years after the event. But I get absolute solace um, and joy when they say to me, we feel, we feel as if a load has been, is, has been lifted. Um, with, with regard to my, my, my work on force removals, there's, there's comments such as, even though we know we won't get our house or our land back, our story is there. Somebody has listened and somebody will hear and somebody will read. And I think this is the important work, even though a film that I make may only be 26 minutes, it's those hours of conversations that I have in people's homes 
um, where I always start off by telling them who I, I am. Um, this has to be an exchange. It has to be dialogic in every sense because I can't go in there and just grab what I want and, and, and leave. So these are kind of conversations and relationships that um, precede the research and carries on way after things have, have been published or, or premed and so forth. And I think what all of them articulate is that an importance for the youth, for their children and their grandchildren to know this. I'm astonished as to how few of them are able to speak to their kids and grandkids about these events. There seems to be on the part of men, a kind of shame that they were unable to protect their children. Um, women who have had to carry on in single, um, as, as single women, because what apartheid did and what the group areas act did was to emasculate men who could not provide and look after their, their, their families. And particularly in the Cape Flats, um, the number of divorces shot up in, enormously once people were relocated there. So I think it is important for, for those of us in creative, you know, we are able to have entry points into difficult conversations far easier, I think, than somebody who is a strict social scientist who will come across, you know, with surveys and so forth. We are able to use wonderful devices. And I think we approach this work differently um, because we're able to look at it from all angles. But as I say, it's not for the faint-hearted. It, it leaves its scars. And I think it's incumbent on universities to start looking at this um, and to support both researchers and the communities in which we work in a, in a far more uh, substantial way. But otherwise, for those communities, I've, I've been really lucky. Um, I, I, I also work really closely with the Clothing and Textile Workers Union of the Western Cape. So these are predominantly women in it. And um, year long, a couple of years of, of projects on, on women in labor. And this, the, the union said to me um, that my film, a little tiny film, has done more to highlight the plight of women uh, in the Western Cape than any of the media campaigns or any of the, the you know, the other campaigns have tried to do. So, for, you know, so many people will, will not creative endeavor. They'll say, well, it's a self-indulgent exercise. And so I think, well, we are able to get closer and closer to the nub of what's at stake in ways that do justice to the traumas. But can I just say one follow-up, uh, Medica, please? Uh, Sheena, you know, the your last point about how these, uh, these kinds of projects do justice. You remind me of a colleague of ours uh, in, in, in Australia who works in South Africa, uh, Andrea Durbach, who does work on uh, the arts as reparation. And so now you are, you are introducing, you mentioning the word just, it does justice. Are there, can you say something about perhaps the limitations of this work? And, then, and, then, and this, I think you're absolutely right to say that when narratives or people's stories are being witnessed, whether it is through narratives that they tell themselves or representation through the arts, there's something about that that you know that gives satisfaction that you know that my my story is being heard as you say, other people are witnessing being witnessed you know it's almost like an affirmation of one's suffering by others. What can you say about the limitations? So so if you think about the notion the idea that this might bring justice you know just this fact that a different kind of justice to be sure that, oh, finally someone is listening, someone is hearing, someone is, you know, paying attention to my story. What might be, what might you say about the limitations of this kind of thing? Thank you. Um, that, thank you for that. Um, the way I work is, is perhaps different from some academics in that I don't go into a project that's it, done and dusted. I take the social activism part of it quite seriously. Um, in that particularly with, with all my projects, I follow up and I write lots of op-eds to, to take what I've raised in a creative piece to, to the forefront of, of, uh, of certainly those in policy making as well as those and those people. So it, it is something that, that I endeavor to do with everything. Um, 
the, the project or the, the, the act of, of unfolding and revealing in transformation cannot start and end with an art piece or a film or, or an exhibition. Um, it has to do with taking it further. Um, and I think that's, that's the complication because as an academic, you, you know, we are, it's this publish or peril kind, you know, die a painful death if we don't do it. But I think if more of us push those boundaries and say, well, we cannot, we, we owe something to these people who have invested the deepest and most private and painful memories with us. We cannot simply let it go. Um, it is incumbent on us to take it further, to write those offers, to push, to get involved in community organizations and to see people for what they are, um, which is, you know, and we need to see them in, in, in every single sense because it is in the not seeing that we reduce them to being inhuman yet again. Thank you very much, Sheena. Um, for, for pointing out the, the ethical engagement in, in this work and so, so profoundly because it's so relational. Um, and, and also, um, I like what you're saying also about, you know, pushing the boundaries also for academia and um, how we engage in these complex stories. Um, we have one more question from Professor uh, Bjorn Korndolfer. We have a few minutes left, so he's also going to come up and ask his question to you personally. Hi, thank you so much, um, and, and good morning on my end. Um, I, I have a quick question regarding the work of, of arts and giving up the title of the conference um, or colloquium on aesthetics of cruelty. Um, it, on some level, it's limited how to address a past that is so unresolved. But I wonder whether uh, your work or other people's work, the, of people on the panel who kind of think about these things or actually do these things, whether the best we can do is to detoxify the past through artistic, aesthetic engagements with people who are so severely traumatized, rather than thinking of that it will resolve it or heal it or repair it in any larger meaningful way. I mean, the, the, the past cannot be resolved. I mean, you, you see it everywhere, you might think. Um, but maybe detoxifying is one way to think about our artistic activist agendas. I don't know whether you have any thoughts about that. Uh, I'm certainly going to be thinking about this. I like this idea of detoxify. I suppose our challenge is how do we represent that which is unrepresentable? Um, and that's the challenge those of us who are creatives come, come along, you know, do we enact further violence by, by perhaps raising these, these really difficult um, questions and what are the curatorial or creative devices that we need to employ that doesn't, that doesn't inflict further harm um, but I think largely, I think those of us who are creators, we, we adhere to that. And I think we also need to be very clear as to what this can do and what it cannot. You know, if, if we understand this past to be so catastrophic that we cannot repair it, um, I think there's value in that as well, because it cautions us against repeating that. Because if, of course, we could fix it, um, then it wouldn't have been that catastrophic to begin with in the first place. So I think there's, there's value in understanding or adopting the idea that what, was hap what happened in both these pasts should not be repeated again. Um, and that holds us at, at bay. And, but it is also um, our duty as I think to, to work with traumatic memories in a way that, that is safe but also gives voice to those who, who were traumatized and not, not inflict an additional um, trauma. So when I, when I deal with, particularly the, the Weinberg Seven, nobody had, there, there hadn't been anything written on them. And when I contacted them, um, in fact, even when I contact people around forced removals or, 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 in any really difficult part of their past, the, the first thing is we haven't thought about this in a long time. We don't talk about it. Um, and then I'll leave it and I'll say, well, if you want to, you know, here's my number, let, let's try and get together. And we go through these, these months long process of speaking about what happened. 
and they are often completely they they break down um, absolutely and and they say it, we knew this would happen if we opened that door. Um, and we always knew that we'd have to do it at some time or another because our children don't know about it. Our marriages are broken down. We are not functioning in the way that we ought to. So we know it has to happen, but we just don't know how to do that. So I think that is the importance of the work that we do. Um, but I like this idea of detoxifying and not to tame it in any way, but to give it, to realize it in a space and place that does no harm, um, additional harm. But I'd like to hear what the others say. I think that's a, that's a wonderful point on which to conclude this session. Thank you very, very much for this profound um, keynote and, and really discussion and talking from your heart. Um, I think we, this, this is a conversation that we'd like to, to continue with you and um, engage with you on. Thank you very, very, Thank much. very much. Thank you all. Thank you. So I'm going to hand over now to Professor Anastasia Mitrovanova. Um, I hope I said that correct, Anastasia, probably not. Um, but she is going to chair the, the panel discussion that is now going to follow. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I'm very sorry, my big computer has collapsed yesterday. So I'm using another one and this one has no camera. So uh, I'm very sorry, uh, but you will not see me. Uh, I will try, nevertheless, I will try to uh, be uh, here sort of invisibly a bit. Uh, so uh, I think we can proceed uh, to the next uh, session. Um, we have uh, three speakers uh, there. Uh, and I think that each of them uh, has uh, 20 minutes. Otherwise, we will not be able to uh, have a discussion. So please uh, try uh, to uh, stay within uh, the limit of uh, 20 minutes, dear speakers. Uh, and I will uh, reserve uh, the right to intervene uh, if you uh, exceed this uh, limit. I'm very sorry, but otherwise uh, we have no time to discuss. So, uh, so our first uh, speaker is a very, uh, very distinguished uh, scholar from Russia, from the city of Perm, uh, Professor Suvorova, very well known for her research in art studies, but I think she can add something about her herself in the very beginning to, re uh, to represent uh, herself. So let us proceed. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. I highly appreciate to be a part of uh, so brilliant colloquium. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my presentation uh, is about Soviet uh, outsider artist, uh, the artist of Arbrut, Alexander Labanov. Uh, and sorry, give me a little bit time. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, and uh, then the talk about uh, the case of uh, Soviet psychiatry uh, and uh, the uh, Soviet ideology, exactly, uh, they're thinking about the dissidents, about the punitive medicine, etc. Uh, and, um, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh, and Soviet psychiatry participated in the repressive uh, ideological processes. Uh, exactly, Soviet uh, uh, psychiatry was embodied uh, by a speech uh, by Nikita Khrushchev uh, in 1959, who stated that only the mentally ill can be disagree with the bright perspective of building uh, the communism. Moreover, since such uh, dissident existed and uh, by definition, uh, they were mentally ill, uh, their 
appeared uh, a new need for a quiet, um, a quiet uh, extrajudicial reprisal against them through the tools uh, of psychiatry. Uh, in the late 1970s, thanks to investigations by human rights defenders, the state of affairs became public. Was the book by Alexander Podrabinek, Punitive Medicine, published in New York in the late uh, 70s, and uh, pretty soon uh, was translated uh, into English. Uh, so uh, then we talk about uh, the specificity of uh, art by Alexander Labanov. Uh, we may see how the uh, ideology uh, pressure uh, uh, reflected uh, via the art of Alexander Labanov. The analysis of uh, Alexander Labanov reveals the influence of Soviet visual propaganda uh, on the field of outsider art, as well as the mechanisms of this borrowing. In the study, in my study uh, was revealed the specificity uh, of appropriation by an outsider artist of the uh, visual uh, narratives of ideology, such as circle uh, of borrowed images, I mean militarism, uh, uh, images of uh, Soviet heroes, uh, the images of Soviet of nations, uh, as well as uh, the uh, specificity of technique. Uh, in this case, I mean the uh, ornamental character of uh, Soviet visual propaganda and uh, the usage of texts, etc. Uh, and um, the important aspect of my study uh, is to identify the root uh, of these borrowings in the work of Alexander Labanov. Uh, and uh, in this case, I mean the uh, specific uh, intellectualizations of compensatory mechanisms. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I mean that uh, the Alexander Labanov use uh, these uh, images like a tool the social representation uh, in the period when Alexander Labanov was in a uh, mental uh, hospital. Uh, so uh, then we talk about Alexander Labanov. Uh, uh, the biographers uh, mentioned that uh, the mental status of Labanov uh, is not so clear. Uh, for instance, in the uh, foreign studies and uh, 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 in the foreign exhibitions, uh, Alexander Labanov uh, always uh, was um, uh, was uh, uh, was mentioned like the uh, mental ill person, uh, but uh, uh, how uh, Vladimir Gavrilov, uh, the Russian biographers, Alexander Labanov. Uh, mentioned uh, that uh, uh, Alexander Labanov was only deaf person uh, and without some uh, pedagogical correction, uh, uh, he, uh, Labanov uh, had some um, problem with uh, social adaptation uh, and uh, um, a sort of uh, psychopathologization uh, of uh, the behavior. Uh, during uh, the period of when uh, he was in psychiatric hospital. Uh, so, uh, and uh, analyzing the last years uh, of the teenage Labanov stay in the family and in the first period of Labanov stay in the uh, hospital, uh, one can observe projective forms of uh, uh, psychological defense. Uh, Labanov lied in the bed, uh, wrapped in, in a blanket uh, and tried to commit suicide. Uh, and at that period of time, Labanov wrote in his uh, notebooks, uh, the dead man is good. Uh, I should remember uh, that Labanov uh, was uh, totally uh, deaf and uh, practically can't speak. Uh, this situation of aggression and protest of Alexander Labanov against uh, 
forced medicalization uh, uh, was reflected in this picture, for instance, uh, exactly. Uh, in this picture, Labanov uh, depicted uh, herself uh, uh, like a child, uh, but uh, in the reality, Labanov uh, was, um, uh, uh, was transmitted uh, in the mental hospital uh, in late uh, teenage period. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in the hospital, Labanov started to uh, painting, uh, and uh, then they continue to observe uh, the picture by, by Alexander Labanov. They may see that uh, in the Labanov's heritage are enormously many uh, self-portraits. Uh, and um, in these self-portraits, they may see uh, a huge amount of their poems, a huge amount of uh, some specific uh, visual cause, uh, which seems pretty similar uh, if compared with this visual propaganda of Soviet period. Uh, so uh, Soviet ideology forms a, a formed a new person. Ideology turned out to be uh, pretty total uh, and uh, this totality of Soviet propaganda uh, they reflected uh, as uh, isolated pe people uh, as well as free people, free person. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, everybody in Soviet Union uh, live, uh, lived uh, inside the Soviet ideological, ideological mach machine. Uh, and uh, as Boris Groys writes, the political measures of Soviet ideology, they aimed uh, at the formation of new communist humanity. Uh, this uh, concerned uh, all citizens of the state and had a, a profound effect of, of their psyche. The product of this ideological work was a kind of collective soul, a mental territory of sovereigns of uh, which was uh, the state. Uh, the pressure uh, and totality of official Soviet ideology, in fact, uh, sub I'm sorry, sub subjected and uh, private, uh, private uh, psychology uh, that was subjected on nationalization. Uh, so, uh, and we may see uh, how many, uh, how, how often Alexander Labanov used uh, the images of their pawns, the images of uh, militarism and um, uh, mit uh, uh, the uh, visuality of uh, Soviet art of uh, uh, the Soviet visual culture in general, uh, the pretty militarized uh, and uh, imaginary was only the key intentions of totalitarian era. Uh, it was concentrated uh, in all thematically and uh, general different drawings by Labanov. Militaristic uh, motifs are pre uh, they presented uh, in uh, functionally uh, justified objects uh, such as in uh, hunting motifs, uh, like in this one. Uh, so uh, as well, uh, the, uh, their wounds and uh, militarization in general, uh, they used uh, as some symbolic attributes, uh, single sides of power or uh, ornamental, ornamental framing uh, made of hunting rifles. Uh, the militarized reality uh, was repeatedly reproduced uh, in motion pictures, films, paintings, posters uh, of visual agitation and propaganda. Uh, the military, the important person, uh, I mean the military person, uh, the uh, soldier as, as well, uh, the important person uh, of the Soviet era uh, and they uh, earn honor and respect in society. Uh, a soldier uh, was a sort of heroes uh, and uh, they pretty often 
uh, they're shown in the uh, magazines, in uh, documentaries, uh, etc. So, uh, and Alexander Labanov use uh, the sites of military, uh, the different attributes uh, of uh, military reality of Soviet Union uh, in this self portrait. Uh, so, uh, and uh, according to the biographers, Alexander Labanov uh, often watched films. Uh, it was a, a pretty widespread practice uh, in the metal hospital. It sounds maybe a little bit strange, uh, but uh, in the, the person who uh, they're living in the mental hospital uh, was in totality of Soviet visual propaganda. And uh, the uh, movies, um, the Soviet movies, um, uh, they're shown uh, repeatedly uh, in the mental hospital, uh, for instance, like this one, uh, they are from Kronstadt, uh, and uh, Alexander Labanov uh, used the um, idea of this film uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, this picture, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, Labanov uh, borrowed in uh, the uh, heroic motifs uh, of this film uh, and uh, use the mind plot and composition of posters uh, of this film, uh, but uh, deleted uh, one character uh, from this composition and uh, that character uh, was uh, a gray hair man uh, and uh, it was pretty predictable uh, because in the uh, symbolic space uh, of uh, Soviet visual propaganda, uh, the heroes uh, was always young uh, and uh, never became uh, older. Uh, so or this one, a bit similar. Uh, and uh, the image of the leader was uh, on uh, one uh, of the most important uh, for the entire visual uh, narratives of totalitarian period. Uh, professional artists receive state awards uh, for the portraits of leaders, uh, images of leaders are printed in the, uh, on the pages uh, of newspapers and magazines, uh, replicated in reproductions, uh, etc. So uh, the images of Stalin, less often uh, images uh, of Lenin, appear in the, uh, Alexander Labanov uh, pictures uh, for several decades uh, of his creative story. Uh, in depicting them, the artists uh, seem to abandon uh, the uh, I I mean uh, that. Um, Alexander Labanov uh, used the images of uh, leader, the images of Stalin or uh, images of Lenin, uh, like uh, some sort of, I don't know, totem, um, some sort of um, mask uh, to uh, reflect uh, uh, the status uh, of herself. Uh, so, uh, Thanks to the propaganda, the image of Stalin began to uh, possess the magic of power, uh, influencing uh, the little man. Uh, the artist created the image of Stalin as uh, a charismatic leader, uh, this uh, a mythical, exemplary geography, more and more uh, superhuman abilities. Uh, and ex, I'm sorry, extolled by the founder of state. Uh, Stalin became a symbol of party, state and nation, as well as more abstract concepts such as the new man, uh, the new society and the Bolshevik vision. Uh, in these characteristics attributed uh, to the images of Stalin and Lenin by uh, the mass propaganda, mass posters uh, that attracted Alexander Labanov uh, served as a motif for repeating iconographic schemes, uh, symbolism and uh, figurativeness of portrait of leaders as well as for implication of these techniques uh, in the self-portrait. Uh, 
uh, often elements uh, in similar images of Labanus, uh, they symbols of statehood, uh, the emblems and flags uh, of the USSR, airplane, airplane, I'm sorry, airplanes, guns, and machine guns, uh, and other symbols. Uh, these symbols, they're often reproduced in the visual arts uh, of the so, uh, such, I'm sorry, social realism era. Uh, there are also three non-state motifs, uh, which mainly form the space of frame, uh, such as, I'm sorry, uh, for instance, here, uh, flowers uh, or plants, birds, etc. Uh, it is also important to note that all portraits have uh, an essential uh, decorative character. Uh, they are almost always framed by the overall ornamented frame. So, uh, and uh, it's a, some sort of reference uh, to the portraits uh, of leaders by Alexander Labanov. Uh, and um, exactly uh, then we talk about the specificity of portraits of Stalin uh, and uh, less the portraits of Lenin. Uh, they may see some, uh -huh, I see, uh, they may see uh, some references here, uh, such as in this case, uh, Stalin's iconography includes a small numbers of uh, compositions uh, of, um, types, uh, and Labanov has several such borrowings from mass propaganda of images and replicated socialist realism. Uh, for example, uh, this iconography in the portrait of Stalin and Gela Markizova, uh, the image uh, from the photograph of 1936, uh, which was replicated many times in mass propaganda. Uh, from this drawing by Labanov, uh, it is not noticeable that uh, he reminds the mind formal characteristics, appearance, the details of uh, clothing, but uh, at the same time adds some specific fantastic details, uh, such as pink uh, fields on the ground, uh, symbols of statehood, etc. So uh, I, I uh, think that um, I was pretty short in my speech, uh, and uh, maybe if you have some question, you may write it in chat, and uh, I answer uh, individually on uh, this uh, question. Thank you a lot, uh, dear colleagues. Excuse, oh, sorry, <laughs> I've forgotten to turn on my microphone. <laughs> well, I have just uh, thanked uh, Professor Suvorova for being short and concise. And now we proceed uh, to our next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Andrea Gulota uh, from Glasgow, with some uh, very interesting information for us. And please, uh, Dr. Golota, could you also say a couple of words about yourself in the beginning, if, if you don't mind? Thank you. And you have 20 minutes. Please don't forget. Sure. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And um, I just wanted to say before saying something about myself, how happy I am of being part of this uh, symposium. I've always been very uh, intrigued by uh, the any 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 possible line, common lines between the Gulag and the situation in South Africa. So I'm very happy of being part of this, and uh, I will be happier to be in South Africa, especially since I'm in Scotland and it's pretty cold. But um, I do understand that this is not possible, and it's still a great opportunity to share uh, my um, uh, activity with you. I will actually speak about what I do uh, as part of my presentation. So I will. Would, um, get to these um, PowerPoint, and I hope that everybody is able to see this. Um, because uh, when I was invited to to 
to bring uh, something uh, to the colloquium, I was asked to speak about the exhibition. And I thought that since the topic of the colloquium is um, the representation of cruelty, the aesthetics of cruelty, I thought it was worth to um, make a discussion about overall the representation or challenges of setting up a virtual exhibition and how in the different roles I've had over my career, uh, I have encountered different um, different uh, issues. So first I would like to say very quickly, uh, I will make a short introduction to the topic of my uh, research. I am mainly a literary scholar. I started as a literary scholar and my work has always been on, well, initially has been on the, on the Sol of Key prison camp. The Sol of Key prison camp is an important camp in the history of the Gulag, just in case someone is not uh, familiar with this, I wanted to say a couple of words about this. It was certainly in 1923 at the very beginning of the Soviet experience uh, because the uh, the state had problems in organizing prison and camps. And so it entitled the OGPU, which was the uh, political police, to run a camp um, and it gave a whole archipelago. This camp was going to become uh, a very important uh, camp in the history of the Gulag overall. Well, first of all, it's one of the worst in terms of violence, uh, victims, and uh, uh, in terms of how it somehow molded the whole system in the future. I'll get to this in a second. And then it became a symbol of the Gulag. So um, the, the title of Sajanitsyn's work, Archipelag Gulag, which eventually gave the widespread use of the name of the Gulag, was based on a, on a, on a metaphor based on the archipelago of the Salafki. Um, the, uh, the first, one of the very first monuments to the memory of the victims was a stone taken from the sort of key prison camp and put in front of the Lubyanka uh, building, which was the headquarters of the Agupeu and eventually then the Nankabede and so on. Uh, so it is um, a, a camp that has a very important part in the history of the Gulag. Um, it was a special purpose camp, so it was set specifically to isolate some categories of prisoners, but also to make the forced labor profitable, which was the most important uh, of, the, of the goals in terms of strategic needs of the, of the power. In the first years, they didn't make this goal, but then a prisoner came on board, uh, Naftali Franklin, and entered the camp as a prisoner and eventually became first of a collaborator of the administrators of the camp and eventually uh, properly uh, uh, a collaborator of the whole sort of repressive system. And he made up somehow, and this is documented by the journals of the camp as well, a, a series of theories that were eventually implemented outside the camp and that uh, eventually shaped the creation of the whole system of the Gulag uh, since uh, 1930. Um, most of the activities of the SLON, this is the acronym of the camp, were transferred um, in the 30s to the mainland because in a way the camp had uh, uh, fulfilled its function. And in the 30s it became overpopulated with prisoners coming, especially from the Ukraine, uh, after the Holodomor and the ridiculous accusation. In the 1937, it became a prison. Um, and uh, it was also the year where thousands of prisoners were executed as part of the um, Great Terror. Uh, some of this on the Solovki archipelago, some brought to the mainland and executed, uh, uh, especially in Levashovo uh, and in Sandarmok, an important place of memory. And in 1939, the camp was closed because it was too close to the Finnish border at the beginning of the winter war with Finland. So this is a, in very short the, the history of the camp. But what I was intrigued by was the culture of the camp. The camp had a very specific environment. It was an experimental uh, camp. In a way, it has been described by many historians as the laboratory of the Gulag. And uh, I was uh, part of the experiment was also how to use culture, the prisoner's culture. And so there were theater, there was music, there, were li there, were li there was a library, there were many publications, there was a club where prisoners would have seminars uh, um, and there was a criminological cabinet and different uh, research enterprises started in this part of the administration. And I was very intrigued by this uh, and because the most important thing is that even though similar activities happened in other camps, in the Sol of Key, they were led by the intelligentsia. So the, the, the intelligentsia were the leaders that are representatives of the intelligentsia, which were supposed to be repressed and put to silence. And instead in that camp, they were actually leading the uh, cultural activities. So um, initially uh, as a researcher, I approached this topic as a researcher uh, with the need to 
restore what in my view was an unwritten page of cultural history. I felt that the, um, what would have existed at the, at the moment where I started my research was not enough and was not adequate enough. And so I decided to uh, study this topic first from a cultural history point of view and then from a literary point of view. But then uh, uh, in 2017, to mark the centenary of the Russian Studies Department in my university, I was asked as part of the celebrations to think of an exhibition uh, to uh, do this uh, with the Hunteri Museum, which is a very prestigious museum we have at the University of Glasgow, the oldest university museum in, in the world. Uh, and so we thought of doing an exhibition about this topic. And, uh, um, and I found myself in a completely different perspective, in a completely different role, and having completely different, in a way, uh, uh, priorities, but also question marks as to how to approach this material. I needed to strike a balance somehow between uh, the, what in the UK is called knowledge exchange. So the, 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 the um, uh, capacity to share uh, university and academic specific, specific uh, material to a wider public, a public that doesn't know anything about the topic. Uh, and to somehow think about the history of the specific camp and at the same time, think about the memory of the Gulag. And so uh, I was actually confronted with a series of very serious challenges. And I thought that uh, some of them could be uh, put on the, on the floor here. And so I thought I could then eventually show you how uh, I decided to approach some of, the, of these uh, issues. And eventually at the end, uh, Try to, to start a discussion with uh, uh, all of you, uh, trying to mention also some of the things that have been mentioned in the part of the workshop, the colloquium they have been able to uh, attend. Well, first of all, uh, I have the issue of the language to use, but I will return to this in a second. The other issue that I have, which was very, very uh, difficult for me as a researcher, and it somehow represented itself, uh, reproposed itself in different, in a different way when I had to think about this material as an exhibition, uh, was how to manage uh, voices, sources, and objectivity. Um, when I started this work, I, I did feel the responsibility of um, having to choose some of the stories for my book, for my, well, initially it was a dissertation, eventually developed into a monograph. Um, and so in a way, I had the approach as a researcher. So I had to select the material, thinking of what was more important for my research and try to uh, uh, bring out in the most objective way possible, the history of these people. So to select in a way, a writer from another one, uh, the selection was made purely on uh, based on research needs. So uh, it, to say it, in, in more practical terms, uh, I went through uh, hundreds of publications. I tried to reconstruct the uh, biographies and the history of the publications and the history behind uh, these literary works and then try to give an interpretation of them. Now, of course, there were dozens of authors and I could not fit all of them in. And so when I decided and I chose which one were the ones that were to be discussed because the work were a particular intriguing under a research point of view. I did remain with a human somehow feeling of being in a way unjust to the ones that had an opportunity to be restored, to an opportunity to have a, a return into the, the, word, uh, the word, to go back from the oblivion where they were, to, to save them from the cossetors. I used this, this um, word in my book, and so I thought of reproposing it here. Uh, but I did leave some in the oblivion, and I did feel absolutely horrible about this. I felt it was unjust. But then in a way, I do wonder, is that the role of the researcher? Uh, is this the way that we approach or should we just stick to the fact and be researchers and objectives and stay away from it? And I heard some of the discussions that do actually uh, uh, engage with the question, what are we supposed to do with it as a researcher? And so I, I was 
confronted with the difficulties of being objectors. And also I was confronted with the difficulty of how to represent violence in different mediators of memory. This is a term taken from Aleda Asman's work on cultural memory and how she says that mediators are the instrument that we use to bring over memory. A book was not supposed to mean, uh, my book was not supposed to be a mediator of memory, it was supposed to be an academic work, which in a way it is a mediator of memory, but it does not have the impact on the general public that an exhibition could have. But the exhibition is something else. So it is for general public, they supposed to be exposed to public that are not necessarily and only specialists of the topic. And so my way, uh, in a way, uh, I was thrown again into this sort of dance. And my, um, when I started to think of the exhibition, I was actually quite clear as to what I did not want to do. Um, and so the representations of cruelty that I had seen in other situations, um, some of them were inspiring, some of them were not. So we are talking, as I said, uh, of one of the worst camps in terms of violence, in terms of victims. Uh, the recounts of the uh, survivors are absolutely horrible. Uh, the images that are there are absolutely horrible. But I felt I was not a carrier of a trauma. I could speak about trauma as a researcher, but did I want to speak about the trauma? Did I want to represent the trauma? Um, and so did I want to represent the cruelty that these people were subjected to? So what I did not want to do was what I saw, for example, in Algier, which is one of the few museums of the Gulag uh, in Kazakhstan now, uh, but there's not many of the museums of the Gulag that are uh, set in the places where the actual camps were. Well, in Algier, they reenact the camp. So every now and then they do performances where actors actually play the prisoner and they play the, um, the mean one, uh, the, the guards, uh, and the public stays there and watches the representations. Um, I felt that this was not something that actually I wanted to engage with because I didn't feel that I was in the position of having to propose something like this. And I, and I wasn't clear as to what the, mean, the meaning of this was. Uh, is it trying to shock the public? Is it trying to create a reaction? Is it trying to engage? I felt that this was not the right way for me at least. And I, it was not the right way what I saw in different museums of the, of the Gulag um, that I had been to. For example, the old history uh, of uh, the Gulag uh, Museum in Moscow. The, Bjorn spoke yesterday about the new one um, uh, in Moscow. Well, in the old one, there were a series of dioramas, which I didn't find uh, attractive at all. I felt that having these three dimensional representations didn't give any real uh, contact as to what really was, what really was the situation from my point of view. And so I felt that the, the balance between engagement and voyeurism was actually very, very thin in these cases. And so I decided not to take these, um, um, these examples. And when I, when I did decide what sort of language to use, I was actually very happy to work with students uh, that were engaged in a master, a curatorial master at the University of Glasgow. And so uh, I did get a lot of feedback from them. And I came to the conclusion that the language that I had to use was the one of telling a story of beauty against the backdrop of a story of violence and suffering. So to do show the beauty, but to hint at the violence, not to represent it, because I felt it was not my role. I did not want to represent horror. I wanted to represent individual history to highlight how cultural resistance was put in place and to give somehow a message of, of hope and to bring in material history, material memory against an abstract idea of discourse uh, or a discourse of memory. And here I relate to what Bjorn spoke about yesterday, which was very inspirational for me. The fact that um, the, um, the material memory, the objects do convey a completely different engagement with the thing, but um, with, the, with the history that they speak about, but uh, uh, this was a virtual exhibition, so the story was different, so I'm not entirely sure if it works. So I want to show you now the exhibition itself. So um, let me switch to another thing. Well, first I want to show you the Virtual Gulag, Gulag Museum of the Gulag, which was really a source for inspiration for me. This is a project done with Irina Flie by Irina Fliege of St. Petersburg, Petersburg Memorial. 
it's a project that inspired me. I'm, I have a very, the luck of having a very close relationship with Rina for nearly 13 years now. And some of our discussions were specifically on the material, uh, the, the, the power of material memory. Um, and the approach that she took here in the creation of this virtual museum of the Gulag was an approach that I liked. If you see, uh, you will see faces and you will see objects, uh, like in this page, well, you will see specific objects that I think convey a completely different way of representing uh, uh, memory. So now uh, let me switch to my exhibition. So here is the um, exhibition itself. Um, and this is the exhibition. And as you will see, uh, it has a banner at the opening and it has uh, to the left, an introduction sort of into the Salof Key Camp. And it's in here that I, that I put my representations of horror. And I put it through um, general information about the camp, uh, which you will see, uh, especially in the section about the history, where there are photographs taken from the archives, from different archives, show well, first how the camp was made. And then uh, it sh they show life in the camp, so they show forced labor. And in the descriptions, they were made through the help of the students themselves. There are clear indications, for example, of institutionalized evidence of uh, violence, but they did not want to engage with this because my real topic and my real, um, uh, um, the core idea was the culture uh, in the specific camp, even though uh, the, the the museum preferred to use the gulag overall, and I was a little bit against uh, this idea, but I decided not to resist it. Um, but the cultural is the key um, uh, topic of the exhibition. So you will find uh, the photographs of the cultural activities, for example, the theater of the camp, the band of the camp, uh, and uh, the images, for example, from the theater, from music, here you will see uh, images of the prisoners engaged in shows and so on, because the story that I wanted to speak about was the story of individuals and how they coped with uh, what they were going through. So in the highlights, you will see, for example, this guide and diary created by a prisoner for his wife, where uh, you will see uh, the drawings that he made for her the map of how to reach the cell of key from a home with the timetable of the of the train and so on because i thought the map that he drew of the camp and how to find himself and this is the indication like of his office and so on i thought that i felt that these sort of stories were better vehicles of the horror than an image of an horror in itself so i will go back to the um presentation to come to my conclusions um and uh oh Yes. I'm, I'm so sorry, you have probably one minute left. Yeah, 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 no, no, I'm going to the conclusion. Thank you. So, and uh, here I, um, I bring two reactions, two completely opposite reactions I had to my exhibition. The first one was uh, by a, a scholar coming from, uh, um, I think she would have been 10 years old. Uh, we did an event called Explorathon about the European research. And she told me that she was, she saw the exhibition as part of an educational program I've done at a school that she was absolutely uh, inspired. She told me it has changed my life, which was absolutely rewarding and made me feel that I felt uh, I found the right balance between the different needs, but then I, I did present the exhibition in London at the Pushkin House, and an older lady raised her hand and asked me, where is the hell? You call it beauty in the hell. I can only see beauty. Where is the hell? So somehow I, it has left me with a series of questions. And the questions is also about what we do when we engage with um, these uh, enterprises as researchers, uh, when we start with new mediators of memory, when we create new deposits of memory, as an exhibition is. And what do we do when memory is at stake? Because, and here I go to the question raised by Bjorn about the detoxifying the past, uh, uh, trying to repair, or uh, as uh, Shena said, uh, creating no additional harm. I think it is in a way something that we need to take care of, uh, especially when memory is at stake in this moment, the memory of the Gulag is at the center of a memory war, uh, which I've been working on for uh, a while right now. So the question is, how do we mediate 
within all of this, and in a context of memory at risk, how do we mediate also the memory of the horror? I'm not entirely sure I did strike a right, a, a right balance, and I do uh, uh, wish to hear your opinion about this. And here I will stop myself, and I will thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Kolota. Uh, you have questions, but we will come back to them after we finish all the three presentations. Thank you. Uh, so, and our next uh, panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Pfunzo Sidoji. I am sorry for possible mispronunciation. Uh, with another interesting topic, and please could you say a couple of words in the beginning about yourself? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and to the esteemed panelists that just have come before me and also from yesterday, this has been an absolutely profound uh, uh, colloquium. Uh, so my name is Funza Dogi. Indeed, your pronunciation was, was almost right. And I'm a lecturer at the Tony University of Technology in Pretoria, which is the capital city of uh, South Africa. Um, and you have introduced me as uh, as doctor, which is actually correct in that um, I've just recently completed my PhD studies at uh, Stellenbosch University. Um, so I will switch over to my presentation now. Okay. And so the, the title of my paper is uh, Apartheid Concentration Camps the brutalities of urban segregation in the work of black South African artists. In 1972, the captain of the black consciousness movement, Steve Biko, writing about the establishment of Bantu homelands at the time, famously described the so-called self-governing black states that were invented and subsidized by the apartheid government as tribal cocoons that were nothing else but sophisticated concentration camps where blacks where black people are allowed to suffer peacefully. Following Biko's logic of seeing the black homelands as refined concentration camps for blacks, it can be concluded that the urban settlements located close to the big cities where black people were forced to live commonly known as townships were themselves bona fide concentration camps or labor reserves or what our Russian colleagues would call gulag, uh, where Blacks encountered unthinkable terrors. In this paper, I explore various visual uh, representations of, apart of apartheid brutality captured by Black artists who lived in these Black concentration camps during the 20th century. These artworks illustrate in both poetic and graphic forms the horror and carnage that Black people endured as a result of racist and segregationist policies of successive colonial and apartheid governments. And I'm glad that um, Professor O'Connell's presentation really provided uh, the, the, the context around, around this reality. Because use of the concentration camp metaphor in the statement cited before was not misplaced nor purely symbolic. As shown in Ezra Lechai's drawing, Biko paid the ultimate price for challenging the racist logic of the apartheid regime. The legacies of concentration camps the world over have been characterized by a desire to control, subjugate, and in the most extreme circumstances, eliminate those who were seen as dissimilar, other, and alien. Because acute awareness of how the apartheid government segregationist policies produced sites for black settlement that were tantamount to a refined and remodeled form of concentration camps was linked to the very ontology of the concentration camp phenomenon during the South African War of 1899 to 1902. It was not a mere accident of history that the first victims of the British war campaign in South Africa namely the Creole Boers or Afrikaners and the black communities would later emerge as the main protagonists and antagonists in the development of what I have termed here apartheid concentration camps from the 1950s onwards. 
In fact, the character of the British engineered concentration camps during the South African war provided a blueprint for the evolution of the apartheid concentration camps where millions of urban based black people were forced to live and experience urban modernity from the periphery. As captured in Dumele Freni's large sketch, being black in this urban concentration camps was the form of imprisonment. Unlike most of the concentration camps that sprung up across Europe before and during World War II, mm -hmm. the concentration camps pioneered by the British during the South African war and the urban-based apartheid concentration camps were not predicated on the desire to exterminate those who were confined to the sites. Rather, these camps sought to destroy the will, resolve, and spirit of the encamped. Within these apartheid concentration camps, black residents were in a perpetual state of limbo, here illustrated by Mzwake Nkabati in this drawing. The British engineered concentration camps of the South African war left an almost unhealable scar for generations of Boers and black people who were devastated by the terrible deaths that befell vulnerable women and children within the camps. These generational wounds were ex exacerbated by the lack of empathy from the British towards the Boers and the blacks. The British soothed their conscience by stressing that they did not directly inflict any brutality or killings within the camps. Instead, they claimed that it was sickness through measles and pneumonia, for example, that killed the internees. In other words, the British had not brought down the ultimate judgment on the captives, but rather it was nature that took the lives of the encamped. Be, but be that as it may, the British had played a defining role by cultivating the conditions for these deaths to occur. This denial of culpability by the British around the deaths in the camps is linked to the urban segregation concentration camp strategy adopted by the colonial and apartheid governments in later years. The concentration camp model pioneered during, pioneered during the South African war sowed the seeds of the character and nature of black urbanisms that mushroomed throughout the 20th century. Although these black urbanisms or townships were functionally very different from the British concentration camps, they nevertheless had the same temperament and outcomes. The policies that led to urban-based blacks living in so-called townships where there was heavy policing as depicted in this uh, painting by George Pemba, insufficient housing, lack of uh, amenities, inadequate schools, poor healthcare facilities, amongst others, contributed towards making an environment wherein the ills of disease, overcrowding, poverty, and crime would ravage and suffocate the black inhabitants of these spaces. Almost in the same terms that sickness, lack of water and proper sanitation and inadequate shelter killed hundreds of thousands of Boers and Blacks within the first British concentration camps. Moreover, like the British warlords during the South African war, the white architects of the Black townships absolved themselves of responsibility for the dire conditions and awful human costs born from segregated urban planning. Throughout this contextualization, I have flipped through various images that point to the brutalities and realities of black urbanisms during the 20th century, where black people amounted to little more than expendable labor, pictured so beautifully in these paintings by Gerard Sikoto. These visuals and countless more were produced by black creatives who lived in the zones, in the sites or zones of non-being, as some authors have termed it, and used their imagination and artistic skills to catalog the experiences of the widows and outcasts who lived in these apartheid concentration camps. As we see here in the works by Cyprian Shilakwe and George Pemba once again. Almost all black con concentration 
camps or apartheid concentration camps, uh, again, known as townships throughout the country possessed similar spatial qualities. There was a single entrance and exit so that they could easily contain the inhabitants in instances of riots. The land was barren, dry, and in most cases, treeless. And there was a major lack of basic municipal infrastructure like electricity, running water, sanitation, and housing. In fact, the first democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela, recounted in his uh, claimed Long Walk to Freedom autobiography that the first time he arrived to Johannesburg and went to Alex, uh, which is one of the um, apartheid concentration camps, he was astonished to find that actually the rural area which he was coming from in the Eastern Cape was no different. In fact, he found that the rural area was a lot better than some of these black urbanisms that were close to the city. Images of informal settlements or squatter camps are the ultimate illustration of the dehumanized nature of black urbanisms during apartheid. As seen in Vusi Musi Kumalo's mixed media paintings, which I have just flipped through here, of uh, informal settlements which depicted squatter communities throughout the Gauteng province. Since black people were denied property rights within the city, hundreds of thousands were forced to live in informal settlements, such as those depicted by Kumalo. Using his distinctive collaged painting style, Kumalo recreated in high definition the mostly ignored insider world of a squatter camp. Kumalo takes the viewer through a journey of these despised and unwanted specters of the city. The care with which he paints the shacks enables the viewer to appreci appreciate that while these are precarious and non-permanent structure, structures, they are nevertheless spaces where people and families congregate and take refuge daily. Another artist who attempted to domesticate the squatter camp was Kakiso Pet Mawutra. In 1995, Mautra produced an ambitious installation titled Nkuku, which recreated a life-size shack in a conventional white cube gallery space in London, England. The room was furnished with items found in most shacks to give viewers who were most, almost exclusively white the tactile feeling and phenomenological experience of living in an apartheid concentration camp. While impressed by the overall, overall gravitas of the work, prominent art critic Ivo Powell was wary of the fact that this familiar strategy of bringing the real world of life into the gallery was a continuation of the sanitization and mystification of the black urban experience through art. Powell argued that although Mautra's installation was a genuine attempt to make real and tangible the domestic living conditions within informal settlements, it was re rendered impotent because it was consumed in a world completely indifferent to the interests of urban based black people in South Africa. By several measures, many of the stakeholders in the global art world at the time that this work was shown were directly or and or indirectly complicit in perpetuating the tyrannies that beset many black people within this apartheid concentration camps. However, the installation was more than an artistic reinterpretation of a shack. It was a politicized recreation of the injustices urban blacks had to endure on an almost daily basis. Even though the apartheid government provided urban housing for black people within these urban concentration camps, racist sentiments still guided the construction of these homes. During an address to parliament in 1950, the Minister of Native Affairs at the time, Dr. Ernest George Janssen, who actually has a high school named after him uh, within the Gauteng province, Unashamed, unashamed, unashamedly stated that a black person must never, and a quote, be provided a house which 
to him resembles a palace and with conveniences which he cannot appreciate and which he will not require for many years to come. This attitude also dictated the education provided to black people within apartheid concentration camps. In 1953, the Bantu Education Act was passed. Oddly enough, the Bantu education system increased the number of black students in urban schools. However, investment in these schools decreased substantially, which had a severe impact on the overall quality of the education. Problems of high teacher learner ratios, poverty, and as Philip Bonner terms it, sheer boredom, discouraged many black children from progressing further within the system. The sheer boredom and displeasure felt by black students who were forced to participate in an educational system that was designed to shortchange their futures is captured in Julian Mutau's drawing titled Classroom. Mutau's composition exudes the overcrowded and claustrophobic nature of black schools and the disdain and disillusionment felt by blacks Towards, Bantu, towards the Bantu education system is palpable in the facial expressions of the children. In defense of the Bantu education system, uh, Hendrik Verwoot, a key figure within the apartheid cabinet and also uh, head of the native affairs uh, department during the 1950s, famously stated, and I quote, what is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice. Education must train and teach people in accordance with their opportunities in life, according to their sphere in which they live." End quote. I conclude my presentation with a look at an image that encapsulates how Black people were economically expedient but socially unwanted residents of South African cities. Forced removals were a kind of apocalypse for urban based blacks, which represented the ending of a golden generation of formative non-racial urbanity. On account of the forced removals campaigns that were intensified during the 1950s and 60s, the magic of multiracial suburbs located close to the heart of the city were flattened and lost for the rest of the 20th century. Also, forced removals were the most vigorous expression of colonial and apartheid brutality in the urban domain, and were also used as a way of reasserting white dominion over the black body. And once again, Professor O'Connell spoke so eloquently to, to this point. Although black residents tried through various strategies to resist the forced removals, the military might of the government succeeded in literally bulldozing blacks out of what would become white only suburbs and subsequently sending them to the apartheid concentration camps as illustrated by George Simang, Simang in his drawing fittingly titled Bulldozing. Simang's fine ink sketch is a chilling pretorial narrative of the inhumanity of forced removals, wherein people and their belongings were mere rubble that needed to be removed from one site to another. Another drawing by Shadrach Mokola titled Machine and Building, Death and Destruction is a graphic illustration of the brutal presence of earth moving equipment within black urbanisms. On the one hand, the drawing speaks of the magnificence of the modern machinery and the awe-inspiring structures that these machines can help bring to life. However, similarly, it shows the dark and near demonic devastation the very same machines can rain upon those who are considered expendable. Makola shows how the livelihoods of urban-based Black people were uprooted to make way for industrialist expansion. Stuart Hall uses the metaphor of dirt uh, in the bedroom to illustrate how those considered other are distanced from the center. And I quote, what do you do with dirt in the bedroom? Is that you cleanse it, you sweep it out, you restore the old Order. You police the boundaries. You know the hard and fixed boundaries between what belongs and what does not belong. Inside, outside, cultured, uncivilized, barbarous, and cultivated. End quote. 
forced removals were an attempt to purify the city-based suburbs of the so-called dirt that was black people by sending them to the apartheid version of the gulag. As final remark, as seen in the few images sampled here, urban-based apartheid concentration camps were sites, were sites wherein black people experienced violence, destruction, and death on a scale that those residing outside of these spaces, especially white South Africans, both back then and today could hardly fathom. And I would like to close with a quote by Franz Fanon, who commented on what I have termed here the apartheid concentration camps, although he was not speaking directly to the situation in South Africa, but this quote speaks to what he's uh, uh, termed the native town and the character of the native town. And this again speaks so uh, uh, befittingly to the apartheid concentration camp. And I quote, it is a world without spaciousness. Men live there on top of each other and their hearts are built one on top of the other. The native town is a hungry town, starved of bread, of meat, of shoes, of coal, of light. The native town is a crouching village, a town on its knees, a town wallowing in the mire. And this is what we have seen in various representations of uh, black urbanisms or the township, quote unquote, and what I have termed here the uh, apartheid concentration camp as represented uh, in the work of um, various black South African artists. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank all the panelists. I hope that everyone can hear me. Uh, so uh, now we can proceed to questions. And I would like to ask some uh, people to articulate their questions. In the questions and answers, we have a, a pretty long uh, question by Oli Ackroyd. Uh, so could you please uh, articulate your question? Uh, thank you. And thank you all the three panelists for their absolutely fascinating panels. So it was really quite enlightening to read on that. Uh, um, as uh, those aspects that I perhaps haven't really heard much about previously. But I have one question for Dr. Andrea Gulotta, please. And just to ask that as a scholar who is working on realism and social reform as comparatively represented in 19th century Russian and American literature, I must say I have frequently encountered authors like Dostoevsky, most notably, or maybe Nekrasov, using very emotive descriptions and scenes, like, for example, the scene of Katerina Ivanovna's madness in Crime and Punishment, or, for instance, various moments in Notes from the House of the Dead, which is Dostoevsky's account of prison's exist prison existence. And they use those highly emotional descriptions to convey across a point concerning social reform and basically, if we speak in Russian, or what is to be done. And, for, and at the same time, obviously, if we think about Dostoevsky's prison experience or Solzhenitsyn's prison experience, those authors also have to remain true to the fact or in their representations of the horrors they see, like the plight of the prisoners. And I wanted to ask how would a scholar working on an interdisciplinary project fusing literary imaginary situations and factual representations and background balance out the poetic license allowable to the author, which is like high, those highly emotional representations or using imaginary scenes to draw attention to a particular issue and actual fact, what was actually happening and going on and what was the actual experience so as to remain truthful in their representation of the issue like the plight of the prisoners, but at the same time to be engaging and to really reach out to the audience and make them think, make them maybe want to change something. And here I was obviously thinking primarily about working with texts and literature here like Solzhenitsyn, Dostoevsky and so on, 
but also maybe in a broader context, thinking, for example, about the art exhibition, like in your experience or other things. So thank you. Thank you very much. And my cat has crushed the party, as you can see, one of my cats. <laughs> Sorry, let me move him away. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. You're actually asking uh, quite a difficult question. And I, I have done some work on it as well, because um, in my experience as a researcher, as a, say, a literary researcher, I have encountered the, the specific difficulties that you speak about. And in particular, the fact that quite often, I mean, this is one of the big issues of Gulag literature spoken by, uh, discussed by many people. I'm just thinking um, on the tip of my tongue, uh, Leona Tocker, Lube Rugenson, and others, um, about the fact that these texts uh, have a double function. They are witnesses, and they are at the same time aesthetic texts. And so it is quite difficult to understand um, where and how uh, the fact that they recount uh, uh, actual or where they are uh, imaginated or exaggerated. Uh, in my own research, I have encountered actually few occasions of writers making up stuff or um, in other situations, um, hiding uh, some of the things that they had done. For example, uh, one of the uh, one, one one typical example of what happened uh, in the early years of the cell of key is that a few prisoners actually managed to escape and they when they arrived in the west and in England and Germany and France they would publish memoirs saying this is the truth this is what I've seen this is what's happening in in, in Russia which in most cases was true, but in other cases was not, was not entirely true. It was based on things that they heard from other people. And actually like one of the first ones, Osierko Malzakov, Malzakov was, was never on the actual archipelago. He was just, he escaped just before reaching the archipelago. And so uh, this was pointed out. And actually there are a few inaccuracies. Um, in the case that you speak about in particular, I think there is one additional difficult difficulty. I'm talking about Dostoevsky. Um, I have um, stumbled upon the problem of Dostoevsky, but Dostoevsky's uh, text is not exactly a memoir. It is an autobiographical novel, uh, which has somehow an additional layer of difficulty in trying to understand what was actually actually what he had seen and what was not was somehow made up or exaggerated uh, for aesthetic purely aesthetic reasons and i think that in all these cases um uh, the the answer is that one needs to do as much work as possible to reconstruct the context from additional sources so my own experience at least my reply uh, to your question but it doesn't have to be the only way of course is um, that when I was confronted with the fact that some of the memoirs were actually inaccurate, um, what I did was to gather as much possible information from other sources, archival documents, other memoirs, texts published within the camp, uh, historical works about the topic, to try to really go through it, sift through and try to understand as much as possible what was true and what was not, and why things were true and why were things were not. Well, for example, uh, in the case of Malsagov, is that he wanted to raise the question. It was 1926, uh, it was a very early stage. People were dying in Russia, no one was speaking about it, so he was trying to put it out. So he did exaggerate it, um, a few things, which is very similar to the Dostoevsky case uh, that you're talking about. In other cases, for example, Boris Shiryaev uh, is an author that wrote a memoir published in the 50s, uh, all imbued with religious, highly religious um, significance of his, his experience in the camp. And then it came out that he actually was a collaborator to the administrator and speaking badly about the priests in the publication. So of course he did not want to uh, engage with that past which he did for a series of reasons, basically just survival, actually. And so I think the um, it it requires uh, when you want to approach when you approach these texts, if uh, based on my experience, it requires a, a lot of additional work to try to understand the context as much as possible, not much to sift through what is true, what is not, but also what is exaggerated and what is not, but also why are things untrue things put in there. What is the function of these lies? What is the function of these exaggerations? I hope I've, I've replied to your questions. And Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Oh, 
question. Let let me pick up a question from the uh, chat, and this is a question from our very distinguished participant from Estonia, from Professor Irina Piart. Uh, she has no microphone, so she wants me to read uh, uh, her uh, question. It's a question to Andrea. Uh, could you comment on the problem of mediation of traumatic history in a virtual space? And is beauty necessarily exclusive of violence? Thank you. And I think the other uh, panelists, actually, they can also contribute into discussing this issue because, you know, uh, beauty and violence, they are sort of uh, important for all of us. So, well, let us proceed. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for, for, for being here as well. Um, yes. Uh, I'll start, I'll start from replying to the first question. Uh, it, it has been difficult to, to think of a virtual uh, exhibition, honestly. Uh, uh, the, the, the fun thing is that, well, I mean, it's not fun, of course, is that the pandemic has made, has generated uh, hundreds of virtual exhibitions. When we did it, actually, we were some of the first ones to, to engage with this. There were a few virtual exhibitions, and, and we actually saw that some of them were engaging specifically uh, with trauma. And uh, we didn't feel it was the path, the right path to go through. And I personally was not comfortable with this because it is not my trauma. Uh, I'm Italian, I study these things, I have engaged with these things as much as possible, uh, but I don't have a history. And so I didn't feel like I could be somehow a filter, but rather a vehicle of trauma. Uh, and, and to do this in the cleanest way possible and the most respectful way possible, uh, as, as Shina said today, to make no additional harm. But it is true that um, it is a challenge because, uh, as I said, when I showed those dioramas and those performances in Algier, I think that the, the balance between representation and voyeurism is actually very thin because what does someone get from actors playing the victim and actors playing the mean guard? I'm not entirely sure this is the right way, me personally. So um, I think I, I will leave the question open to the other panelists. And when it comes to beauty, you're absolutely right. Um, beauty can engage with violence. And actually in the exhibition and in the, the monograph and in other works that I've done, I've shown how the prisoners uh, were also using Ethiopian language and try as much as possible to convey um, their engagement with violence by masking it in a different way. And so, uh, for example, there is a poem uh, written by Shiriat, the same person that I mentioned just before, who speaks quite badly about um, the, the, mon the monks and the past, because the Salafki used to be a monastery. Um, and uh, it speaks about the rotten smell of decay of, of the monks. But actually, if you can read it in an Aesopian way, it may also be a way to recall a past that has gone and that is dead and doesn't necessarily have to be a, a feel condemnation. I mean, in other works, he's openly critical to the priest, but in this work in particular, I think he was, was being Aesopian. So beauty can convey this meaning. And um, some of the things that I've shown in the exhibition, for example, the paintings on Ivan Diemsky, which was a painter who gave his paintings to his wife just before being executed. These paintings were never shown for 80 years and then we, we put them on the exhibition now. Uh, they do convey um, violence, but they do it in a context of beauty. I was absolutely enraptured by the amazing images shown by uh, Punzo and, and also the, uh, the work by Labanov in a way engages with this. So I'll leave my work to my colleagues and see what they add to it. Uh, I would like to invite other, other panelists to contribute into this discussion, please. Uh. Please speak. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I will. I will speak. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gulota, for for that. I will just speak only to to the um, to the second part of the question around beauty and and uh, representing troubling experiences. And, and this was a point that was touched on yesterday by Bjorn. Um, and I think Adebayo had asked uh, a similar kind of question. And, and I think in the case of, of the images that I'm looking at, um, there is the sense in which uh, there is a desire and an intention by the artists who are the uh, 
victims of these kind of urban uh, segregationist policies to kind of speak back and to, to tell the story themselves and to tell the story they, the way that they want to, to be seen. Um, and so th there are some really fascinating images where they kind of subvert what we would see as kind of um, uh, problematic uh, subjugation uh, experiences um, of, of domin uh, uh, domination and they flip that on, 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 the, on its head, right? And it becomes uh, instances of pride showing, for example, black laborers. There's, there was that one painting by Gerard Sikoto, Song of the Peak, where uh, it's, it's these men who are being forced into, into really terrible, tough labor, but in the manner in which he has represented that, it is a, a, a source of pride and a source of, of, of joy and, um, and, and um, in, in many ways, kind of a purposeful act, right? So, so I think there's that element, but as well, we, we cannot deny the fact that um, the, the realities were themselves brutal. So there, there are constant debates within a, a kind of scholarship regarding these uh, the kind of the poetics of struggle that whether we should um, in, in many ways uh, personify these really brutal and, and problematic histories and actually presence in some instances these are still presence that are happening right now because the these apartheid concentration camps uh, even though apartheid has ended the, the kind of structure and dynamic of these black urbanisms still remains intact. So how, how do we then approach the kind of representations of those spaces that are being produced by artists uh, living in those sites uh, who are seeing those spaces as being beautiful? Um, there's a term, for example, that is called ghetto fabulous. Uh, and there was a song, a very famous song that was titled ghetto fabulous, which, which really sought to say, look, yes, we're living in the ghetto. We, we stay in these uh, spaces where there are there's, there's really poor uh, municipal services and the schools are not adequate um, and, and housing is terrible, but hey, it's fabulous. Um, and so I, I think there is, there is a sense of that coming through, that sense of the aesthetics, the beauty coming through in, in these images from the 20th century uh, of artists that, that actually uh, lived uh, in these formative um, Black urbanisms. And, and so for me, I think, uh, in conclusion, the defining point is who gets to tell that story. I think it would have been a totally different dynamic if it's an artist from the outside looking in and then in, in many ways, uh, kind of aestheticizing this or romanticizing it. But if it's if it's the inhabitants themselves who, who are uh, are speaking in that way, uh, I think it's, it's a totally different thing. And, uh, and this is where I'm also quite cautious um, by in calling those spaces apartheid concentration camps because uh, in as much as I think the character would speak to a kind of a concentration camp, those that live in those spaces would maybe be uh, offended uh, to, to, to think of their homes and where they, they have lived their entire existence as, as a kind of a concentration camp. Um, and I, again, it, it just speaks to who is saying this and who is representing whose story. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can pick up another question from the section of questions and answers. Uh, could uh, Professor Katya Tolstoy uh, articulate her question probably, or shall I write, uh, or shall I read it? Uh, well, let me read it then. Uh, so the question from Professor Katya Tolstoy, uh, would presenting from the perception of the victims be perhaps a starting point, enabling less accent on our interpretations and more on the people who actually endured the suffering. I think it's a question for all the participants, so all of them are invited to ask. Uh, please remember, we have only five minutes uh, left, so sh please be short and concise if possible. Well, I'll start very quickly. Um, thank you very much for the question, Katia. And um, absolutely right. And I and I have always tried to do so in all my works. So in my um, in my monograph, 
uh, I have um, an historical chapter which introduces the history of the camp, uh, which is divided into two parts. The first part is the history of the camp told by the documents, and the second part is the history of the camp told by memoirs, where I let the prisoners speak by themselves using their words. Uh, the exhibition, I try to strike some balance, but I think at the end of the day, there is also a big question and is the fact of the selection of the material. How do you select the material? What do you decide? Uh, I mean, I had hundreds of voices from the cell of key, but I decided to use uh, 15 or 20 just because I had also issues of space and the same applied to the exhibition where I had issues of representation of engaging a wider public and so on. So you're absolutely right, but I, uh, I want to strike, uh, underline the fact that in my experience it's extremely difficult to select and in a way you are making a selection you're making a decision so uh, i'll let the other contribute thank you um to 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 pick up from what andre has just said the around selection i think that is that is the key right that in in selecting and and this is always the the challenge is uh one is is excluding um and uh and 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 what happens to those that are excluded and as i've done the same here in this presentation i've selected some images yet there are hundreds thousands more that that represent those um those reality and what happens to those exclusions so i think that there are there are two issues here um it's it's what the artists are producing certainly and that becomes the archive that we can look at and it's a repository that we can tap into to kind of ascertain um, their feelings around the experiences of living in these uh, uh, apartheid uh, concentration camps or the gulag, right? So we get that sense. But then there's the other part around interpretation. And this is where we, we need to look uh, critically at ourselves as scholars in terms of how are we engaging with that material to, to then make it um, um, uh, uh, visible to to the wider audience via exhibitions or via what uh, Prof O'Connell is doing with her uh, work with uh, documentaries and so on, um, and and that that part I often find that some some uh, scholars are are, are really uh, self reflexive and and authentic around what they're doing, um, but then. Uh, there are others that that really uh, we we have to to call a spade a spade and say that uh, it's it's just a, a, a matter of uh, promoting their own careers and so there's there's very little regard about what what is the impact of of their work and the interpretation that they're bringing about uh, with regards to to the material and the lived experiences that they're engaging with so um i think from from my side certainly uh, th there is that sensitivity around selecting who am i selecting why am i selecting again to to touch on what andrea has said and and what is the impact of those that i'm excluding those those voices and and what happens to that archive that has not made it onto the exhibition or made it onto a book or made it onto a documentary uh, we, we always need to be mindful of that but that's a it's a, it's a phenomenal observation thank you for that question uh thank you very much i see that melike has appeared on the screen i suggest that means that our session is very close to its end i just wanted to thank everyone who participated for the excellent presentations i'm sorry if we were not able to pick up all the questions but the questions they are there so you can download them and i hope our panelists will answer uh, the questions sort of privately now thank you again and uh, the floor uh, is back to Meleke. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Um, I am sorry to interrupt this wonderful panel discussion. I think we had such interesting um, probing questions and, and I wish we could extend the session, but we, um, we decided and promised to stick to time. So I have the pleasure and also the somewhat difficult task to end with some closing remarks. Um, I want to start with some acknowledgements and first of all to extend a heartfelt thanks to all the scholars and the artists who participated in this two-day colloquium and really thank you for your very nuanced and, and different perspectives on this very intricate topic. I also realize the demands on your time at this time of year, um, some of you who are in very different time zones and we really appreciate your rich contributions. I also want to acknowledge the funders of this event, 
the South African NRF, um, who funded the South Africa-Russia Joint Science and Technology Research Collaboration. I also want to thank the, the audience members for your rich participation in, in our two days of, of being together. So as Pamela mentioned yesterday, this is the second event. Um, we had a colloquium also in July. Um, and at that meeting, there was a somewhat greater focus on the acts of dehumanization from a perpetrator perspective and the individual and societal processes that support them. Um, and perhaps also looking at perpetrators and at what point they lose touch with their own humanity in order to commit atrocious acts. Um, the focus for, for this event was, was different. The current meeting focused more on the victim perspective, how people make sense and process such experiences of dehumanization. How do people continue to represent and reconstruct them as they live out their lives? Um, and how do these experiences live on in art? And I, I just want to say that having these conversations with international scholars really broadens our own conceptual thinking about these processes. And I'm um, always struck, despite the significant differences in context, how many similarities there are or how many parallels there are in, in these different contexts. Um, as we saw yesterday in, in Nancy, Professor Adler's talk, um, when she described the loyalists of the Soviet regime and their positive remembering or reconstructing the past, um, this, as Pumla also mentioned, um, kind of paralleled what we still observe in South Africa of many, the, the nostalgic reflective reflections of many white South Africans um, when they think back about apartheid days. So by wrapping up, um, I wanted to return to the question that Pumla also posed to us yesterday in that it, um, to think about what is it about art that help us in dealing with these violent histories? And I just wanted to offer a few thoughts. Um, Primo Levi, a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps, has said that our language lacks words to express these offenses. So we know that language has certain limitations. Um, a second point I want to offer a neuroscientific perspective um, in that art typically encompasses more than one modality. It can be both visual, tactile, auditory, and sometimes even olfactory. So it engages more of our brain at the same time and offers us a very phenomenologically different experience. Anecdotally, I also want to add that our sense of smell in our ol olfactory bulbs in the brain is very closely situated to our hippocampus or the hippocampi and the amygdala, which encodes our memory and emotional recall and emotional salience. So, so sense of smell can trigger very powerful emotive memories. And this is also perhaps a reason why art can be so triggering. From a social psychological perspective, I believe that art allows for a much deeper sense of embodied perspective, take, perspective taking. It allows us to really step inside the shoes um, of another. Another point I wanted to highlight is that art perhaps pushes boundaries um, in a less threatening way, as Pumla also suggested yesterday. In Professor Korndorfer's work on dialogues between group, he stresses that such encounters should go beyond the surface of friendly conversation, go beyond the limitation of culture's master narrative, beyond the comfort zones of rehearsed opinions and beyond the loyalties that communities impose on our large group identities. And I'm wondering whether art is maybe just more naturally suited to pushing these boundaries. Finally, I wanted to say something about um, the artistic understanding of empathy. By understanding um, the aesthetic undercurrents of empathy, it also gives us a new approach to empathy and art. Our Western idea of empathy, empathy arises from two places. In English, the word comes from the Greek word pathos, which means emotion, feeling, suffering, or pity. But the second root comes from the German word einfühlung, which means feeling into. And this first appeared in print in the German philosopher Robert Fischer's work in 1873 on aesthetics. 
he used the word to explore the human capacity to enter into a piece of art or literature and feel the emotions that the artist had worked to present or that he imbued the piece with. So I'm feeling as a wonderful dimension to empathy. In fact, our word empathy in English was coined from this translation in 1909. Um, it helps us because it views empathy not only as our interactional capacity to share emotions with other human beings, but also our ability to engage emotively with the world around us, the nuances and intentions underlying art, music, literature and symbolism. And then finally, um, stepping a little bit out of my comfort zone before I hand over to Pumla, I am um, I put together a short artistic collage from yesterday's panel discussions primarily. And, and I thought um, there was so much interesting um, reflections thrown up in the air. And, and I also find it interesting how today's discussion on beauty and violence connect to the discussion we also had yesterday. So um, I want to um, disclaim that I'm not an artist, um, not a linguist. So um, I'm offering you this <laughs> in, that, in that vein. It starts like this. Should we be careful or unsettle or carefully unsettle? That is the question. Whether it's the Bolsheviks or colon colonization, apartheid or creolization, always a group is displaced. We can never ever go back, but we can remember. Or can we? Whose truth is real? Whose perception true? Who am I if my belief is fake? And what will become of my memory, the future to take? No, no, our truth is real. Our motives pure, the wounds will heal. Should we be careful or unsettle or carefully unsettle? What to do with our memory objects, our cultural secrets? Do we bring them into the open or keep them askew? Acting out or working through, and how does art work to renew? Faster and faster the wheel goes round, nothing is new under the sun. Victims become perpetrators and perpetrators reborn, the best intentions rendered forlorn. What might we become and where is hell? All that is left is art. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Pumla for the final word. Thank you very much. Wow, that was, uh, we didn't know that side of you, Nelly <laughs> Thank you so much. That, what a beautiful ending, thank you. Um, I would like to invite our team, and Nelly has done the thank yous, and all that I'd like to do is to thank our team behind the scenes. So if they could please come to the front of the scenes, just so I can thank, thank them. Um, you can see them at the top there. Um, Lydia Duplessis. Lydia Duplessis uh, is um, her official role at the university. She coordinates all these kinds of events, but usually for the international office. We were just um, minor, uh, department who invited her to help us with this and she very graciously agreed to help coordinate uh, the technical side of things for us. So we are very grateful to you Lydia and we hope uh, you will do this more with us and we appreciate it so much. It always feels so comfortable when we know you are uh, working at the top there on this um, uh, coordinating this uh, technical side of things with Landy Mehring. This is the second time you're working with us. And Landy has been leading the webinars for us for more than actually since, since lockdown started. And so she is now, this is her, um, she's bowing out. This is a final, final event, not just for us in the units, but also because she's moving on to greener pastures in, in green, both in terms of professionally, but also in terms of love life. She's just got married. And uh, so thank you very much, uh, Landy, and we wish you the very best. And thank you for being present, even though you are carrying new life in your body and you wanted to be with us here. So thank you very much. 
the land is passing this on to uh, Unison Mugamu, who many of you, our speakers, have been in contact with. Thank you, Unison, for so ably carrying on the baton from Landi. We are very grateful to have you. Um, uh, Adibayo, Dr. Adibayo Sakiru has been with us and with me especially in planning this event and in coordinating the conversation with you all, envisioning it. And uh, so thank you very much, Adibayo, for all the legwork that was necessary for us to come to this point. And um, uh, on uh, Adibayo's right is a new arrival for us and new arrival both as, as a participant in, in our work and new arrival in terms of what he was doing. We have not done social media uh, regularly in these projects uh, of our webinars, but uh, Sisekom Kalipi came on board and offered to do the social media for us. And what we forgot or I forgot to say is that there's even a hashtag for this event, but this is something for me that's so distant and I didn't mention it. But uh, he has been moving and working um, vigorously in the background. So thank you so much to you all. You make this possible. It's the end of the year for us and uh, to see you all lined up there and the way that you've been working so busily to make this possible. This is not easy, this technical work I've come to find out. It's not easy. All the pre-webinars that we have, which were founded by Landy, and now they've become a, 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 a signature of our events that everyone who participates, they have to go to a pre-webinar practice session, as Landy has called them. And they've been very successful. So thank you very much, Landy. And uh, finally, Merike, uh, she is going to chair these events. I thank you again for so gracefully and elegantly chairing this last session. I think it's proper that as you chair the last one, you are also going to move into the new year to chair our events. And thank you especially that for the, for the intellectual vision you're bringing to this work. So thank you all, everyone. Thank you to the participants, those of you who keep on coming back to our events. We are so very grateful. I hope you come back again. Uh, when we have our first one. Thank you very much, Lydia and uh, Landy Adibayo, Unison, Suseko, for such a wonderfully orchestrated technical dance. Thank you to you all. Thank you, Pum. Thank you, Prof. Speakers, Thank you. Please, the speakers remain for our debriefing session while everyone leaves. Unison, will you promote the speakers, Katia and uh, Nancy, who are not on the panel? Can you promote them, please? So that, and, and, and Bjorn, just for a final debriefing, it's not going to take long. It's probably going to be like five minutes or so. So Katia, Nancy, Bjorn, you are be being promoted which is to say you are made to come live. Hi. There they are. Wonderful. Hi, hi. Great. Hi, Katia. Hi. Hi, everyone. Wonderful. Hello. Um, Bjorn, um, is Nancy here? Nancy probably left before. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm here. Oh, great. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yes. How could I leave such an interesting event? Yeah, oh, thank you so much, all of you, now that we're all together. Thank you. We can't have a bottle of wine and food together, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we can, we can uh, toast to you all for such a really fantastic, uh, fantastic, uh, beautifully uh, done work. And, and all of you have put in so much serious work in, in making this happen. We are very grateful and we will be in touch, obviously, because as you know, you know, this, this is the first time I think that Andrea, when you, when you, when you commented that you've been wanting to have this dialogue between Russia and South Africa, this, this has been, you know, on our minds as well. And so it's, it's not the last and I think we should do it. And there's so many layers, you know, there is this, there is this layer, this art 
aesthetics layer. There is what Melike brings, you know, the, the neuropsychological work, you know, that she, she, she does. And I remember Katya was very excited when Melike joined us and she said, oh, you know, this is a, a different angle. This is a very intriguing angle and important angle in terms of knowledge production. I mean, all of us are concerned with new knowledge production. I think there's, there's so much, uh, I, I see really a series of book projects emerging or special issues. And I mean, especially thinking about our first seminar, the idea was that we would have these seminars throughout the period of three years. Now, this year is the third year, but fortunately we, are, we extended ours, we started late, so there's still another year really. So we hope that when things become normal, there will at least be one in-person meeting in Cape Town. We really hope so, maybe in May, June, or even if it is June, that's not too far. And, you know, the airplanes are starting to operate now, and we, we ought to have a face-to-face -face gathering before next year is over, and I am very hopeful that this will happen. So yeah, so but would like to hear from any one of you your own feelings and feedback about the conversation. Well, if I may, yes, uh, I I was um, I was so enlightened by the commonalities. I've 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 been studying, of course, the Gulag and also South Africa for some years, but. Having this conversation with all of you, I can see indeed there are many layers where we can learn learn from the experience in 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 both societies. Uh, toward actually uh, some some very new perspectives on uh, also transitional justice, uh, yeah. doing, doing history, doing justice, uh, doing reconciliation. I think that there there are many uh, outcomes uh, besides publications that could come from this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for including me in, in thinking about this. I, I very much liked that almost every, not every speaker actually, really showed self-reflectivity in terms of what we're doing. I mean, Andrea Golotta presented it this way and, and uh, um, Punzo Zidogi, um, presented it also, like it's not just here I am and, and speak from a scholarly perspective mm -hmm. and I know it and challenge me, but it's like, you know, I question my own approach, I question my own um, conclusions and that self-questioning I think is so important for the kind of work we are all engaged in. Yeah. So I, I really appreciated that everyone was doing it. If I may add, uh, I I want to echo first uh, the fact that it was absolutely not only interesting but really fascinating, and that it has enriched me hugely, because I admit I didn't know much of the African side, the South African side, and as Nancy was saying, I saw so many things in common with what I study, and I see so many perspectives for future work, and and I also wanted to say that um, apart from the technical difficulties uh, which you've overcome so brilliantly the thing that really struck me was this general feeling of openness where it was a proper platform for exchange where no one came here to, to tell the truth everybody came here to speak openly and ask questions and 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 have a proper exchange of opinions which i found extremely extremely interesting and nice and I think that is um, a dimension that's quite difficult to find in academic <laughs> um, uh, uh, situations. And I'm really grateful to everybody for that. Thank you so much. I don't want to hold you up, but we will. It's just this desire to hold you, you know, it's almost as if we must meet, we must go somewhere together. I think that's part of it, that when we've had such a a wonderfully open, you know, as you say, conversation. There's always this desire, let's continue, but let's gather, you know, together. But of course, you know, with COVID, gathering uh, is a, a new meaning to the idea of gathering, but still we can connect in this way. So thank you very, very much to all of you. And um, we look forward to 
being together in some form, you know, if not in physical presence, in other ways. So thank you very much. Thank you Enjoy very much. Holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Ho hope to meet uh, again soon. Yes, that's yes. for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Bye.